Welcome everybody back here to uh, the uh, HowlRound uh, 12 hour session, New York Theater Artists for Ukraine. We have our six, first six hours behind us and we had a remarkable uh, contributions, I think uh, throughout the day. We started out with Pan America, with uh, translators. We had here Art Center who uh, worked with us on uh, uh, with their new work play. They are working on with 15 actors, some of them from shelters in the Ukraine, uh, PS21 shared us readings uh, uh, and, uh, and, and music. Bam, the Brooklyn Academy of Music was here. Watermill Center, Robert Wilson read for us. Sanctons Warehouse, the Public Theater, Torn Page, the Park Avenue Armory with <clears throat> Bill T. Jones, the Ibrons Art Center, who was just front before us uh, with Aaron Lensman. And now we come to our next uh, session, which is the Halron Theater Commons and the Alimite Theater Company. HowlRound is actually our host, our digital host here. It's a significant and very important institution here in America. So we would like to welcome Thea Rogers uh, with us, who is uh, working for HowlRound, but also an artist, uh, which we like when theater artists are involved in running institutions and also making decisions, what will be shown and not. And also we have with us members of the Alimite Collective, an offshoot of the living uh, theater, and it is uh, Cypress Atlas and uh, Philip Santos, and they will uh, join us and read hopefully a bit of the work of the great Judith Molina. I think her, was it her birthday or uh, two days ago? Um, uh, we, we can hear it. Uh, it was the anniversary of when she passed. Recently. Oh, when she passed away. Yeah. So we feel very strongly connected to her. She came so often to our programs. But maybe let's start first um, with HowlRound. Thea, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. I know you're in Los Angeles and um, you helped us out so very, very often also in our Siegel Talks. It's good to see you also as part of our programs. Tell us a little bit about HowlRound. Um, not everybody knows uh, who you are and what you do. Yeah, it's, a, it's good to see you again, Frank. Good to be back. Um, HowlRound is a Center for Theatre Commons. It was created with the idea of decentralizing the theatre conversation so anyone with access to the internet can share what they're working on, conversations that are happening in their community and have access to conversations happening outside of their community. Um, we can get very, uh, you know, wrapped up in our own local things, which is really wonderful. But if you don't, for example, live in the heart of New York City, um, you wanna be able to have the same access to conversations that are happening there, or maybe uh, people in New York get access to conversations happening outside of New York. That was the idea. We have a journal and a blog. People can write about um, what's happening and, and what kind of conversations they're having. Um, about art and politics and, and everything in the theater community. We also have a live stream channel, which many of you are watching this on our live stream channel now. Hopefully you've been able to refresh and stay with us today. Um, so anyone can reach out and just say, hey, like we are gonna have a conversation. We think it would be useful to the greater theater community. We think people should be able to see it and uh, HowlRound can walk you through how to, how to share that with the world. Um, and click over to our participate page after this event to learn more. Yeah, it is uh, quite stunning. Every day there are discussions, readings, forums, symposia, nationally, internationally. And I mm -hmm. think it has brought us all closer together and it proved so valuable, especially in the time of Corona when we couldn't leave um, our houses. And um, we are also joined today by Nachtkritik, which is a it's a very important German site uh, for online uh, engagement with theater, a fantastic uh, curated pitch. It also serves kind of as a uh, American theater magazine, kind of the German online theater magazine and um, HowlRound helped us also to connect to them. So this is um, carried over to Germany. So we'll say thank you for Nachtkritik, for Esther Sulflok to make that happen. And um, and we welcome all our listeners there. So in a way, this brought the New York theater community together. I don't know if there ever was an event where in one day or 24 New York theater organizations joined uh, in an effort um, um, to um, stand up uh, for something and show a flag. In this way, it's kind of the Ukrainian flag that we do care and that we are outraged of what happened again. The initial uh, 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 idea was that we learned about the bombing of a theater in Mariupol, 300 people who sought refuge in 
a space that is sacred for us died and so many others were wounded. Um, and we think about them, our heart goes out to them. It's on our mind, Ukraine is our mind and we care, we uh, uh, feel deep sadness, helpless in a way, but we wanted to voice our outrage and uh, you don't, lots of arguments for everything against and before, but you do not bomb theaters with people inside for shelters. It's a barbaric act. And uh, today is the day where we uh, all come together to voice that. So um, Thea, you have prepared a reading for us. I have, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'll be reading from a play called Maidan Inferno, um, which uh, Frank shared with me by a Ukrainian playwright. Um, and there was a passage in it that really captivated me. Um, it is currently being translated, Frank, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or, or translated into English by Sam Buga Bugalan. Bugalan, Am I pronouncing yes. that right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Cherry, Cherry Arts by... Project, upstate New yes. York, yes. Great mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. uh, a play originally by Neda Nizdana, uh, uh, centered in the 2013 uprisings uh, in the Ukraine. And this, um, this passage really caught me uh, in terms of what we're talking about right now and uh, just the um, internationality of uh, any kind of diaspora and cultures. Um, it's sequence 11, monologues four in the play, a character named Anya. Truthfully, I can't really say what my country is. My last names are a big messy mix, Ukrainian, Russian, German, it seems even Roma, but I was born in Ukraine. This is my land. And it seems to me that language isn't just an accident. Language is the code of a land, of a people. Once at an exhibition of Triptylene culture, I saw a jug with a pattern on it, exactly like on the one my grandmother had. The jug was 5,000 years old. I don't even know what the symbols meant, but it's important that we hang on to the things that hold us together. Same thing with language. Yeah, it's it's like being able to hear what your ancestors are saying to you. It's like a like a radio station from God. In Ukraine, the broadcast is in Ukrainian. The Russian station is further away. It's not our station. The signal isn't clear. It's full of static and noise. There's a fashionable word now, bilinguals, but almost all of us are that. On the one hand, it's great. Like consciousness is a dialogue capable of understanding otherness, but there's another side to it. When two languages go to war for how you think, for your soul, for your heart, your children, you have to choose which language to speak to your child. What about God? Did he make a choice too? Which language to speak to us? Do we choose on our own? Inside this war, there's an unfinished battle that's lasted for centuries. I cried when I learned the history. How many people had been arrested, tortured, killed in order to keep this land Ukrainian? 400 years, our language has been banned 134 times. If you choose to speak Russian, does it mean those sacrifices were, not were for nothing and the conquerors won? Fantastic, thank you. What a, what a, what a, what a beautiful uh, text. I, that's quite something, uh, banned 134 times? Yeah, yeah. yeah I had to go yeah. look that up. To to find the history, but... Um... That's incredible, yeah. We also had today with us um, Natalia Kuliada from the Free Theater of Belarus and the Free Theater, Freedom Theater of Belarus also says, you know, they are, if they perform in Belarusian language, they are risking in going into jail, you know, because of performing in their own language, in their own country, and their very own president is the one who puts such laws into uh, into place it's an outrage it's so shocking about it what they do also is an incredible incredible fight and it also does show what theater can do she said today more theater artists are in jail than even journalists or political activists it just shows that theater seems to be uh, something that drives um so it's authoritarian leaders mad so it means uh, it's does have an effect of it. Now let's switch over to um, Limite, and I would like to uh, welcome again Cyprus and uh, Philip. Philip, uh, tell us a little bit about your company. 
Sure, I can start Cypress, you can jump in. We've been working together for um, forever and we, and, and perhaps we'll continue to. Um, we're all over the world at this point. Um, we, during the past couple of years have been doing a project that has had multiple iterations, has engaged artists, um, truly everywhere and uh, bringing people together to interpret each other's interpretations of each, other, each other's interpretations of a set of guiding questions. Uh, we did a live performance inspired by that text over the summer, as well as doing workshops. Uh, we also do, um, oh, <laughs> I'm not sure what else, but a, a, a whole lot. And um, yeah, we, we are, guided by Judith Molina, I would say, still in a very large way, and also by a lot of other practices that are emerging that don't exist yet, that exist only in our dreams. And that's part of what it's exciting about it too. Mm -hmm. Cypress? Yeah, many of us met um, as part of the Living Theater in the last um, years of Judith's life. Um, and, um, we just have not been able to stop working together. We just keep doing it, like no matter if there's a pandemic um, or, or what we've worked through the pandemic on, on digital performances as well, which um, then became an in-person um, performance recently. So um, we're very happy to be here today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. So let us, let's hear what you have uh, prepared for us and then we can talk perhaps a little bit more. Or should I start, Philip? If, okay. If you're comfortable doing so. Sure. Great. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to read um, the letter on revolution that Judith Molina wrote to Carl Einhorn, dated Saturday, March 28th, 1970. My dear Carl, just returning this minute from London. And really the first minute I've had to write to you. I wanna get all the chores out of the way and start the real work. I have not yet read the mimograph tract you said was important, though I've looked at it. I will study it carefully, but till then I know that while this is the direction our people are taking, we cannot rest, we cannot stop. We cannot speak of anything but changing the situation. We must bring hope and concrete plans and useful proposals for feeding the people that do not entail the enslavement of the people by small cliques with guns and bombs. Please draw up now your most practical proposals and order them into a readable form. We must get together our most constructive ideas. And if we have none, then we must begin with the reality that we have none. It's not enough to set up communications between revolutionaries who have no revolutionary proposals except the road to the same old authoritarian world. We have to bring sensible alternatives to people of course, we will work with what there is, and we will also create what there isn't yet and what has never been. The old formulas are dead and stale. And what is relevant? But it's only relevant if it leads to something more human for the people and the proletariat than to dream of becoming dictators, as in the dictatorship of the proletariat. I talk to everyone and ask what they think can be done and everyone comes up against the same wall and draws a blank. A useful plan to which people can turn with hope, which will bring energy. I am convinced that this is the only valid work. We must raise a standard that can show the way. It must be economically sound, humanly practical, taking into account human failings and human behavior. It cannot be a utopian dream, but must be explicable step by step. 
You said that in the old American and French revolutions, no one had a platform, but look what happened. The American Revolution led to America and the French to Napoleon's coronation as emperor. And the Russian, which planned for the interim socialist step that you have such faith in, led to Stalin. Let us speak of Cuba and China, but let us speak of what will happen after Castro and Mao. Is there a system that can survive the death of the great philosopher King? That ideal platonic ruler, which these two men and their wisdom and talent represent? We can make excuses for history or say things have changed, but we can't dismiss all its lessons. As Patrick Henry would say, Jesus had his Paul and Lenin had his Stalin and Mao and Castro can profit by their example. Make the best of it. We need a new form. There are better people than me to find it, but they are not doing the job and it must be done. Hillel, and if not I, who? And if not now, when? And if I am not for myself, who shall be for me? I will follow anyone who makes the destination clear, but if no one does it, I will ask them to listen to me and I will make it clear, or else I will expose the weaknesses of every ideology now going, will destroy the illusions and leave only what is real, human, meaningful, practical, and beautiful. And to those who say it can't be done, I'll say bullshit and prove otherwise. What side are you on? I'm on the side of those who believe when you say one plus two or two plus one. One, stop all the killing. Two, feed all the people. The Maoists have the second part right, but are very fucked up in part one. The pacifists are right on the first part, but don't know how to accomplish either part effectively. And if you switch clauses or the order of the clauses as you want to, my dear Carl, you don't really solve, you put off. And maybe that's the best you think you can do but I'm on the side that can do better. Let's find a way to make it work. A comradely embrace and sisterly love, all power to the people, to arm is to harm. There are stronger forces than guns to make a new world, find them. Love, Judith. And the forsythia is brilliant yellow behind the house. A cherry tree blossoms across the road, but Brecht said, we live in an age when to speak of trees is almost a crime. Love. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so powerful and true. Philippe. Yeah. And thank you, Cypress. It really is um, beautiful to hear those words. Um, for context for the folks at home, uh, the Living Theater's Passover was historically for years, I'd say, um, sort of a hot, a hot event. And um, I think internally was also an important one. And so at this time of year, um, close to when Judith passed and, and also around Passover, um, it's really moving to hear that. Um, I'm gonna read from Julian Beck's diaries. Uh, he was Judith's partner at, in art and life and co-creator of the Living Theater. And this is a series of questions that are written in Julian's diaries. Um, I love questions and I think that they are a good foundation for an artistic practice. And so uh, I, I'm gonna read these out. And if there's anything that you think I'm gonna keep thinking about that, then I, I think that's good. This was written in 1963. I end with questions because I have no answers. Of three broadcasts on the life of the theater delivered over station WBAI, New York City, this was the third. What is the difference between questions and answers? Is Hamlet questioning his glory or his tragedy? Why do you go to the theater? Is it important to go to the theater? Is it important to read? Do people who go to the theater differ from people who don't go to the theater? 
What happens to you if you go to the theater? When you leave the theater, have you changed? That is, of course, you are changed by each moment of experience. So three hours later, you are naturally different. But I mean, have you changed actively? Do you want to change actively? Are you content? Is it good to change? Is anything sufficient unchanged? What am I talking about? Do you go to the theater for answers? Do you have any questions? How long is a lifetime? Does it matter what happens? Does it matter how long we live? Does it matter how we live? Why do I ask these simple questions that everyone must be asking all the time? Is it because I think you don't ask these questions? What is happening to us? What happens in the theater? Do you go to the theater to find out about life? Is it easier to observe life in the theater or in the street? Have you experienced joy in the theater? Have you experienced joy in the street? What do you enjoy? Do you go to the theater for intellectual exercises? Do you go to the theater to find out if it has figured out what is going on? Do you go to the theater because it might be telling the truth? Is anything that is the truth? Are newspapers the truth? Do playwrights record the truth more than editors? Do newspapers lie? Do playwrights lie? Do actors lie? Do playwrights or editors or actors lie deliberately? Do you go to the theater to see how well an actor can disguise himself as somebody else? Do you think that actors should try to personify excellent being? What is excellent being? Can an actor show you excellent being? Can an actor show excellent being only when playing Faust? What is insight? Do you use your insight? Is it easy to ask questions? What did Aristotle say about catharsis? Do you go to the theater for a purge? Do you ever remember being purged in the theater? Do you go to the theater with expectancy and hope? Is the theater a way of learning things you do not know? What is learning for? Are you certain of any answers? Are all things equal? Does anything have value? What is the difference between an elephant and a handkerchief? Should you put people in jail? Do you lie? Does it matter if you lie? How many times a day do you lie? Do you find that you have to lie to get along in this world? Are you content? I ask again. Are you content with anything? Do you know how to love? Do you love? Are you loved? Do you know how to hate? And do you? Why do I prefer a disturbing theater to a pleasing theater, though I like to please? Who are we? Where have we come from? Where are we going? Go gone. Who are the kings with diamonds in their eyes, moping and mowing among our private shows? Barker. Must we love one another or die? Auden. What is the question? Shakespeare. Stein. Do you know that I have reached into my entrails and strewn them about the stage in the form of a question? Do you know that I do not know what else to do? Do you know that I need you? That I am dying and will die without you? What is useful? What is a good question? What is a way to find answers? What will knock down the prison walls? What is the way? What is the relationship between the actor and the spectator? What is speech? What is the important inquiry? Do we have time to ask all the questions? Which ones do you want to ask? Will you ask them now? What do we need? How can we get it? How can we touch one another? How can we make it happen? How can we make a theater which makes love, love now? How can we make a theater which is worthy of the life of its spectators? How can we make a theater when we do not know any answers but only have vague hints about how to ask questions? I end with questions because I have no answers, but what I want is answers. And in 1968, how do we feed all the people? How do we stop all the wars? How do we open the doors of all the jails? How do we disintegrate the violence? How do we obliterate racism? How do we get rid of money? How do we undo early death? How do we end militarism? How do we put an end to authoritarian systems? How do we end the class system thing? How do we find the answers to these questions? How do we do it now? Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, these these, these are um, a lot of questions. And if theater is uh, good for something, it is actually good to ask questions. And um, yes, I think someone said, I think it was Bob Wilson who said he once was a substitute teacher and he wrote uh, questions on the blackboard in his school, but then he realized he wrote the answers and not the questions. Everybody laughed, you know, so it's cool. That's what you do. And um, that's also hopefully what we do here. Thank you all for participating. This is uh, so kind and generous of you, Cypress, uh, for jumping on, Philippe and Thea from HowlRound. And really, really thanks to HowlRound for supporting this very long 12-hour event, as you have suggested. Always supported us for our Seagull Talks and the 24-hour HowlRound event for India. So this is so meaningful and important to us. And we move over now uh, to a very important, another important New York theater company, part of the fabric of New York theater, what makes New York theater, New York theater, it's the Mai Theater Company. Ralph Pena is with us and his uh, uh, group. And um, I hope they are all with us. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi, fantastic, Martin. fantastic, fantastic. So uh, welcome. And we are already in the second half um, of our uh, uh, event, the New York actors for Ukraine, expressing that uh, your crisis in Ukraine, the war is in our mind. And um, I would like to really uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, helping us right away. Ralph was the first who answered actually when I sent out uh, the inquiry he said, of course, and I think he wrote, how can anyone say no um, to, to participate. So Ralph, tell us a little bit about your company for all those who do not know about it and why is that so close to your heart? Well, uh, my theater company is uh, uh, now in its 33rd season in New York. We're New York based, but our mission has been to develop, promote and produce new, uh, new plays and performance works written by Asian American playwrights. So we have centered Asian American lives uh, in our company for since we began. And now um, in the pandemic, we've sort of reorganized and reassessed what, who we are and what we need to do. And in the midst of anti-Asian violence that is on the rise in New York, yeah. um, one of the realizations we've had, we're talking to our communities that's been facilitated by Nancy this past year, uh, theater is not what our community needs at the moment, which, uh, uh, they're very concerned about safety. And I think our role as artists is to respond to that and maybe not through theater, but to direct service. And uh, that for us resonates with what's needed in Ukraine. Uh, theater serves one thing, but it doesn't have to be just that. We can become other things for our communities in times of crises. And I think that's what's happening now. And we want to talk about that with Ken Leung and Jacob and Jesse and Nancy of um, how a cultural organization can change um, when the needs of the communities change and uh, how you reprioritize your mission uh, where art is still there. But right now what's needed from us is to make sure that our people aren't getting uh, hurt. So what's happening in Ukraine resonates with us. I also come from the Philippines, and we'll talk about this later, where militarization has been uh, in place since the Marcoses regime in the 1980s. And today, that's still very much in place. And there are indigenous tribes that have been uh, subject to militarization and bombings and salvagings, meaning uh, people are killed. So what we've done, we have a poem written by a, a student from one of these tribes, an open letter to students in Ukraine. And uh, yes, so that's what, that's what we're gonna start with, Martin. Okay, thank you. Should we, uh, does everybody want to please introduce themselves first, Nancy. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, I'm uh, Nancy Belolakow and I am the community outreach liaison for my theater. And I worked with them uh, on their past, uh, this, this past show at the public theater, um, The Chinese Lady. Mm -hmm. Jesse. 
Hi there, my name is Jesse J. Hoon. I'm an associate with Maya Theater Company. It's uh, so great to be with you here today. Uh, Jacob? Hi, my name is Jacob Carter, uh, they, them pronouns, and I am very excited to be dis on this panel to discuss this today. Associate producer with Maya Theater Company, and I'll pass this along to Ken. I am Ken Leung, and I'm an actor. I've known, I've been associated with Maya since the mid 90s. <laughs> so I'm a longtime friend um, of the theater company. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for taking time on this holiday weekend, actually. So really, thank you. Right. So uh, we're going to start with this poem. And this poem, again, was written by uh, a poet um, in the Philippines, from the Philippines. It is a letter, Liham ng Estudianting Lumad sa mga kapwa estudiante sa Ukraine, a letter by a student, uh, indigenous student, tribal indigenous student to her fellow students in Ukraine, and it's by, written by Joy Barrios. Okay, I'm going to read it first in Filipino, and then Ken will read it later uh, in English. Mahal na mga kapwa estudyante, nakita ko ang inyong larawan, nakabuklat ang mga aklat, may nagugupit at may nagkukulay, may nagdidikit ng larawan sa papel, mga mag-aaral sa panahon ng digmaan. Napahanga ako sa inyong paghahanda sa anuman ang maging mangyari sa anumang sandali, tatlong maiksing pagtunog ng kulingling at ang ibig sabihin ay may sunog. Mahabang senyas ng kampanilya, ang hudyat na baka may nahulog na bomba. Ang husay sa leksyon ng pagmemorya ng mga pananda ng panganib na nakaamba, ang magtatakda ng buhay at kamatayan. Yan ang aming natutunan nang sinunog ang aming paaralan at pinaslang ang aming mga guru. Pandadarahas ang tugon ng pamahalaan sa katutubong tumututol sa minahan ng dayuhan. Sa labanan ng mga kapangyarihan sa daigdig, tayong maliliit ang naiipit. Huwag sanang pagtakhan kung bakit ang aral na nakaukit sa isip at dibdib ay tapang na magtanggol, maghimagsik, Sukdulang buhay ay mabuis. My dear fellow students, I see your picture. One is opening a book. Another is clipping paper. Someone else is using crayons. I see you putting stickers on paper. We are students in the midst of war. I am very impressed by how prepared you are for anything that might happen at any minute. Three short bursts of sirens means there is a fire. The long continuous pealing of church bells means a bomb is on its way. These are worthy lessons to memorize. They are reminders of imminent danger. They also mean the difference between life and death. These are the lessons my tribe learned when they burned our homes and killed our teachers. We understood that violence is the favorite language of governments, especially against native peoples protesting against the mining operations of foreigner corporations. In the wars of the world's most powerful, we are the small dispensable pawns trapped in the middle. So don't wonder why the lessons carved into our hearts are those of rising up and defending our rights. It might spell death, but we will fight until it equals freedom. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, Joy, for that poem. Um, as we were preparing for this, um, we, we wanted to take a conversation that, that is sort of pressing mm -hmm. for our communities here, because I think that's what we can talk about. Um, yeah. 
I think one of the things that we immediately just said to ourselves that there's no way for us to sort of try to imagine <laughs> what it's like for the people in Ukraine at the moment. I mean, we're in our living rooms, you know, and safe. So what we thought we would do was to talk about what's happening here and maybe find a way to relate to what's happening there. They're not equal, but it does involve sort of artists responding to what's happening in their communities and the crisis. It's, we're not at war here like they are over there. No bombs are falling on us, but our people are in danger. Our communities are in danger. So we wanted to talk about that. And the jumping off point, I think, first of all, that poem was written based on that photograph that appeared, I think, in a newspaper uh, from Ukraine showing school children um, trying to study in the middle of all the bombs falling on them. And that's the response of another student from another country. But we had just finished a production of The Chinese Lady at The Public, which is sort of... Uh, an account of the um, first woman, don't hold, go back. There's a first woman, um, Chinese, uh, first female to, uh, to land in the United States in 1834. And then the subsequent things that she saw and experienced all the way to the end of the century. And a lot of that included the Anti-Chinese uh, Exclusion Act and violence against the Chinese community. And so, Part of what we did was we convened public forums uh, and invited the Asian American communities to come and attend these things to talk about how they're feeling given the current moment. As you know, in the United States and even in New York, the, the uh, incidence of violence against Asians has been on the rise, specifically unleashed by our great um, president, Donald Trump, when he attributed the virus to the Chinese and to Asian peoples. That uh, unleashed a torrent of violence against Asians in the United States. And it has just grown uh, exponentially, actually. Um, and, and, and recently, another uh, communities of color uh, in Sunset Park were attacked. Uh, so all of this is sort of compounded, but I think Nancy, for example, was uh, key in organizing these um, community forums and bringing uh, consultants and experts to help help our audiences sort of react to that. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna ask Nancy to talk about those forums and what they what they've meant. Um. Yeah, Ralph brought me on to the Chinese lady um, to help reach out to our community. And as he said, right now, um, you know, specifically in New York City, there's like a 300% increase in violence against um, Asian Americans, Asian American Pacific Islanders. And, um, and our community feels very scared and very unheard and alone. And there is a sense of hopelessness for the AAPI community um, in New York City right now. And when um, Ralph brought me on, he said that he really wanted to create um, not a talk back for the shows, but um, a, a space and a forum. And he was very clear several times that um, he didn't want hosts or moderators to come in and tell people how they should feel. He, he didn't want it to be prescriptive. He wanted us to create a space that was safe for people to share how they're feeling. Um, and so, you know, we did that and we brought great hosts in who are on the ground doing the work, um, doing trainings and de-escalation and uh, situational awareness and um, who are working directly with communities impacted. And so we were able to do four forums and we were very um, moved 
by the fact that that we were actually able to um, make that space where the audience was talking to us and the audience was using the opportunity to say um, how scared they were and how alone they felt and saying things that maybe they weren't saying to their friends and family. And um, it was really an honor for us to be able to create that um, and, you know, I've said to Ralph that, so Ralph has, um, Mayi has created a standalone series um, separate from the shows um, to do these forums in other spaces across the city to help other theaters um, serve their AAPI constituents. Um, and we also want to try to help other, um, other fields reach out and and make safe spaces. And, you know, we were uh, kind of debriefing and talking about the future. And I, you know, I, I, it's kind of obvious, but um, I felt that the reason that the forums were successful was not even because of how we we formatted it, but because of the Chinese lady, because of the work because of um, the way the work made people feel. And um, it, you know, it was really the perfect segue um, for people to understand their connection to history and how that connects to the moment that we're in now. And um, it was really, you know, a, a confluence of factors that, that helped us um, touch the community and for the community to touch us as well. I'm gonna ask you a little bit to tell me what happened with uh, uh, Dash, your son, and what he said, arts function. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Yes, so um, my son is six and um, because um, I we're because of how things are. Uh, he has had to come with me to the forums in the evening. He's attended all the forums. He's seen the Chinese lady, and he's also here. So he might say something when he hears me saying this. But um, you know, there there was um, there was a shooting, as Ralph um, mentioned, uh, on the subway recently uh, in Sunset Park, and um, the the shooter he shot uh, 33 bullets, he injured 10 people. And so Dashiell School is close to the stop, in, in proximity to the stop. And so his school was in a soft lockdown and, um, and we had to talk to the kids later about it um, because we knew they were gonna hear it from older kids. And, uh, you know, I told Dash and he said, okay, well, what happens if we see him on the street? And I said, well, we'll have to call the police. And he said, well, what if he sees us call the police? And I said, well, we're gonna move and then call the police. And so he had very practical, <laughs> very pragmatic questions, despite the violence that we were discussing. And, um, you know, we went to bed and we woke up the next morning and uh, I was making him breakfast, getting him ready for school. And he was um, laying down on the couch and I could hear him crying. And um, I asked him, you know, what, what was wrong? What happened? And he told me that he was just thinking about, um, he was just thinking about an episode of his favorite show, Larva. And I asked him to describe the show to me, the, what, he, what the scene that he was talking about. And he said that um, all the friends, please, all the friends um, got into boats and they were on the water and um, no, but can I tell it the way I heard it? <laughs> all the friends got into separate boats. Yes, all of the friends got into separate boats and they fell asleep and uh, they drifted apart. And when they woke up, they drifted apart. And when they looked behind them, they saw this beautiful sun. And um, Dash said that in his recollection that, you know, it made him, you know, 
it made him cry because of how beautiful that scene was. And I told him, you know, that's what art is. That is what art is for. Art helps us access feelings that we don't have um, the ability to really directly connect to. And I thought that, you know, it was, um, we've taken him to museums and shows and uh, galleries his whole life. And I've always wondered, you know, how to make him understand what art is for. And, um, and you know, it was a Netflix show about um, maggots <laughs> that, that really, I'm going to mute yeah. myself. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. And do you have anything to say? Yeah. Well, um, to piggyback off that, I think not only the receivers of art, but we as artists, you know, we often, we make art to express what we can't by other means. Um, and I think at a time like this, when, you know, even make it, making it to the theater safe and sound is uncertain that it it takes real bravery to keep doing that to keep making our art um so as far as the question of what our role is i think we we stay in it while not knowing stuff <laughs> you know not knowing how to help how to respond just because in making our art, we're saying, okay, we're here. We're still here. We don't know what we're doing. We can't assume we know how you feel, but we're here. And I think that's when art is, you know, ser serves its highest purpose. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, when we are looking to create art as artists and when we find any sort of external stimulus that is maybe blocking us from giving our art to the people that we want to reach out to, we do have other options. And, and that as artists is reaching out to the community, that as artists is reaching out to our neighbors and saying, you know, checking in on our neighbors for whatever purpose or reaching out with our art to our other neighbors and really cultivating that community somewhat as, as we have done with our community, but universally to check in and say, are you okay? Do you need water? Do you need food? What is it that you need and how can I help to provide that? And I think that like what Ken was saying, we have our art to create based on our experiences at a given time. But when there is a time, there will be a time when sometimes you're not going to have the availability to profess that art or showcase that art and showcase the universal experience that we're feeling. And in that time, that's when community driven experiences or community outreach is the next step to make sure that we as a community are being heard and being seen and being universally uh, attributed to what is going on in the world. Yeah. No, really, really thank you. And I, and I would like to point out again how, how, what a radical statement in a way it is, what Ralph said, and he really means it. You know, says our community, the first thing they need now is not theater. And this is, comes from a theater company that works together for 30 years, but they to think what is our meaning? What is our purpose? How can we help best? And I just recently also went to a talk of Claire Bishop, a great art historian who looks at the history of art through theater, who said, yes, once Bright showed the conflict on stage of Mother Courage and you learned something by just not doing what she did. And people did activism on the street and said, let's organize communities as artists. But Black Lives Matter taught us people can organize. They don't need artists. But she said what perhaps is the most significant thing people can do now also in the visual art was is to give care what you said, to take care of, to check in, how are you, you know, and, um, and to provide and to create safe spaces. And yes, also um, do the art, but perhaps go back to a side of uh, what art can provide that has been 
um, not neglected, but was not in the center of it, but something radically has shifted and actually your work is in it. Um, a question to Ralph. Ralph, you said, uh, I'm going to talk about the Philippines later. Tell us a little bit, what parallels do you see between what's happening um, in Ukraine and your experience? Well, during the martial law years, uh, Marcos really cracked down on any on all the dissidents uh, in tandem with uh, U.S. forces who were visiting. Um, he was basically propped up by the United States. So he had military support and they were bombing villages uh, in the south um, because they wanted them to um, submit to government rule. There was a secession movement in the south saying we didn't want to be part of the Philippines. Uh, they were Muslim, and the Philippines is a predominantly Catholic country, and they went to war, and they basically bombed those um, Muslim cities. And they they did the very same thing around the country. If you were suspected of being a communist, for example, or a communist sympathizer, you went to jail or you died. And at the time, I was a young student in theater, and again, the question was, what kind of theater do we do when all of this is happening in the country? Uh, in the university, we were, we were, they, were, they wanted to do Shakespeare and Chekhov, but that didn't make sense um, to me and to, uh, to, to my colleagues. So what we did was we went to the streets and to the villages and we performed uh, plays and skits that we wrote specifically about their conditions. And you know, we used the Bawal technique, meaning they could intervene, they could, they could shape how the story went. Um, and it was in tandem with uh, getting them supplies and all of that stuff. But that to me, that to me underscored the theater and art has to be useful. <laughs> uh, the war, we have to be of use to people. And sometimes just performing uh, doesn't cut it, especially when they're running away from bullets or hiding from bombs, which is what's happening in Ukraine. Um, clearly, there are people there, but there are also artists there that are affected by this. And and I know that, you know, in times of calamity and in times of crisis and uh, adversity, artists somehow rise to the occasion. This feeds the artist's imagination. They always come up with something that's relevant. And I know that's going to happen in the U in Ukraine. It's probably already happening if it wasn't happening, maybe even before all of this started. Uh, but it's something that we want to support in any way we can, obviously, coming from here. And if anyone is listening there and want to want to reach out to us, we're absolutely open <laughs> to finding ways of helping um, with what we can. Um, I think that's what we want to say with our 30 minutes is that we want no, to be a... useful. Yeah. That's quite, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite a big, big statement. So really um, thank you for that. And really also to remind us, you know, that wars and things like bombing of the, you know, villages and the South, uh, you know, of the Philippines with, you know, US support, as you pointed out, or the military support, you know, given the weapons you know there is it nothing is black and white in this world that what's right nothing. and wrong everybody who tells you this is right and this is wrong that thing is black and white people are lying to you the world is complex and one of the big um, things we are asked for is to live with contradictions to you know keep balance of things and uh, like in a dance uh, but um, really be on the side of justice progressive justice and to be on the right side of history and i think artists always um, have been what are what are plans what is coming up uh, on the we have a, a minute or two, two left what what is my uh, planning well nancy is doing a series of anti-asian violence forms between now and december and we're actually partnering with multiple theaters off broadway to host these things and then um we are going to launch a new play in August about the Korean War and the legacy of um, colonialism and violence, uh, but it's told through Korean uh, fables and children's stories. That's gonna be at La Mama. Uh, 
and then um, we have other plans in the fall, but uh, we're not ready to announce, but we're back to live theater and digital programming, but also really much half of all of our activities will be focused on taking care of our communities um, and making space for them to feel safe uh, and going to those communities, you know, because not everybody can come to Manhattan. So we have to go to those places. Um, I think that's part of, that's part of our responsibility. Yeah, what, what a radical act, so easy to say, but to say, you know, what we, we now take care of our communities, we go to them and um, just, just the place I might not be in the center, but we see that as part of our vision, as a, our uh, Gesamtkunstwerk of doing art um, is actually to, to do that reach out. So we come to the end of our segment. Yeah. I really would like to, to thank you for responding so very, very early Uh, for taking this so seriously. We had also some correspondence of what to do for bringing your team on. And I think what you do is uh, something, every theater company that is presenting work and just is scrambling, scrambling to get back. And so let's, yeah. hopefully we can show the Michael Jackson video and then it's a renaissance to go back instead of what perhaps is kind of a revolution or something turning around, doing something different and you guys do. So thank you and I hope. And also, thank you, you know, Frank, for organizing this thing. This is such a really important Uh, thing for our community to get behind and come together yeah. and say, you know, we support Ukraine. Yeah, it is an important one. So we're going to move over now yeah. to another company that, you know, also has like my, he has a left, uh, it's, uh, it's traces, it's footprint, it's vision, it's mission um, on New York City uh, at the big theater. They are uh, a part of the landscape And we have the National Black Theater um, here um, with us, and we would like to welcome uh, Hi, National uh, Black uh, Theater. Shade. And Jonathan is also a wonderful way. We always try to make a, a, a transition. So, uh, Shade and Jonathan, thank you um, for um, uh, being uh, with us. And um, I don't know if you had uh, time to uh, listen in a little bit. You know what your what your colleague said. So, what's going through your minds now in this situation? Shade, maybe we start with you, yeah. I'm not sure if your sound is on. Is <laughs> Two years into the pandemic and I still forget to unmute. Yeah. Um, thank you for having us, Frank. Um, and it is imperative that artists lend their voices, New York theater artists lend their voices for Ukraine and, you know, um, what's on my heart right now is so much of the wisdom of our ancestors and our artists that have given us. I stole um, it. Sorry, this is Thelonious. He breaks in often. Um, you know, none of us are free until we're all free, Maya Angelou said. So that's what's on my heart right now. But I uh, want to introduce ourselves. Um, yes. I'm Shade I'm the CEO of Dr. Barbara Ann Tears National Black Theater in Harlem. And um, I am always privileged to be joined by. Hi, my name is Jonathan McCory. I'm the Executive Artistic Director of National Black Theater. Um, and so when you asked us if we would join and lend National Black Theater's voice to this urgent conversation, of course, we said yes. And so Jonathan and I have been um, over the last two years that uh, we've been navigating the pandemic and all of the different layers of pandemic, we've been, you know, leaning in and listening to artists. And so we've brought some of those voices here today um, in the form of quotes, in the form of writers, in the form of um, our pedagogy around art from the heart in service of healing. Fantastic. Tell a little bit about, uh, because we also have listeners from Europe or from other countries, they might not all know about you. W what is the National Black Theater all about? Shade, do you? You go. <laughs> Jonathan, uh, you go. Uh, so National Black, Theater, uh, National Black Theater was founded in 1968 by a visionary leader by the name of Dr. Barbara Antier, um, also should be known as Shade's mom. Um, she was the forebearer of the Black Arts Movement, um, for a mother of the Black Arts Movement, and a really powerful uh, Black woman who really uh, took the, and the roots of upheaval and the roots of a lot of um, 
in the 1968, if you think about that historically in American society, there was just a lot happening. And in the, in the brink of that, in the, on the heels of that, um, here comes uh, a woman from East St. Louis who was actually taking on the reins of trying to figure out how to center the healing of Black folk um, by telling their own story inside their own community. So um, founded on 5th Avenue, 125th Street, National Black Theater since at the intersection of really um, trying to look at what you, in the service of Black liberation, how to create the conditions for human transformation. Um, the equation, our theory of change is that Black liberation plus placemaking plus art equals the conditions for human transformation. So we're in the, we're in the business of, of creating a, a container for all of us to be seen, um, understanding that, um, that if the Black body, especially the Black woman's body, especially the Black trans woman's body, feels the breath or the freedom of liberation, a liberated breath, then we all can transpire and have the opportunity to have liberation um, be present in a room. Um, and so I think that, I mean, we have over, we have a large track record of producing multiple different um, productions and large track record of workshops, productions, traveling around the world. We have a breath and a dexterity of actually training so many folks um, to give them an opportunity to, uh, to, to really propel. I like to say that we are like a launching pad um, for, 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 cultural, for, co for cultural visionaries um, to be able to have a fortified space, a foundation um, to be able to excel and exceed and go to their highest height. So that's a little crash course in MBT. Shade, I don't know, there's um, more that you want to add, but that's, that's a crash course. I mean, that's a really wonderful crash course. I would also just say uh, my mother, Dr. Barbara Ann Tier, um, in founding the National Black Theater, what she wanted to do was to create a home away from home. And, and that for us is so resonant in this moment of why we're gathering here for this 12 hour Zoom of artistic expression is that we understand the power of having a home and for Black folks in this country in particular, who have been ripped from their home of Africa and um, through migration, forced migration, um, voluntary migration and immigration, the colors of our story all demand that in order for us to be able to seat our liberation, we must be able to plant roots or acknowledge or recognize something as a home. That when we are in the world doing what we do, we can only do it if we know that there's safe space that's holding space for our own creativity and liberation. And so NBT was created to be a home away from home for black artists no matter where they are, at what point they are in their career, that there's a safe space and that there's a space calibrated for their liberation and energetically, spiritually, and emotionally holding space for them to rise and fly. And so I would just add that to the crash course of what, what and who MBT is. We are hyper-local in Harlem, but we're also global as the diaspora um, calls our space home. Yeah, and this is important that you point out the loss of home or Heimat, as the Germans say, you know, two or three million people have left that country, you know, uh, mostly women, young children, uh, men are left, elderly people who couldn't leave. Um, and so, um, yes, this is something to everyone here who thinks about art, creates art, is so close to our thoughts. Um, what came to your mind as a response? You, you guys said we selected some voices, we brought something. What, what, what were you thinking about? It's, it's, ma it's mainly a, a, a roll call of quotes um, from yeah. various different BIPOC um, visionaries who um, kind of lean into the curiosity of discomfort, um, lean into the curiosity of also um, what does radical liberation look like. And so Shade and I were just going to read those quotes and then hopefully just having a discourse and dialogue with you, Frank, around what stems from it. Um, what does mm -hmm. it mean to embody these quotes? What does it mean to actually have these quotes live inside of this context? Um, and also utilizing this IP as a way, as a potentially a, a North Star um, to think about how do we create a salve in this moment, knowing that um, it will probably take generations in order to find healing. Um, however, it is all possible um, in our lifetime. Um, and uh, that there is potential in um, 
allowing for the lessons of this moment to show up and not necessarily the trauma um, and how do we get there? Um, and not saying mm -hmm. that has happened right now, not saying that it has to happen three days from now, but it's understanding that um, in order for civilization um, to have the echoes of hope, the echoes of faith, the echoes of a new dawn, there has to be a conversation around how do we, how, how do we learn from, um, from what we, what the tragedies that are ahead of us um, so that we can find the common ground that allows for um, the bleeding not to happen, but the healing to happen. Um, so uh, without further ado, we were just interested in reading, yeah. the, uh, reading some quotes and uh, sharing, sharing some wisdom that um, spans a lot of time and a morium. Um, so you'll hear some elders in the room and you'll hear some contemporaries in the room. And you mentioned BIPOC. Not everybody might know it. If you can just very shortly explain sure. we have listeners from Europe, yeah. BIPOC is an anachronism um, that can be controversial, we'll say that, but it stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. So it's an umbrella that many folks, not all folks, use to speak about. Um, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, the umbrella of folks of color. I'm going to start with the bowl of this moment and read Toni Morrison, who says, in times of crisis, this is, in times of crisis, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak we write, we do language. That is how civilization heals. And in this time, we are called as artists to lend our voice to ensure that civilization heals. What we fear has, is happening has happened for centuries. And no one has stated it better than Frederick Douglass when he says, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevail, prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither reason nor property will be safe. And so, as Maya Angelou always says, the truth is none of us are free until everyone is free. And this is the struggle that, you know, black identified bodies have had for centuries. This is a unifying rallying call for liberation for folks across the world in, in all of our histories, but poignantly in the black experience. Um, and lastly, before Jonathan goes into a seminal quote from Adrienne Marie Brown, um, I would just read this quote um, from James Baldwin. It says, ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I'm going to read a quote from Adrian Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy. Many folks uh, out there who are listening might know the book. Um, it is, uh, it's a book that um, really looks at how nature and how the world um, can help shift um, how we think about policymaking, how we think about how we flock, how we think about movement building. Um, and she pens in the book, P.S. If there happens to be a multitude of griefs upon you, individual or collective or fast or slow or small or large, at equal parts of these considerations, that the broken heart can cover more territory, that perhaps love can only be as large as grief demands, that grief is the growing up of the heart that bursts boundaries like an old skin or a finished life, that grief is gratitude, that water seeks scale, that even your tears seek the recognition of community, that the heart is at the front line and the fight is to feel in a world of distractions, that death might be the only freedom, that your grief is a worthwhile use of your time, that your body will feel only as much as it is able to, that the ones that you grieve may be grieving you, that the sacred comes from the limitations, that you are excellent 
at loving. That in all ways, and even in the spirit of people coming in for this 12 hour marathon, in yeah. all ways of you staying on for all 12 hours, Frank, in all ways mm -hmm. of the people who are listening to this on a consistent basis, and for all ways, and for anyone who is grieving in this moment, that the echoes of that grief stems from a, a power that is, that is unfathomably transformative, which is love. That is because we love each other so deeply, that is because we feel the loss so epically that we are generated, at, that we are reminded in that action that we are excellent at loving. And I just wanna end with this beautiful quote by Alice Walker, which is, healing begins where the, where, the, where the wound was made. That if we don't start talking about the spaces where wounds were made, that we don't, if we don't start having the conversations where the wounds were made, how can we ever have a reconciliation at the same time? So. That's really the quotes that we brought to be present with this conversation, um, knowing the epic tragedy of what, uh, of what is the premise of making this marathon happen as practitioners who work in gathering and making uh, profound, uh, courageous, safe gathering spaces for us, to, um, for us to stand in tow with our other fellow colleagues um, in the New York City area, saying that we really, we stand, we stand with, we stand beside, we stand in concert um, with, the many, with the many, many other voices who are working as purveyors of a very sacred act, which is to gather, which is to allow for the hearts and minds of individuals to be transformed. Shade talks about that all the time. Um, and how if we are to be able to allow for art to be the healing elixir that Shade talked about from that Toni Morrison uplifted, um, we have to allow for ourselves um, not only to allow for this love passion of grief or this love passion uh, that shows up, to sustain us. Um, we have to lean into it with a curiosity of um, truly, truly, truly leaning on each other and creating um, profound um, safe spaces yet again. Well, this is a very, very impressive and one can feel that almost generations, you know, of, of stand behind you, you know, who speak to us through you and an experience, actually the lived experience, as you said, also of the black body and um, today, uh, you know, we heard also in some, some of the Ukrainian artists since over centuries, that yeah, country has been invaded, uh, even so it was once part of the Greek empire, actually, and some mm. theorists say that's why they are different, you know, they are not used to kind of the czarist image of the one person in power, that there are, you know, traces of that kind of uh, older European idea of pluralistic um, um, voices, their language has been forbidden a hundred 42 times in like 200 years to be spoken even. Uh, very often it came from Russia, but um, I like very much uh, what you said. I also like the Toni Morrison quote, if there's a time of crisis, it's time to go to work. Yeah, yeah. That's what these 12 hours- what it means, yeah. 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 Um, you know, artists are the greatest tool in the translation of the human experience. The ability to be able to be a storyteller is the power of the pen. It is how we create bridges of understanding. It is how we translate culture through time. It is what unites us. It is what grounds us in our humanity. And in times of crisis, that is when the artists go to work. So often we are paralyzed through, the, through our trauma, through all of what we're experiencing. The idea of how to make sense of the senseless mm. is the space in which the artist creates an alchemy by which there is a possibility for healing, for transcending, for transformation, that all is not lost if the artist is in the room. And so as the most incredible and generational translators, right? When all generations come and they go, when civilizations come and go, what is left is art. And so the artist becomes the most important purveyor of how 
we have endured, but how we will um, ascend and transcend. And so I think when Toni Morrison says there is no time for fear, this is in times of crisis, this is when we go to work, we use language. All of the things that folks take for granted as a part of how we communicate are actually weapons in the artist's arsenal in order for us to show up, to be represented, to feel seen, safe, and sacred. And so um, that for me is what the Toni Morrison quote um, means. And Jonathan, I don't know if you have some reflections on the quote. I mean, I, I was just, the, the, the what, what was starting to come up for me was this, was this notion of when, when impact happens and it shifts the breath and what is the response after that breath um, is made? Um, uh, what, what after, after you've taken that breath, after that exhale, what is, what is that, what, what do you do with every breath afterwards? Like, like on so, on so many levels, um, um, I've been sitting with this idea of how does, how does courage and the etymology of courage, which I, which I got from Sade, um, which means the heart to be living in the space of the heart versus bravery, which is to live in the space of the muscle. Um, uh, if you were to live inside the space of the heart and live the space of the courage and breathe inside of that, what do artists get to do? And how do artists then get to utilize that, that courage space to then actually shift and change the molecular structure of their blood memory? Um, there is a blood memory that is that that is being that's being etched right now, and also a blood memory that's being reminded right now. There's a there 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 is something that is happening that is oozing out of our system um, that is causing us to react and also to be reactionary. Um, and and how we and how we respond to it um, is the is it, it is it is the promissory note that we will not repeat the sins of our past or the promissory note that we will evolve past it. Um, and I think that there is, there, there is a beautiful, um, inside, of all, inside of all tragic moments, there is a beautiful love note that can be found amongst all of the tragedy. And if we are able to lean into the beauty, the beauty that can be housed inside of it, we can then begin to etch a new fertile ground. A volcano teaches us so much it destroys in its path, but it also fertilizes the ground in which it stands. And so not to say that we need to rush to getting to fertile, not to say we need to rush to making, um, to making beautiful art yet again, but it is, a, it, is, it is a note that nature teaches us that, that in this time of tyranny, like slave, like, I mean, black folks in the African-American tradition can talk about it, slavery being one of those, right? If the promissory note was not held inside the bodies of black and brown of my ancestors when they were on, on whatever cotton field, sugar cane field, whatever it was, they didn't have the promissory note of joy or the promissory note of a future laid it inside of their body, my existence would not be present for you to interact with today. We wouldn't have such things as light bulbs or as peanut butter or even a, a, a machine to help us dry clean our clothes. The mathematic wisdom to take us to the moon would not have shown up. The promissory note that comes from the devastation is the fertilization of a new dawn, a new day. And that the wisdom that life teaches us if we look at history from its, from its um, complicated space, but also its loving space, and we don't water it down to be somatic with kind of how we want to the appetite in which we kind of like want things popcorn style really quickly, that we actually live in the complications of it. We will find that there is, there, there is, there is something to be housed in, in moments like this, that it brought us together also, right? It yeah. weaves us, it, it creates the cocoon for new possibilities to be transformed and transmorphed so that we can become the butterfly. We can transform into becoming something that we did not know, but was always latent inside of us to be more human and not to be conditioned by the Western POV. Mm, no, this is, um, it's, it's a powerful message. And I think it's a message, you know, and, and a lesson over centuries, you know, when it seemed hopeless, but that art has to be on the side of life. Bob Wilson also talked about today, he said, you know, we have to be hopeful 
our art is to be hopeful and it brings communities um, together. I liked what you said about the wound, um, you know, and that healing actually starts there. The German artist Joseph Beuys always said, show your wound, you know, and for art as an mm -hmm. artist, but also as a country mm -hmm. or as people. And mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with Victoria um, Kopchinetsky, who was working for Voice of America, you know, they might cover this. Um, and she said, what do you think? That, how come this happened again? Um, she said, I'm Russian. We said, war should never happen again. Stalinistic time should never happen again. Now mm. we had war and now we have a dictator who goes on and on and on, you know, and forbids to even use a single word war. You say the word war, you go to jail for 15 years. You know, yeah. and and uh, and perhaps an answer is that the killings of the Stalinism, you know, the 60 million people, some say, died, you know, of famine, of cleansings, of political repression. And it was never talked about. On the contrary, it yeah, was I mean, taken away. You I know, just, they'll. Yeah, yeah, no, can I yeah. just say this is Please. this this that is the wound, right? It's the wound um, as you have described it. It, with Stalinism, it is the wound of apartheid. It is the wound of transatlantic slavery. And without truth and reconciliation, without you know shining a blinding light into the cracks, there cannot be a changed day. And I and what we want to say as the National Black Theater is that we stand in solidarity and we stand on the front line as we have always stood on the front line. And the important part of this moment. In time is that we are gathering and we're using technology to find new and innovative ways to gather together because as Audrey Lord has said, as Maya Angelou has said, until if I am not free, then none of us are free. And so for all of the viewers that are in Europe, for all of the viewers that are around the world, for Black American folks, African American folks, for Black diasporic folks across the globe that are listening today. We stand in solidarity. We all have our story of how we have persevered, of how we have been tried to be extinguished. And each and every one of us are artists, as artists are seeds. They tried to, what's the beautiful quote? They tried to extinguish us but they didn't know we were seeds. And so we are planting today and always the seeds of hope, the seeds of healing, the seeds of creativity, which ultimately will root and be mm. the fruit by which we all, you know, see a day in which we can be truly free, where liberation is our birthright, each and every one of us. And so we have to find ways to be more human and to connect. And so we are grateful to be here, to be invited by you, Frank, to just meditate on um, what's happening in Europe, but also to bring the present pulse realities of what's happening here in the United States and what has for four, over 400 years and, um, and that we stand in solidarity. Yeah. Yeah, and that hopefully that kind of engagement with the truth the wood is real, you know, that people do listen to what you, your stories, the things you present, you know, and, um, and, um, and what you work about, and that this is actually a, a significant contribution, you know, towards also the healing here in, in, in this country that hopefully will prevent um, developments, you know, that... At the moment, because it hopefully is. unthinkable, but we, we do not know. The ice of civilization is thin. That's what everybody says, yeah. you know, who lived long enough. And, 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 and it's just, it's because, and I, I just have to say, it's the power of convenings like this that bring intersectional voices together that that are not, are outside of, that, that, that stretch outside of silo and live inside of the nuance of what does it mean to be human? And the quest of, of stretching outside of the silo is yeah. the elixir and the salve because we are so conditioned through the multiple different ways we have defined ourselves and lived ourselves as a society, a global society, a local society, an American society to, to start to silo and to, and to generate from a space of solitude um, instead of actually 
uh, going across the line and understanding that the line was never there. We actually put the line there. And then we have the opportunity to erase it with every breath that we take and every step that we make and every action that we have. And if we can, and, and that doesn't mean to lose culture and lose the cultural nuance and dexterity that makes us unique and special and, and powerful. What that does mean is that it understands my cultural nuance is not predicated on my imperialistic notion of yours or my denigration of yours. It actually lives in its abundance when I start to understand the, the space of your, of the beauty of how you show up in the world with the beauty of how I show up in the world and that there is enough space for all of us. There is enough space for all of us. Ashe. And I would just say it as our time winds down, I think the thing that's really key in this, and this is the work of the National Black Theater and so many of our colleagues, we just saw my uh, theater right before we came, is the degree in which history wants to not to erase our humanity is the relationship to how our ability to exist. So if there is one thing that we chant and that we, you know, that we pour into all of our work is how do we find more ways to create the conditions where you see us as human, that these are not headline stories, these are human beings. When the forefathers of the United States pinned black people into the constitution as three fifths of a man. They did that intentionally to be able to continue to erase us or to use us as chattel, as animal. And if we were seen that way, then we could be erased. We could have violence done against our bodies and it not seen as anything different than you would do to a dog. And so as we traverse this, as we lean into the alchemy of what it is to be an artist, what it is to be an artist is to, you know, put on a pedestal the ideals of our humanity and that we each and every one of us deserve to be seen and to experience what we are traversing through the heart, mind and spirits of a human experience, um, a soulful experience that is rooted in our humanity. So I see our colleagues are coming yeah, on. Come on, Kate, say hello and Nicole <laughs> and uh, uh, to, your, to your colleagues hello. Um, from the National Black hello. Theater. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Good to see you. Great to see you. See you. Too. Well, Frank, I just want to say, I hope you're drinking lots and lots of water. Yes, I do. <laughs> 12 I, hours. I have it here. I have it here. I hope you're drinking but, lots of water. Yeah. This is a beautiful marathon. It is so beautiful to see our next, the next company that's coming in with so much light and love. Um, and really thank you for orchestrating. I know that it takes a lot of weight to do this. Um, and um, there's so much wisdom being shared that uh, I think I think there's a transformation upon foot of what you have started and hopefully it becomes not a tradition because of the incident, a tradition because it's necessary mm -hmm. um, and that we don't need the incident in order to make this happen as a necessary uh, precipice. We just need to love to want to be in space with one another again and to transmute and again, take away the line. The line was never there. We crafted yeah. it. So what does it That's mean to true. erase? And these events help to erase it just a little bit more. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. That means a lot to me. And thank you both for taking the time. I know how busy you are, how much you work, and it is a holiday a weekend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. And I hope maybe you, you stay later, in and, and uh, maybe <laughs> listen to, to the play company, which is, I think, one of the great companies in New York, like the National Black Theater, like Mai, who we had before, and uh, others, because it is a company that said we work and show and present global work as man, we now say planetary work stuff from the planet <laughs> and not uh, just you know um in our neighborhood or the well-made <laughs> british play so welcome um everybody kate and uh, stacy nadine and nicole kate maybe a few words about the play the play company we know there's a players club but you are the play company yeah we are not the players club um, so, so yeah, may I, may I go into what I prepared yes, to go say ahead. before we yes. start? Okay. Thank you. So he hello, everybody. I'm Kate Lowald. I'm the founding producer of Playco in New York. 
And we're honored to be here alongside so many colleagues from the New York theater community and to be sharing our readings with everyone joining today. And Frank, thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this. Playco is dedicated to producing an international program of new work for the theater. We explore the work of artists from around the world to uplift curiosity about each other as human beings, to open channels of communication and understanding, and to expand the cultures and lived experience represented on the American stage. The courage and the perseverance of the Ukrainian people is a light for the world. There are many artists taking up arms there now to defend their country. It is deeply humbling to be here today offering words, but we see that words do have power because there is so much effort to silence them. So we offer them in the spirit of solidarity and hope. With me today are the actors Nadine Malouf, Nicole Shaloub, and Stacey Yen, beloved members of our Playco community. Nadine is joining us from backstage at the Public Theater, where she's currently performing. Nicole from Oklahoma City, where she's filming a project. And Stacy from Indiana, where she's currently teaching. So we're tuning in from around the United States. This group came together when Playco produced a play called Intractable Woman, a theatrical memo on Anna Politkovskaya by the Italian playwright Stefano Messini, translated by Paula Wing in the fall of 2018. We produced the play to share the story of the journalist Anna Politkovskaya, a fierce protector of truth who was murdered in 2006 as she entered her apartment building in Moscow, and to draw attention to threats to journalists and free speech while the Trump presidency was degrading the values our country is supposed to uphold. The play, which focused on Anna's accounts of Russia's second war in Chechnya, has been echoing in our minds again since this Russian war against Ukraine began. For today's presentation, we've worked with the director and a designer from that production, Lee Sunday Evans and Masha Simring, to put together readings that we'd like to share today. I also want to thank Charlene Adiambo from Playco for her contribution. Lee has put this together in the style of our production, where Nadine, Nicole, and Stacy together played the voice of Anna Politkovskaya. They're together again today as three voices and one voice. So now I will turn it over to Nicole, Stacy, and Nadine. We are a group of actors. A few years ago, we did a play about the journalist Anna Politkovskaya. By the way, Anna was born in New York City to Ukrainian parents. Her parents were Soviet diplomats posted to the UN by the Soviet government. The play was written by Stefano Messini, and it was an important project for all of us. It was important because Anna was such a dedicated reporter, committed to telling the truth about the Second Chechen War, and Putin's abuses of power there. It was also important because Anna was killed and telling her story, even though it ended in such a brutal act of needless violence, was a way that we could celebrate her. And learn from her and grieve the loss of her life, her voice, her passion, her writing and honor her courage, her dedication to truth telling in the face of unfathomable opposition. Today, we want to read some pieces of text inspired by the style of the play that we did. A tribute to the theater of Mariupol. A poem, part of a new play by a Ukrainian writer. An excerpt from one of Anna's books. Part of a Facebook post from a young Russian journalist we met while making the play. As a way to send our love to everyone in Ukraine, everyone who is fighting to survive, and resist in the face of the senseless war. Playwright Stefano Messini wrote, this was the theater of Mariupol. It was hit by an artillery strike with a thousand refugees inside. 
The theater is a place always in which human beings show the best of themselves. A place of words, of verses, of beauty, of bodies, of visions, of sets sculpted and painted, of costumes drawn and sewn, a place of questions and of memories. In sum, the best that humanity can express. Tonight, the Mariupol Drama Theater was destroyed. It no longer exists, it lies in ruin, and they are excavating to save the survivors of the crowd of people who found in a theater, this time, a physical refuge, not just a symbolic one, against the evil of the world. The theater welcomed them, as theaters always have throughout the history of the world, theaters that were created for the good of all who enter them. This is why the tragedy of the theater of Maripol is a catastrophe that cannot pass in silence in theaters around the world. As a man of the theater, I am struck and pained as I have never been. Therefore, I will try to launch to all those who make theater a simple proposal. Each theater this weekend will display a large M on their front door. It will be like all the theaters are the theater of Mariupol and as such in part will also be struck. That social media post was written by playwright Stefano Messini on March 16th. We want you to know, all of those who are listening, that many theaters, including some in New York City, did post an M on the doors. So that audiences saw when they walked in. Tonight, this is the theater of Mariupol. Today, Mariupol endures in the face of continued violence and destruction. Now we are gonna read a poem by the Ukrainian American poet, Ilya Kaminsky. This is from the book, Dancing in Odessa, published by Tupelo Press. The poem is titled, Author's Prayer. If I speak for the dead, I must leave this animal of my body. I must write the same poem over and over, for an empty page is the white flag of their surrender. If I speak for them, I must walk on the edge of myself. I must live as a blind man who runs through rooms without touching the furniture. Yes, I live. I can cross the streets asking, what year is it? I can dance in my sleep and laugh in front of the mirror. Even sleep is a prayer, Lord. I will praise your madness and in a language not mine, speak of music that wakes us. Music in which we move for whatever I say is a kind of petition and the darkest days must I praise. Next, we are going to read part of a Facebook post. It was written by the journalist and activist, Elena Kochuchenko, who was vowed to be a professional witness to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We met her in New York City. She was a fellow at Columbia University when we were doing the play about Anna Politkovskaya, Intractable Woman. She was living in and out of a kind of temporary exile because she did an interview in 2015 about Russia's military presence in Ukraine, which put her in danger. Also, Elena works at the Russian independent newspaper, Novaya Gazeta, which is where Anna worked. Novaya Gazeta has been forced to stop operating now, but Elena continues to post from the Ukraine. We thank Masha Simring for this translation of her words. I want to thank the Ukrainians who helped me from the moment when I, without money, cards blocked, and without connection, no roaming with the aggressor country, but with a Russian passport at night, ended up behind a border checkpoint in the village of Shahini. From this moment on, you, your love of your country, your courage and faith, not in me and my readers and the Russians, made my work possible. Thank you. 
I thank the decoders who followed me through the sounds of morgues, hospitals, destroyed houses. This is one hell of a job. Half of you refuse to take money for the work or ask to transfer your payment to a human rights project. I thank my dear editorial office who sent me to war, believed in me, protected me and waited for my texts and my return. Beloved, I have no words and there's no one closer to me. I have things to be finished before I can, before I could be imprisoned in my homeland under new criminal charges. Now I have a few months of work and sleeping in a safe place ahead of me. It will take time to finish what I started. This is a poem that Elena posted on Instagram a few weeks ago. We thank Masha Tsimring for sharing it and translating it for us. It's called... The Metro Has Become Strange by Fyodor Svarkovsky. Svarovsky. The metro has become strange. Passengers are disappearing. At first, we did not notice. But, but the, the number, number of the gone is growing. Information has leaked into the papers. Relatives are complaining. They are writing reports to the police. The rumors. After midnight, not long before the metro's closing hour, on certain lines, new stations are appearing. Station Seashore, Thunder by the River, Mountain Meadows and Meadows, A Dark Night in the Woods, Open Space, Station Ship, Station Dusk. The doors open carefully. You have half a minute to think. Beyond the doors, the shores of an island in the ocean, clouds on a cliff, pines, palms. The smell of oak and maple. Firm feathers crunch under feet and porcupines. They say the stations are quantum, unreal, but many still leave. This is an excerpt from a new play by the Ukrainian writer Irina Garretz, a founder of the Playwrights Theater in Kyiv. It was translated by John Friedman and Natalia Bratis and commissioned by the Center for International Theater Development. Which reached out to Ukrainian writers to give them work if possible during this time. Here's an excerpt of the play. Dwarf breeds of apple trees. They take up less space and they match my height. They bloom and smell wonderful in the spring when I can approach them and smell their blossoms without climbing up on a ladder. In the fall, I will collect their sweet fruits. Sources on the internet say the trees will bear fruit in the third year after the seedlings are planted. I'll wait. The main thing is to talk with my neighbor. He has a tractor and we have abandoned overgrown land. We recently bought a house with land in the village. We threw all of our efforts into remodeling the house but never touched the land. We spent a long time thinking about what would grow here. One needs love and humanity in these days of rage and hatred. My youngest daughter is pregnant and terribly frightened. She called to tell me there was an air raid alarm and because she was on the street and did not know where to hide, my arms and legs began to tremble. But it's no big deal, no big deal, I repeat to myself constantly. It's nothing. You just must wait, struggle and suffer the pain. It's like giving birth. Then you look at the baby and think, wow, good for me, I did it. We will cope. I want to balance anger with love and tenderness. My pregnant Dasha picked up a little mutt named Bun at the shelter. 
Bun entertains my child and relieves some of the anxiety. My husband and I have a second dog, Squirrel. We love our little one. Although to be honest, she looks like a little bat. Most important, the formerly homeless Bun and Squirrel are full of love for us. You need balance. My grandmother, who is half Tatar, was supposed to inherit a huge apple orchard from her Tatar grandparents, but she didn't. First, the Soviet government took away the apple orchard and destroyed the trees. Second, even if she had managed to inherit it, she would not have been allowed to do anything, acquire a profession or earn a living. I think, could it be my fault that the war started? Maybe my thoughts about the new apple orchard were interpreted as some absolute evil, a kind of Mordor that rejects everyone who loves, creates, and generates something, that destroys for centuries anything that is capable of creating happiness and giving life. When watering the apple tree, take care with the supports under the fruit-laden branches. The next to last text we are going to read is an excerpt from the prologue to Anna Politkovskaya's 2002 book about the war in Chechnya. Who am I? And why am I writing about the second Chechen war? I'm a journalist, a special correspondent for the Moscow newspaper Novaya Gazeta. And this is the only reason I've seen the war. I was sent there to cover it. Not, however, because I am a war correspondent and know this subject well. On the contrary, because I am just a civilian. The editor-in-chief's idea was simple. The very fact that I'm just a civilian gives me that much deeper understanding of the experiences of other such civilians living in Chechen towns and villages who are caught in the war. That's it. For that reason, I've been going to Chechnya every month since July. Naturally, I have traveled far and wide through all of Chechnya. I've seen a lot of suffering. It has been such a terrible war. Simply medieval. Even though it's taking place as the 20th century passes into the 21st and in Europe too. People call the newspaper and send letters with one and the same question. Why are you writing this? Why are you scaring us? Why do we need to know this? I'm sure that this has to be done for one simple reason. As contemporaries of this war, we will be held responsible for it. The classic Soviet excuse of not being there and not taking part in anything personally won't work. So I want you to know the truth. The very last thing we'll read is a kind of blessing, a prayer, a hope, a poem. Let there be new flowering by Lucille Clifton. Let there be new flowering in the fields. Let the fields turn mellow for the men. Let the men keep tender through the time. Let the time be rested from the war. Let the war be won. Let love be at the end. Thank you all so much. Really, <clears throat> thank you all. I mean, that is just a, such a, a powerful, a powerful combination of the material and words. And, and thank you for your sincerity in preparing it and delivering it. And um, how, how does it feel to the question to the actors to speak those lines? Thank <laughs> you.
don't want to speak for my for my fellow castmates, but we did Intractable Woman, the show about Anna Politkovskaya, in 2018, and she has not left us. Her words, her her work, her life's passion and pursuit and spirit have not left us, and so to return to to that spirit is. Um, unfortunate given the situation in the world today and ongoing, but uh, feels powerful to convene in this way. Yeah, over yeah, the, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> over the past few years, but obviously more recently, we sometimes check in as a group or even like um, some of the three of us, the actors and Lee, the director on text or whatever about little news bits or things um, whether it's stories about uh, certain journalists or things that are chilling um, that are happening. And then most recently, even before this project came about, we were sharing, you know, did you see Stefano's post? Did you see Elena's post? Did you see, you know, what's happening? And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I have to say that one of the more profound moments for me in, that, in the, the play that we did was the experience of meeting the Elena, who's the young reporter who works at Novaya Gazeta and um, having her present for our first uh, read through. And then she came back and saw the show and she had gone traveling all over the country. And I, I, I've always liked to check in um, when she posts on social media, just to see the incredible work that she's doing. Um, so um, yeah, I've been, I've been in particular thinking of her a lot because she's, um, you know, she's part of the legacy of Anna and, um, and she's uh, experiencing this all. And I, I, I hope and, and pray for her safety and her, and her work and, and hopefully Novoya Gazeta will, will be able to open again and be able to report um, independent journalism in Russia. Um, yeah, it's very personal for all of us. I think just getting to know so much about Anna and all the other journalists who uh, put themselves at risk uh, and continue to report after being poisoned and uh, harassed and their families as well. And like, it's changed the entire way that I, I look at any, any war and any independent media coverage. And I think like one of the most and it's taking me back to that time, but I, I, I'm, it's forever with me. Like Nadine was saying, like it, it's never left. And like, when we were working on that play, we had a lot of um, journalists come to see and like Kate had organized some, you know, talkbacks with like certain local online journalists and others. And that like, it was so meaningful for them too to see some of them who knew Anna and also just reflecting on their own journeys abroad in covering either war or personal stories in places that don't get to be covered. So it's just so, it's just so important, especially the way that the war in Ukraine is being covered and that we're watching before our eyes, Novaya Gazeta being, you know, closed down. And yeah, so it's been, uh, yeah, it was really great to get together and thank you for, you know, letting us be a part of this. Oh. Kate, what does it mean to you? Um, well, just listening to what uh, Nicole and, and Stacy and Nadine were saying, you know, sometimes I, I, uh, think about the fact that we're doing theater and what does that really do? Um, and uh, I do feel that on a one-on-one -on -one basis or maybe on a, you know, on the basis of each audience that we perform for, sometimes you are able to sort of plant something in someone's heart or someone's mind um, that does reverberate. And, and certainly as, as has been said, the experience of producing that play and, and you know, other plays that Playco has been able to produce um, uh, 
you know, I, I was thinking before today, like I said earlier, um, I, I'm thinking of playwrights in Ukraine who have guns in their hands right now. And, and here we are with words. Um, but words are powerful. Um, they can be. And uh, so it's, it's, very, it's very meaningful to be here today. And, um, you know, as Jonathan was saying earlier, I, Frank, I just think, you know, what you've been doing for the past two years, just bringing people together um, is so important. You know, whether mm -hmm. we're together in a theater or together through technology like this, um, yeah. it's really mm -hmm. important more than ever. Yeah, but also your work. Um, actually, what unites us with the journalists like Anna is the search for truth. Mm. I think it is really what you all are doing on stage as actors, the writers as writers, uh, Kate as a producer and artistic director. And it is a strong play. It's a great play. Everybody loves Lehman Trilogy so much, which Stefan also wrote. But I think this is a play that, you know, goes to the heart, you know, of making art and uh, being it. A testimony and a witness uh, what theater does what writers do what what producing means and it's a one of the great productions of the play company with, that they were once the sacrum binder or guillermo calderon's villa that really engaged uh, with uh, uh, with stories and they stay with us and they're not like television shows where they are like sugar soda drink and you forget <laughs> what happened you don't forget when you saw this play it changed you as um, yeah. Yeah, Nicole said, I never look at news again the same, you know, so something happened. And, um, and also it became true that whenever the Gazetta will be published again, it will be a free country, you know, so uh, we'll see um, mm -hmm. where it goes. But I really, really want to thank you for taking this so serious, for preparing so well, for uh, uh, delivering so beautifully um, this very, very uh, significant, you know, work and also the life of a person, entire life, someone who got killed for searching for the truth, for not backing down and for continuing to work, even so people soul told her, you should not. In a way, in Antigone, um, you know, of our times, who says, mm -hmm. you know, I care about the dead. Mm -hmm. I care about the corpse uh, <clears throat> in Czechia at the time or reporting on the Ukraine, what their colleague does now. So it's a very powerful thing. We want to really, really thank you. And we already have the next uh, group, Thess Bounderind uh, is here and Anne Murier, and uh, perhaps uh, also Bernice Miller from uh, John Jay College, who over the last decade also engaged uh, deeply, I think with Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe. So uh, first of all, welcome um, everybody, but all of you, thank you. I hope to see it again. I hope you will put this episode up on the Playco uh, uh, website and send it out. Or we send you a link. This was very powerful and very strong. And uh, like all the contributions today, really, truly meaningful. It also shows what theater can do if we really ask what influence, what can we show, what can we do? This is an example actually what it does. Thank you so much. And Thess, um, uh, uh, are you there? And uh, all of you, bye-bye and thank you. And Nadine bye -bye. Nicole, and Kate, and again, thank you, Stacy, for, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank bye. you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It looks like Thess and Anne are I'm upside here. down. Anne is yeah. Here. Yes. yes. Uh, you are, One yeah. second, I have to. Uh... Oh, good. That's better. Yes. Um, Wait one second, I got to do this. And maybe thing. you too. Uh, you could move it around. We see you upside down. Yes, that's perfect. <laughs> yes. Ah. And, ah, yes, here we are. And uh, welcome, um, um, both of you. Uh, we felt strongly that also CUNY stages, uh, in a way, is represented. CUNY is a, a large university system with 21 yeah. colleges, but actually... Um, 16 or 17 of them have theaters, they have theater programs. It's not as well known. It's never been as richly endowed like our private uh, colleagues at NYU or Columbia, but nevertheless, it's important work and the communities that are, that are uh, also uh, served. It's Lehman College, uh, John Jay College, LaGuardia, um, uh, the Borough Manhattan Community College, Staten Island, Brooklyn College, the programs our colleagues put on is uh, uh, it is stunning. But of course, um, today we went right away for this event to Seth, uh, who um, has been engaging uh, in a way for a long time in a deep way 
Um, and it's not just uh, because of now uh, what happened. And so I would like to welcome both of you and, uh, and uh, Thess, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do and about your work. Uh, thank you, Frank. I uh, will tell you, uh, I'm the chairman of our- Bernice, our... yeah, hello. Is Bernice here? Yes, he just joined. Hello. Oh, hooray. Hi, Frank. Uh, hello, everybody. Briefly, uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, we are Criminal Justice College and therefore our theater program is a minor. We don't give degrees, but we do the kind of theater research that other uh, universities are not doing because we're focused on theater uh, for social change. We're looking at theater, not merely as one of the humanities, but uh, more research oriented, more, uh, more backgrounds in the, in, in, in the social sciences. Uh, we have a program called Performance and Justice. My research is very broad, but it did take me into Ukraine on and off over the years where I met some fascinating people who we're going to talk about. And then what happened, what brings Anne into this conversation? Renice and I both graduated from Hunter College, by the way, a shout out to Hunter. And so then, Hunter, uh, yeah, Greg Mosher, a yeah, great Greg theater man. Harold Harold Plurman used to be on that faculty. Yeah. Uh, well, in any case, I had started directing again in, in about 2015. Anne and I were joined together in Paris to do some work. And then we went down to Vienna to show the work. And some of the people in Ukraine actually came to Vienna to see the work on the theory that maybe I could bring the work into Lviv and work with the uh, uh, internally displaced people. And I thought this was- So the idea is idea. Uh, internationally displaced actors internally displaced internally in, in other words the people that Anne and Bernice and I were working with were already involved in the Maidan uh, our translator was one oh. of the organizers of the Maidan in Lviv and in Kiev and she was uh, at 19 a crack translator her mom is Mea Harbuzia on the faculty at Ivan Franco we the group changed around a little bit. Our membership changed around, but we had gotten the invitation and Bernice joined the group. And around January, 2016, we prepared to go down there with something that we'd created on the condition we could give a workshop to young folks. And well, we went down there and we just immediately got to work. It was ice cold the whole time. And uh, Anne and I were talking earlier today and, and, and we were trying to get prepared in those days to teach people what we had been teaching ourselves, cross-section of various trainings and, and, and work on voice. Ultimately, one of our members was a little nervous about teaching, and I said, look, they're much better than we are. We really just have to go down there and be with them. Uh, mm. And we had some incredible experiences just as human beings, and we learned the city from the guts of the theater out. Fantastic. Uh, I wondered, yeah. First, let me let's ask Vernice and also Anne. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Vernice, how did you come to that project? Uh, as Seth was saying, he extended the invitation to me. Uh, we were uh, at that point working in France with Anne and uh, several other of the, um, the company members, and um, Seth invited me in. And so we ended up leaving from Paris uh, after we had been working on our own uh, practitioner project. We, we went down to take that project and at the same time to continue working on uh, this piece that Seth had begun to build with the students there. And, in in um, Ukraine. In Ukraine. So we went to Lviv and that's where we spent uh, most of our time building um, with, uh, I think there were maybe six of us all together. And do you remember how many we were? Oh, yes. I think it was six, yes. And how did you connect to, to Seth? Anne and I connected to another colleague that I'd met up at one of Eugenio Barba's um, uh, symposiums in, I think, 2014. And so we started like, you know, hatching this idea of what we could do, you know, with the sort of interdisciplinary work from various theater trainings. And uh, so my colleague who I'd met in Denmark uh, said, you've got to meet Anne. 
and uh, ultimately Anne stayed with the group. In fact, she's still working with us now on different projects. Uh, so Anne just came in uh, pretty much blind to everything. I told her what we were interested in. She said, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. But Anne, you, do, you are connected to Sappoetics International. Tell us a bit about that. It's a, uh, wow. Uh, maybe I, Anne, can, is she frozen? Are you, can you hear us, Anne? No, 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 I'm, he I'm here, I'm here. Um, tell us a bit, yeah. It's people coming from different countries, speaking different languages and meeting on stage. And each one with his own languages. So in the performance, we there were English, German, uh, Russian, and uh, Spanish, many, many languages. So... Uh, it was about to create another language who's stronger than um, the, the language we speak. And the body language is stronger. Mm -hmm. So you all went together and next to the work you went, worked in France and you created something new in Lviv. So tell us about the project. What was it exactly about, any one of you? Well, you know, it was a, 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 I'll feel this. It was at a moment where um, the global migration had really uh, ca the catch caught fire. And so as you, even as you went through Europe, you could see a lot of people who were displaced on the streets of, uh, of Paris. I saw families, you know. Um, in Lviv, that, you, you didn't see that, but that was the story we were creating from these actors who came from all these different places, in, in, including, uh, where was Ali from? That's from, from Iran. Uh, Tehran. Yeah. And so, and yeah. so th th there were people who had access to these stories of displacement. And it, it was almost like we were in the safety of Lviv, uh, creating the story about people who were displaced. And, uh, and the students uh, in Lviv were going through their own sense of displacement. In, in, and so we, there was all these levels of connections that were happening. But we, our piece was called, um, uh, we were doing um, Port d'Algiers. We called it Port d'Algiers 1963 because we were focused on things that we could connect from our present world back to the uprising in Algeria in those days. And also we'd used photographs from the uprising to make our physical positions. A physical score. Physical yes. score, yeah, raccourzi as Mayor Hold would have called it. Mm -hmm. and, and so what was unique about our group, Frank, was that each actor was a, 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 a well-formed performer themselves who could hold a solo themselves and and so we brought our individual stories and ideas together and Seth created um, different uh, um, tropes from which we found a physical score and that united the telling of the different characters that we were bringing to life and uh, um, and the kids so we were working on that play while at the same time working with the young people on building their own story which was um, vastly more energetic <laughs> than mm -hmm. our piece. <clears throat> so, so says, tell me, um, you, you are in New York City. Uh, I think 400 languages are spoken. Uh, they are, you know, actually has 4 to 12, 13 million people. Why do you felt strongly, let's go to Ukraine for my work? I will tell you personally, I have two reasons. But first, my family comes from Sri, which is just south of Lviv, and we're from the old rabbinic world. So a hundred years so it's ago, your homeland, I, your, your family. Essentially, comes from yeah, it. yeah. And, and I knew of it through stories. And eventually I went to these places and, you know, I saw some fascinating just things about what remains of Jewish life, what happened to Jewish life, what's going on in these cities. Now, Stree was the first city in Ukraine to fly the Ukrainian flag after, uh, excuse me, after I think the Orange Revolution, but certainly after the Maidan. And the other thing is that when I, understood my research on Gotovsky wasn't taking me where I wanted to go, which is more deeply into the ways in which secret police either support or interfere with the performing arts. Everybody said, you've got to do the research on Les Kourbas in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that's what really brought me in there in a way that, first of all, you know, I could justify all the research 
and also get the feeling of belonging in my homeland that I could never have gotten just through family conversations. So these two mm -hmm. things were real motivating factors. And as Rudy said, the energy of the people was even more motivating. The, the students actually that Bernice and I and Anne were working with, I had followed through their four years of university because I was doing my research and everybody seemed to know these students. And indeed, um, I got a Fulbright to do their graduating projects with them, which is an, quite another story. I want to focus more on what we were yeah. doing. Tell us about, uh, yeah, the Les Corbas Theater, your, your research. What is that theater? In 1907, it was a cabaret theater, and it had a lot of different functions, but now it's a state theater. Uh, uh, I'll remember, I think it's Kuczynski is, is, is the director. And uh, so we, had be we became friends, but the point is that that's now a state academic theater linked to the Ivan Franco University, but also with a, a great repertoire. But I remember in the days that Bernice and I and Anne were there, and even before they were already raising money for not merely internally displaced people, but to support various people who were soldiering. Mm -hmm. And indeed now, just to put it in the conversation, one of our um, most important members from the original thing is now, you know, in the, in the, in the military. So the, these young students are now, you know, the weapons are in their hands, they're running uh, various safety centers, hospital, helping people, and the Corbus Theater and Les Ukraine Ukrainska theater, both state academic theaters are doing that and they're creating new repertoire, uh, which, you know, if you go on their websites, you can find out about, it's very important. Uh, but my motivations are quite different from Bernice's and Anne's. I'm just telling you about how yeah. I came into it. Yeah. And why did you join, join and went to Ukraine early on? Uh, the, but first I followed Seth and his crazy <laughs> ideas. <laughs> And also, uh, it was just after the the, um, the, the the terrorist shooting in Paris, and it was this need to tell this the story we were telling uh, around the world, and that is uh, getting outside of Paris, and that was yeah my 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 needs at this moment, and. Um, uh, seems very relevant. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, when I, when I, what was shock, well, not shocking, but like it's um, amazing for me is when I met these young people who are actually living in the country who at this time was already at war, but this more silent war. Uh, they they were ready to fight for their for democracy for 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 their countries and yeah that to see these young people who are twenties and so committed to to democracy was uh, yeah um, quite a strong memory. So what did you learn <clears throat> being in Ukraine? What did you learn about Ukrainian state? What did you all learn from being there? Uh, I'm European. <laughs> And it's Europe. I felt like it's it's my continent, and uh, I didn't felt any differences between being in France or being in in Ukraine. And that was, yeah. And all these young people also, um, I had nothing to learn to them. They had um, such skills, great singers. Um, yes. Yeah, I think for me, um, like Anne is saying, the, the skill level of the students really, um, I found uh, um, surprising. I had no idea that they would be of that high caliber of performance. And um, uh, I, I'm Jamaican uh, American. Um, but I've spent a lot of time in Europe. Uh, the, the, nonetheless, what I found, some of the, the impressions that I was left with, uh, which are now quite disturbing to me, was the meeting of the old and the new in this Ukrainian uh, uh, city. 
where so much of the city, the architecture, the feel, the, the, the smell was old, but the kids were new and they were far more adept at technology and ideas and their, their, their creative uh, response into the world was, was fresh and unique and bright and vibrant. And so the juxtaposition of these two things really turned me on. And to see now the leveling of these cities that for me, yeah. it, it meant so much to see and to, 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 to smell, to touch that, to see that being destroyed is just so painful. Beth, how is this for you looking at this war? Uh, it's, I you know, I've, I, I've, I've had, Frank, uh, a, a number of different responses. Uh, the, first, uh, the first level response to me is the devastation uh, for, for people, just human beings, what's going on. The second level is the devastation for people that I know and what they must be going through and seeing places that I recognize uh, on, uh, in the media and, and, and how that resonates. But then there's also the complexity of me being a black person who had been in Ukraine in black skin and having experienced racism there. And, but because I had such beautiful experiences with the young people we worked with and the adults within the theater circle, I was so well taken care of that uh, these two experiences, you know, existed there for me. And so for me, uh, the response is very, very uh, multi-layered. It, it's not just one response. It's like these deep responses that constantly question our humanity. Yep. Seth, if you... Um... I'm thinking about what Bernice said, and it's true. My experiences uh, are, were quite different. Uh, and I learned much better than anywhere else that I worked that when it's time to go, you snap your fingers and you go. The most important two words I ever learned in my life, uh, I don't know what they are in Ukrainian, but let's go. I mean, that was the attitude. and then once you get there, you look at the materials you have and then you snap your fingers and say, let's go again. Uh, I think that the, the youth and energy of the people that we were working with gave me an, a, an incredible new lease on life and a, a resilience to things that I didn't have resilience to before. Because if you look, for example, at the uh, outrageous history of anti-Semitism throughout e Eastern Europe and the shtetls and all of that, uh, many people would ask me, why do you want to go back to a place where they killed your people over and over again? And I just, I hadn't, that didn't really enter into my mind. When you really look at the situation, it's just far more complicated. And that, so I was compelled to get involved in a historical situation that had little to do with my, my identity as a white male from New York. So, you know, for Vernice and I, we're always approaching, we work together a long time. We are always approaching the same situation, but from such opposite perspectives. And in Ukraine, both of us just had to, you know, turn on the workflow. And that was the best thing I think I've ever done in my life as an artist. I was so grateful to the, for the opportunity. And we, would, we can talk about personalities in, in Ukrainian theater, but we didn't know that the great personalities of Ukrainian theater had opened up that door for us. We were just there to work. And it was so, uh, an honor, an absolute honor. And watching the cities mm -hmm. get destroyed and hearing that some of the people that I knew had resurfaced. Some of our actors are in bunkers now, secretly carrying on communications and things like that. We can't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the now of that is the now of now, you know? And uh, I, I'm very, very pleased that I could actually say to the people that I work with in Ukraine, you can take this and you can do whatever you want with it. So we have an NGO down there named Gershom Theater. It does what it wants. And, uh, the spawning of new projects is something that I just want to foster in ways that 
the students give us the creative idea and I say, let's go. That's my you're attitude. Also, you're also working on a musical project on in or even creating a theater in Lviv. Is that, uh, you mentioned that. What we, is that about? Well, we're doing a lot of different things. First of all, we did take over a building and we kept it alive. And then we brought new members into the group who are not this original 13, but the singers and the, the whole dance community came out because of the movement exercises. Ultimately, we had to let the theater go, but the groups stayed together. And then we would go back and forth between Ljubljana, was sort of our second city, and Lviv. And ultimately, we would have a symposium once a year with performances, workshops, etc. And then 2019 hit, and it was impossible to get going on that again. And then it dawned on me, we could do it like we're having this conversation now. Everybody makes a very short 90 second to two minute video with a prompt from various p poetry, but they don't have to use the poetry in the piece. So they can dance it, they can sing it. There's a lot of different stuff going on, but this is new. And it's, it's the fact is that 50% of our, our 106 members are from Ukraine. So 50% yeah. of your members, go ahead. You have a hundred members in that new theater you created then, that theater community in Lviv. Half are in Lviv, but we uh -huh. have some in Burkina Faso, Tokyo, France, um, New York, USA. <laughs> I forgot about USA, right? That's amazing. Uh, I, I remember I said, well, we, you read Media. something or from a text or something. And you said, Frank, you don't understand how we work. We work in a different way. What's that different way? Well, to summarize it rather quickly, if I get a piece of text, I have to match it to the actions. I'm an actor. Or if I get a score of actions, it should be useful with any piece of text. When I learned this from Torger Vettel at the Odin, Bernice learned it, I think, from Roberta Carreri. So we began to work this way. And the simple act of justification, which is something that Klorman introduced to us, we tried it in many different ways. And it's especially important when you don't know the language that you're working in so that the physical language should be able to justify anything. Bernice and I argue about this, but we both agree that it's what we are constantly focused on in the work that we do. And Anne got it. She understood it better than we did. And, and you know, um, just to add on to what um, Seth is saying, what's really unique about the work that we do is that we are very internationally centered in that we are pulling on all of us from the various countries and tapping into our common humanity and recognizing that these uh, stories of injustices that we're exploring are not new. It, we're exploring the, the human condition and using our art to hold up a lens and at the same time for us to meet each other. Like Anne said, we meet on the floor, we bring ourselves into the theater. And you know, right now I'm working with um, the Romanian uh, playwright, uh, Saviana Stănescu. And, yes. and she's written this beautiful play um, that Heartbeat Ensemble is producing called um, Be Trapped Inside the Window about domestic slavery here in um, Connecticut in the USA. And the, 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 this issue is not just here. It's like wherever there's injustice in the world, we have artists who respond, who hold up the mirror and say, is this who we really are? Is this who we want to be? And Sub Poetics International is doing that in a very global way. Yeah. So if you cannot do it now, obviously, and who knows for how long um, in, in the Ukraine, uh, um, uh, uh, Anne and Stas and Marisa, where will, where will you do your work? Or where will the group come back together? Will Ukrainians right join? Now, we're doing our work on our website. Um, on the website? A four-part mm -hmm. series called Will You Love Me? in December, as you did in May. And we've got episode one and two already out there. Uh, yes, we're charging a little $5 membership thing, but you can be sure that that $5 is recycled into supporting the artists. Uh, we're going to put together episode three. Frank, it's uh, Subpoetics International at Squarespace. I don't know it right off the top of my head, 
But um, I'm perfectly happy for people to contact me to find out about it at my university email address. Mm -hmm. And Renice is also doing some exquisite work with uh, one of our sister companies in the United States, and it's called a Laboratory for Actor Training. So these are the places where you can see the kind of work that Renice and Anne and I have been involved with and are continuing. Mm. But it's on TV now. That's basically it. That's you know? it. Yeah. So you yeah. reinvented uh, the genre and you adapted to that new times uh, after Corona or still the time of Corona we live in. Um, yeah. I think Brisbane Biden said 100,000 Ukrainians will come to the U.S. Do you think uh, some of your actors will come over? One is already here. I and believe so, but I think it's actually the case. Are you reaching more... out to them? Reaching them? Are they reaching I'm out working to you? with them, of course. Yeah, we're working together. We're creating episode three of Will You Love Me in December, as you did in May. And one of our Ukrainian members will be working with one of our members from Burkina Faso, who are both here in the United States. Uh, sanctuary or not, they're working hard. And they believe that family members will come. And I've opened my doors to one family. That's incredible. I mean, that's quite stunning. And but also in a way represents the spirit of the city of New York that in a way it's very oh, yeah. local. Um, but on the other hand, it always has the global, the planetary uh, scope in mind. Um, I think it was Tony Kushner who actually joined us today with Oscar Uses, who said New York is the melting pot that never melted. <laughs> um, and there's some truth to it, you know, but perhaps is this time that time of Corona, the time now of a war, you know, perhaps the temperature is going up and that leaden structure is melting and we are getting together and new fusions um, um, are coming out. I think it's uh, really of interest. Uh, also the fact that your college is named of criminal justice, you know, which is in a way also a mission for the theater, you know, to get justice yeah. for criminal acts. Um, you know, there will be war tribunals. There have been Milo Rao staged many trials, you know, might be also an inspiration, you know, where he had life uh, 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 real actors and about uh, real, real actors in the sense of who were uh, accused. He did this in Moscow, the Moscow trials, the Pussy Riot uh, 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 jail sentence. So he restaged it secretly in the Sakharov Center with real judges and uh, prosecutors and lawyers. And there's a lot to do. And perhaps, you know, this could also be one of the uh, engagements, you know, in your in your great uh, work at the uh, at that um, College for Criminal Justice uh, to find a way to bring truth to light. Um, we are already a little bit in our next uh, segment. So we have now um, with us the next group. And um, it is uh, the great New Yorkian Poets Cafe, who, who is uh, uh, teaching, joining us, uh, Daniel Gallant, who was formerly the director, could not be with us. But we have the great uh, Kimberly Ramirez with us, uh, J.F. Siri and uh, Paul Latour. And um, so say hi to Stas and uh, Vernice and Anne-Marie from France, right, where you, it's almost midnight there or past where, where, where they touched and they talk, talk to us about their work um, in Ukraine uh, over the decades, almost for many, many years, they have been engaging there and created work, created a theater company, an international one, and now um, of course, all the rules have changed. Everything is different. So thank you uh, um, uh, for joining us and Seth and uh, Vernice and Anne. And we move over to that also, I think, jewel in the New York uh, theater community, that famous place, in a way, some say legendary place, the New Yorkian Poets uh, Cafe. And um, Kimberly, you are, I think, at a conference somewhere in Florida. Uh, that's so we true, have that's true. Yeah, um, so, so tell us a little bit uh, uh, where you are, what you do, and also perhaps uh, speak a little bit about the, uh, the, the Poets Cafe or, or Paul or uh, JF Siri. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first I have some exciting news to share. We were all just backstage with the stage managers, and um, it appears that the, uh, the Instagram account for the seagull has crashed, like has been flagged for censorship because so many people are, are tweeting and retweeting and sharing the hashtag for New York theater artists for Ukraine. So wow. it's, it's quite interesting. So um, everyone's trying to contact Instagram and, uh, and recover the Seagulls Instagram account. But I think that this is a testament to the amazing work that you're doing. Um, and you're only you know, part, part of the way through, through the long 
day marathon already, and and you've you've crossed mm-hmm. the, you broke the internet with the sensation. Uh, we like it. I hope it's not our fault that it, it CUNY technology just wasn't up to peer. But um, uh, who of you will tell us a little bit and also audience about the New York and Poets Cafe? Okay. Do you want to, uh, Paul La Torre? Um, do you want to give a brief history, or I can do that if you'd like Sorry. to start there? Okay. Well, that- it's a- Paul, start, and then and then Kimberly. Okay. Will follow. I'll hand off gracefully. So the the New Yorican Poets Cafe was started by Lower East Side Manhattan, what's called Lo Isaida, um, queer Latinx Black artists um, who started in parlors. They, it started with Miguel Algarín and his circle, uh, Deacon Bimbo, like so so many visionaries, luminaries um, of the Lower East Side of New York City, right outside of the theater district. Um, and they, they founded this cafe, um, starting out of living rooms and evolving into various spaces throughout uh, the Lower East Side and then eventually residing where they are in East Third Street today, um, where the, the cafe has operated successfully with poetry performances, ASL slams, um, you know, theater productions, um, and as, as a venue for teaching, education, um, and, and culturally impacting uh, the world, honestly, now moving through uh, virtual uh, spaces such as this one today. Um, yeah, Kimberly, you can- Well, cool. and also it's a, it's a cool fun fact that the snaps kind of evolved from that when when um, audiences and poets were assembling in Miguel Aguirre's, uh living room, you know, the, the applause was a little bit too much for the neighbors. So that's how the snap was born. So it's a good- Good fun fact. Oh, oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and the legendary Jean-Michel Basquiat, you know, was supposed to be have hanging out there and crashed there when he wasn't famous yet uh, in the attic um, of, of the place. Um, so um, so let's uh, t- uh, talk a little bit. Um, you know, it's also mostly uh, known also for spoken word artists, you know, which you are. Um, and um, since this war started, uh, the invasion of the Ukraine in Russia, um, how does the spoken word community react uh, to that? What do you, what do you hear, uh, JF Siri? Maybe you tell us a bit. Well, I I can't speak for all poets, but I can speak yeah. for myself as a yeah. poet. Um, I mean, I think you know, poets are observers. Poets are poets are um, translators of the human experience and the human condition. And so, um, it's it's very. I, I would imagine that it's challenging for a poet to watch what is happening around the world and not um, be inspired to comment on that artistically. So, um, like a lot of different things that are happening around the world, I'm sure lots of poets are gravitating towards the images that they're seeing on the media, the stories that are being told and reported on in the news and, you know, taking that and, and sort of wrestling with it, um, philosophically and, and creatively, um, and then sort of sharing some of those stories in our work. So that's, how I would answer that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've, I've seen a lot of frontline um, activism and people speaking, people of Ukrainian background and descent and heritage um, speaking towards what's going on and those not, but who feel, you know, solidarity. Um, there's There's been a lot on our online and in-person mics, support, people wearing the colors, people leaving words of, of love uh, and, and embrace and endearment. Um, so it's, it's been a rallying, uh, a, a rallying cause, I think, in, in the New Yorkian, uh poetry cafe circles that, that I've been present for over these last uh, few months, for sure. Mm. I mean, the, the New Yorican Poets Cafe, people may not know where it's located, but it's um, East 3rd uh, between B and C, but it's also at the intersection of art and activism. Um, and uh, this is no exception. And I think that the way that the cafe has handled the lockdown period also has made it so a so much more international outreach. And we have all kinds of hybrid, high flexi things going on in this space where there's uh, screens with other spoken word cafes all around the world, like super international um, uh, slams and things going on with, with 
do Tokyo and a, a bunch of other cities around the world. So um, I feel like now more than ever, there's an international awareness and, and this is certainly playing a role. It's been less than one month since the Russian military bombed um, the Ukrainian theater at Mariupol and uh, 300 people it just civilians, innocent civilians. And when you think about the way we gather at the New Eureka Poets Cafe or the way that we gather at our theater, it's a place where we feel safe. And it's always an escape, even in times of peace. It's always a place where we can just kind of go and just be like, oh, I'm with my people, I'm in my community, this is my this is my space. And if you have to be hiding from from bombs and terror and, and, and war, you know, like a, a theater is, is like a top choice, right? Like we all feel like we're gonna, especially with the children, the amount of children that were in that space and how that was probably comforting to them, like in contrast to hiding in the subways or, you know, just to be in the theater, like maybe a transcendent space, this huge red roof. And on each side of that theater um, was written children in big white letters on the entrance and the exit of that street, just children. And when you think about like my mother was, um, she was she was oppressed by an authoritarian regime and had to flee her country as a child and in Cuba we, right it, yes in Cuba and so you know I've been to, I've been hearing about experiencing war and oppression and totalitarianism from a child's vantage all of my life but when when you know we see these kids on TV these Ukrainian children asking questions trying to get uh, you know a rationale of um you know, looking to adults who can't explain it. It doesn't make any more sense to, uh, to adults than it does to the children. But their words, if you listen to their words and their songs, they are accidental poets. They're making poetry. And I have some of the, the words from the children of Ukraine, if you can indulge this offering before yeah. we can segue into the readings that everyone prepared. So these are the, these are the Ukrainian children's words. So this is kind of now from me, a fa or for us, a found poem of their, their terror. When they shoot, I run home. I am afraid and I cry. I think about dogs. When you get shot, when you get shot at, it's the scariest thing. I try not to think about it, but it comes into my head. Minds can be either very small or big. In order not to be deafened, you should lie on the ground. You should cover your ears and scream. I do not want to go back to the basement. Do you hear? And the Ukrainian Charitable Fund is amplifying these voices of children. And they're doing everything that what they're, they're looking to artwork. The children gravitate to artwork naturally to um, try to you know, feel better in this time of terror and crisis. We hear them you know, singing, we, they're reaching for paintbrushes and paints and they're painting these, boat, these uh, you know, you know, drawings and um, the, they're creating this artwork. And, um, and psychologists are analyzing it and helping them. And this one kid, this one little Ukrainian kid paints um, like these billowing waves and curves of, of paint just like on the paper. It looks like kind of an explosion. And they say, what is the name of your drawing? And the kid says, war, really emphatically like war. And then the child continues to work on the painting. And then all of a sudden holds it up and says, I'm done, I'm finished. It's a clown, it's a clown. And the psychologist says, but didn't you have another name for the painting? Wasn't it war? And the child says, no, 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 I changed the name. Let it be a clown. And it just like, I'm getting chills right now, just remembering the story. Like the idea that that child was able to manifest from the from the terror that he was witnessing that went directly on on the page and hit in their artwork to manifest humor out of it and i don't know if any of you saw the article in the atlantic yesterday about uh, by uh, uh, zelensky where zelensky constantly references humor he talks about monty python the beatles yellow submarine he's making jokes he talks about our american movie groundhog day and he urges us all to keep the humor i mean if zelensky can say this he's like even a surgeon in the surgery like you have to have some elements of humor and he characterizes putin as humorless humorless right? yeah so, as was um, hitler was known to have had absolutely no sense of humor ever and it's a bad sign and it's not a good thing. 
And uh, maybe Paul and JFC. So, yeah, no, I yeah. just wanted to segue into that. With yeah. the you asked us to think about the poet in the time of war. I'm just opening it up. Like it can be anything. It can be, you know, yeah. we, we, we can spin it into humor, spin the art into humor like that child did. So whatever the offerings, I think JF Siri is going to share something first and then Paul, and then coming back to, to JF for another piece. Thank you so much. Um, so the first piece I'm going to share is really just dedicated to the women. Um, it's it's written originally for Latinas, and so I just want to uh, open to to every, anyone watching um, that it was originally written for one group, but I do see it as a call um, to all women. Mujeres Latinas somos. We are of the earth, brown and rich, ever connected to our raíces as we birth humanity. Our bodies grow like the limbs of a tree, our children its leaves ready to embrace the world. History is written into the lines of our faces, our eyes, the stories of our past. We are our mothers. We are our daughters. We are the guerreras of our past. Hay fuerza en nuestra sangre. We are of the water. Yemaya welcomes us in her waves, teaching us her rituals, guiding us as we guide our own ancestral spirits, urging us forward. Our mothers once daughters, our daughters soon mothers. The cycle of life keeps to the rhythmic beat of our hearts. In sync, we travel as one. We are of pride and knowledge. We feel with our minds and think with our hearts. We are strong and sensitive at our cords. We defend and protect and defend and protect and defend and protect. Somos de hierro. Withstanding the abuses of our society, continuing to raise the children in our communities practiced in the art of patience and love. We are of work. We know the burdens of home early and we take flight from our parents to create new spaces of rebirth. Somos de arte y poesía. We are of song and dance. Somos de cultura y orgullo. Mujeres Latinas somos. Thank you. And now I'll pass it on to Paul. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, ooh, okay, following that, just gotta brush off some of these chills. All right, this piece is called Starving. Tonight we bring voice to a most noble plight. What's a noble fight to a missile strike? What's a colony to a country? Distended bellies to those well-fed. What's a denouement to those still battling climactic threat? What a survival to a superpowered rival who might simply not care to comprehend? Human beings in a mob. What's a mob to a king? What's a king to a god? What's a god to a non-believer who don't believe in anything? We make it out alive, all right, all right. No church in the wild. No churches in war. No temples built in wild brush for this atheist. High school senior bulimic. I would take table scraps, offer them up to gods of lack, starving myself of sustenance purposely in hopes that I could grow smaller. It's ironic when we deprive ourselves at times we deprive others of what we could provide the world had we been full strength beings, beacons of light, bastions of human decency. Yet consumed by not eating, we atrophy hopes to be free to pursue the inalienable rights of life, liberty, happiness, sad as I was in those days. That's nothing compared to what much of the world has to endure. Injustices of war, enslavement, and other uniquely first world trigger fingered horror scenes blowing what remained of my faith to smithereens, faith not one in all omnipotent reigning king, some kid sat upon hill, ant magnified glass in hand as he decides who is worthy of savior, faith lost, if not only in gods, but in the bullies of our worst nature, faith in us collectively to do the right thing. When confronted with choice to act or stand pat, sat on hands, turning backs on table scraps, tossed aside while so many go underfed, you know, in ninth grade, there was this bully. I forget his name, that's not the important part. What's crucial was how during lunch he would roam and patrol the cafeteria like a Bolshevik armed with a scowl and his red right fist stirring shit, sticking his privileged thumbs in plates on trays of whosoever food he deemed so fit, ruining meals, spoiling appetites in equal measure. So many unable to afford replacements, he felt compelled to enact this atrocity, not because of lack or want to keep and eat what he pleased from their plates, rather just to lay claim to it dominion over his white tied kingdom just for the sake of spite simply because he could he found power in being more ruthless larger stronger agent of chaos mischief god of pure selfishness like loki 
high key hating on his brother's accomplishments. And ever since that day, I noticed most bullies simply grow up without outgrowing this. So these days I praise the lips that give me capacity to tell these stories, to speak my peace on such unholy days as these on Seder, Easter weekend and Ramadan breaking fast upon dusk telling non man made gods that we will forgo in hopes to be granted serenity. My long modeled modus operandi of lack offered a sacrifice to only feast after 40 long nights, not to relent one moment sooner, such a shame that the strength gained in caving in and filling concave cave of this cage's rib with sustenance would make one far less apocryphal, for we will not accept atrocities brought on firsthand, neither by disorder nor power drunk precedents, setting megalomaniac precedents with arms hovering over button ready to red right palm invoke red dawn where doomsday clocks tick down to final hour and bring ruin in frigid wars, recounting how all life is merely biding their borrowed time. I recall that bully in the lunch line, how not one administrator, authority figure in the room stepped in, yet we collectively govern ourselves to the decision it was time to bring stop to it. Yet that reckoning wouldn't come soon enough. It took until junior year, two whole years of hunger and torment when I said, every time he tries to eat off his own plate, let's flip tray. So maybe that when he sees what it's like to lap, perhaps he'd stop. And what do you know? Our tactic did the trick. Two days into abortion fed famine, he demanded we stop. This bully sought ceasefire, yet only when we fired back. Back, till nary a crumb was left, yet when temples of body come Jericho crumbling down, Taro or Babel undone by merciless serpentine tongues like 900 bodies dumped in unmarked graves in Kiev, stacking pyramid all along the eastern front, Soviet warmongers, no better than pharaohs, begetting furors who enslaved the whole race, and we know who's to blame. Those lunchtime bullies left unchecked with thumbs pressing axes to grind family lines to find powder, war crimes in Crimea, Warsaw, Kharkiv, and Chernihiv, where red armies will not cease until their sworn enemies, for reasons untold to them, are Putin the ground, these Vlad the impaler, neighbors to a sister city, now Vlad mirroring, destruction, conquering, a place they lay no rightful claim, but still want it anyway, every bit the overfilled gut of fascist bully bareback upon horses unsaddled with the very smallest of small dick energy guilty partying these united soviet socialist sent republican missiles with promise to follow up warhead chernobling the atomic thread between superiority and unclear threats shows we can very much consent dissent and mutually assure destruction when we sing songs of war and calls to arms but you can't embrace your young or hug someone with nuclear arms Isotopes isolate, unable still, so far to go, just to reach armistice, arms racing, Armageddon, setting doomsday clock ahead of time, finish lines run through, red tape conflicts brought on by delusional dogs of war, desperates desiring power so absolute, it corrupts ab ab absolutely, cause whoa, huh, yeah. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. These hollow caustic, hollow acts that cost us more than spoils split amongst victors. Very few far in between could ever be reaped, Keep, keeping count of countless casualties, the causality, no statistics could ever ca tally, child anatomies buried, the true tax of war's taxonomy, but we stand with Kiev, Eviv, and Mariupol, along with the 7.1 million displaced inside Ukraine, 4.5 million seeking safe refuge as they flee, now being embraced by nations far and wide, united in welcoming refugees for the many more we still need to offer support. Not deny passports of entry based on place of origin. I say if you are not letting in those of black, brown, and African descent, then you are doing a disservice to the cause, causing shame, not embracing sovereignty. Can't say you heed peace when you still speak colonized tongues of apartheid, seek to divide amongst lines of race, creed, non-believers who don't believe in, Quality, so we, the healers, soothsayers, and painters of word, we poets stand on watch today, united in palm's length, the only arms we wish to race or raise, this raices, this human race we once reclaimed, giving offer what we can offer in calls for support to those still resisting fight for liberty to live to see another day. As resistance sends Neptune missiles to seek flagships, a black sea fleet upon the black feet of wanderers still seeking asylum, refuge from attempted coups, invasions, a tale as old as time, and evil still seems to be trying on its new mask this time. No birthright or throne, no war we condone to support for those in the throes of survival, the only triumph, because as I learned, the best way to fight a bully is to starve them, that we are not one to stoop to levels lest they wish to deprive others. We can very much go blow for blow so long as they target one of our plates. None will rest until the bully respects that if we go unfed, so will they. A thumb for a thumb, nor an eye for an eye, because we're not blind to injustice so long as Ukraine's not free. 
We won't allow these Bolshevik bullies to digest one bite, thumbs, and eye of oligarchs if we must kick up a bit of dust because liberty is rarely ever won nor given freely on silver-plated lunch trays. We get, we must seize it, so we stand with them. As Ukraine fights for a home rightfully theirs, even we typically non-believers believe with all the conviction we can muster that this resistance this time is justified. So side by side stood until the bully sees that he will not eat until Ukraine gets back their seat, not just the seat, but their entire table to sit with no fear of Russian reprisals of thumbs stuck in orbital plates in sight as they eat in peace finally, all the while knowing you can never stamp out all war like you can't prevent all bullying. We know at least we can stand on the side filling us with nourishment to not only survive but thrive, find happiness because the one thing we believe is in these intrinsic rights to life, liberty, we can only find happiness divine when we free all our people still starving. Peace. I'll throw it back to you now, Siri. Hey, amazing. <clears throat> so here's a, a draft stage um, thoughts. War. World round, sunrise to sunset, avian melodies drown in rapid fire ammunition. For some violence be a permanent condition. We think we know war. We think we know occupation. We think we know corruption. Masters of Western media and cinema tugs of war on threads where our avatars don flags of solidarity as we wax ignorantly about the toils of war. We praise resistance from a distance, glorify heroes prepackaged and fed to us, but how does one explain pray for Ukraine to a Palestinian or an Ethiopian or anyone who's lived war for generations? Two children traveling to freedom with a desperate mother's scrawl on their backs. Our hearts cry with empathy until the border comes into focus. Uh, see, there is no asylum for those traveling north, only west. We accept the racial hierarchy of resistance, arming only those who prove useful allies. We lift up one casualty, ignoring simultaneously the cries of others. We who are afforded the luxury of cash apping our charity, we never get dirty. And so I wonder, when do we rise up from the constant contradiction? When do we take the blinders off? Do we stand a chance against the agents of war when war comes for us? who will pay, pray it all away. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, it looks like we have a five minutes. <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing. Wow, well, I'm uh, so so uh, impressed. The, the war Chernobyling um, from Paul and the liberty was never saved, served on a silver tray actually yet to fight for us. And I, I think your question, you know, what are we going to do if war comes to us, you know, and what about the war that's already here in a different way, of course. And um, and I really want to say thank you so much. The last two poems, Paul, also yours. Did you just, did you create that in the last uh Yeah, my, my, poem, my, my poem I wrote today or today. yesterday. Because that's the kind of person I tend to be. I tend to be like occasional, write something occasional, but it always yes, turns yes. into like, I'm going to go with the energy of what it's giving me right now and today. So. so you were sitting at home or in a cafe or how did it happen? Yeah, I was, I was very much like sitting at home between, you know, reading, reading and seeing headlines, seeing, seeing everything going on with, you know, the, the, the shooting down of, of that, that warship, um, that, that marked a, a pretty, a pretty, uh, a pretty big victory on, on the Ukrainian side for, for defending, but also seeing, you know, all, all kinds of things like 900 bodies found at, at the border and, and just being yeah. like, shocked, horrified, mortified, but not surprised, like, because this is what war, the spoils of war is. And, and even when it's not one walked into willingly, it's one of defense over invasion. Um, it's, it's just seeing, seeing a lot of the same things. It, it triggered a lot of things for me. Um, and so just being really honored with being asked to come into the space today, I felt called, you know, to write something for today, just like I know Siri did, um, with, with her, her second piece. Um, so like also, Big, big ups to, to my hermana, um, who, who both, both her pieces really were moving to me. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you. you. It was probably, that's the longest poem written, I'm sure, on planet Earth, you know, about the crisis uh, in the Ukraine and uh, something, you know, very strong and beautiful and, yeah. and it just show compassion and care, as does yours, um, um, Siri. When did you write yours? What, 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 when did it, what was the moment you were sitting down 
So, uh, so the timeline is, is similar to Paul's in that um, oftentimes I spend a lot of time meditating. So I've been meditating on this idea uh, since, you know, we were first um, asked to participate. And then I think the writing really started between yesterday and today. Um, I was also working like a dog <laughs> right up until the, the spring recess. So, um, you know, so sometimes the poems sort of get written up here, up here, up here until I can sit down and play with words. And and um, I really wanted to make sure that I uh, share that it was in a draft stage because um, certainly I believe that that the work itself has a lot more growing to do. Um, and there's just a lot of complexity in talking about, you know, war and the effects of war that can't always be um, sort of like really, really visited in a first draft. Um, you know, but I think for me, it's just sort of like, thinking about my seat in the world as being a, in, you know, within a seat of privilege and how I get to sort of look upon. And so that's really what I've been thinking about and marinating on in terms of, you know, just who am I in, in, in the world and, and what does it mean to, to speak on these issues when I'm not on the front lines myself? Um, I mean, I'm really, ex you know, looking forward to survivor tales um, and seeing what folks, what, what kind of art gets generated from the folks who are experiencing this firsthand. But, um, but I hope that, you know, my, my hope for the piece was for it to generate conversation about how we wrestle with, um, these experiences when we're not physically in them. Yeah, I think you said resistance from a distance, right? Uh, um, which is a beautiful um, um, way. And it is actually also possible or supporting it or, um, you know, having it um, um, on on the mind. And I'm sure um, whoever listened to it, you know, if there are Ukrainians listening still, um, it is very meaningful. They might see it, um, later on that there are fellow poets or, you know, people really, um, took time, the energy and thought, and that they showed compassion and, um, in a way, a joyful, as the Buddha sometimes say, a joyful participation in the sorrows and uh, uh, and catastrophes of life. Um, and I think this is of uh, real importance. And Kimberly did say that, you know, that uh, you know we need this engagement where we we also um, put our life mask on, like in an airplane, you know, before. Uh, we go to, I think this is a very beautiful and, and, and strong contribution. And I think it's also important for the world to know and everybody you know, that the New Rican Poets Cafe, the history of the spoken word um, is, is something significant, it's something important. It has something to say and in a way follows, you know, the traditions actually of the bards, you know, the Asian ones for over centuries or thousands of years. You know, had put together long oral poems, which they recited often also in competition. And um, so you are very close um, to that, that spirit. Um, we can't believe it how fast that went. And we already at our seven o'clock PM. So maybe we can have uh, our friends from La Mama with us stay for a second with us to say, so you guys can say um, hello. And, um, and I see um, the names uh, here uh, coming up from Adam and Martin, Sophia, Marina, Verlana, Vanda. And um, here are your, your colleagues from the New Rican Poets Cafe. And um, yeah, here with this Adam and, uh, um, and, and everyone. So we are really, Paul and, uh, and JF Siri, thank you so much for joining, really, for taking the time. And it's a big uh, honor that you both took the time to write a poem for us, a spoken word, uh, 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 utterings, you know, that normally we, we see it on the stage. Poetry needs to be spoken alive. We need to hear it. I think we did hear it. We didn't see it, but we, we heard it. It does exist on a paper. It's true, but it really exists when we hear it and the rhythm and the speaking of it. So this is really very beautiful and a great contribution. Thank you both. And, um, and we go on to our next segment to La Mama and um, Yara Arts Group, um, which we put in two sections, but in the big way, they are so strongly connected and um, and I would like to welcome um, all of you. And but uh, perhaps first of all, uh, Verlana, um, thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, can you? Can everyone hear me? Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you Perfect. for inviting uh, us. Thank you. Will Mia join us? Do you know? Will she? Uh, she uh, will on tape. We have a couple of tapes. Partly yes. we tape 
people in Ukraine and uh, because of the connections and also Mia of course. will be with us. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about, about you. Who are you okay. and how, what's your connection to La Mama? Um, I am a direct, I direct the Yara Arts Group, a resident company at La Mama. And today we're gonna be um, uh, speaking with the rest of New York theater artists about the bombing in Mariupol theater in Ukraine by Russian forces. And uh, we'll hear from Mia Yu and Nikki Parizo, as well as our current resident artists uh, at La Mama today. And then I'll describe our relationship to Ukrainian um, uh, community and artists. And we'll hear from Maria Kutnyakova, who worked at the Mariupol Theater's community, and Valdemar Klusko, who created uh, performance projects in the Mariupol um, port area. Um, and in the second half, uh, Maria will describe her experiences as she was sheltering in the theater of Mariupol during the bombing. And finally, uh, Yara artists will read poems by Serhi Jadan from Kharkiv. And um, some of our participants will be speaking in Ukraine and I'll be translating then or making sort of transitional comments. The wonderful, really, really thank you all for, for putting this together, this complex program that perhaps re helps to reflect the reality and the many angles, you know, of that, that situation that is uh, so, so, um, so unimaginable in a way for us here, but it makes it a bit more real. La Mama, of course, is one of the great institutions in New York, founded by Ellen Stewart um, in the 50s. Uh, it was one of the first places to give voice also to global uh, uh, theater artists, I think, before her, perhaps Asia Society had some uh, probably others, but La Mama was the one that opened the door and we need to have a door always open as Bob Wilson said today, uh, quoting the Bible and, um, and I think La Mama is, is such a door. And, um, but I give it now on to you, Velana, guide us through the session and, um, and we will listen to you. you. And I ask everybody to very, very carefully listen. This is as close as it's good. Velana herself is from the Ukraine, if I understand right. And, um, and so we will really, really learn something and these artists will share something that is of significance and importance. Okay, and I thought I'd start off with uh, a greeting in Ukrainian to our Ukrainian audiences. And a dobry den, ja virlana tkacz, hudožny kierownik jara mesteczko i grupy eksperymentalno teatru le mama i kino chodice w ukrinski dzielnicy New Yorku. My dołączymy się do akcji New Yorkskich Teatrów na Pietrymku Ukrainy. And now, Mia and Nikki from La Mama. Hello, my name is Mia Yu. I'm Nikki Parizo. And we're here at La Mama in support of the artistic community and beyond in Ukraine through the power of art. La Mama has invited resident artists Adham Hafez and Sofia Guchinov from its 60th season to read poetry and texts in solidarity with Ukraine. We are so honored to be a part of this event. We thank Frank and the Martin Siegel Center, and we are proud to be here with our resident company, Yara Arts, who will be connecting with artists working out of Mariupol. My Ukrainian know you. Slava Ukraine. Mez Ukraine, Slava Ukraine. And now La Mama's current resident artist, Adam Hafez, will join us from Egypt. Hello, everyone, and thank you, everybody, for this evening. I'm very moved and touched to be invited to speak this evening. What's been happening in the Ukraine is heartbreaking. And every time I look at the news, I just don't know what to do and I feel helpless. But I also keep thinking that every life matters and every loss deserves mourning. And that mourning has become a privilege in today's world. And as we're gathered here today, and as I'm saddened and heartbroken over what's happening in the Ukraine, I must also highlight what's happening in other places in the world, particularly in Palestine, as it is under attack the past 24 hours with over 150 people 
injured, where the Aqsa Mosque, one of the holiest buildings in the world, has been under attack with people just praying, people in a temple praying and being killed. And this made me feel like I should read a poem from the late Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish, speaking of homelessness, the disgrace of war, the silence of complicity and the loss of land. And the poem is called The Passport. They don't recognize me in the shadows that suck my color in this passport. To them, my wound is a showroom for a tourist who passionately collects pictures. They don't recognize me. They don't leave the palm of my hand without a sun because the trees know me. The spinning mills of rain know me. Don't leave me mummified like the moon. The birds follow the palm of my hand to the distant airport and all the wheat fields, all the prisons, all the pale sepulchers, all the barbed boundaries, all the weaving handkerchiefs, all the dark eyes, all the eyes are with me. But the masters drop them from the passport. Is it my name that brings this honor? Or is it my love for the land I raised in my hands? Today, Job cries, the skies fill. Don't make me a lesson twice. True masters, true masters, honorable prophets, don't ask the trees about their names. Don't ask the wadis about their mothers. From my forehead gushes the sword of light. And from my fingers flow rivers. The heart of every man is my nationality. So rid me of this passport. The heart of every man is my nationality. So rid me of this passport. Thank you. And I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, and now uh, another um, resident artist uh, at La Mama, Sofia Guchinova, will join us. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be here. And also, um, I don't want to say happy, but I'm I think it's a great thing that we're all coming together as people in the theater um, in America and around the world and in New York um, to bring awareness and in solidarity with the current situation and all the current situations in the whole world, like my other resident artist, fellow artist said. Um, this is a Ukrainian poet who is currently a refugee now um, with a newborn baby, um, because a lot of things that are happening right now, the women and children are being separated from the fathers, which is, um, you know, heartbreaking. And her name is Katerina Bobkina. And this first poem I'm going to read too. The first one is called Give Me a Brother. Give me a brother who can protect me, who can be there every time I need him, the woman begs. But the earth is silent. In the garden, the golden shoots grow lush, but each fruit hangs down ominously on its long stem like a stone. Give me shelter from peering lascivious eyes so no strange unwanted hand ever reaches me. Hide me in the radiance and reflection of your blue depths, the woman says but the river quietly flows by. No, the river can't hide her while she's still alive. The woman looks at the sky and says, upend it all. Now fall follows summer before winter comes. There's a time for roses and a time for bitter wormwood, a place for every beast and every weed and grass. Only I have no place of my own. And the sky answers, Make it yourself. You're on your own now. On your own now. Thank you. And the next poem is Untitled. 
Don't ask me how I am. Ask me something simple. Look how quickly my hair grows now. It seems to have its own special goal. When all this is over, I'll braid it around you. Don't tell me how you are. Tell me something easier. Because here, even the smallest stone has turned into a weapon to defend its own in this war. Don't tell me how this can be true because this is all we have now, these stones. When the bell rings in warning and the shock wave takes your breath away, even the dead rise up from the ground to defend the living. Oh, how they wail with longing, those sirens in the night. Don't try to say it because there is no word to describe it. There is no time, no place, no dimension, no sphere. It all simply happens here and now in markets, schoolyards, suburban buildings. After all this, what can cure us? Maybe it's love. Love can bind together the ripped edges of the wounds it can feed the powerful rivers and streams. It can wash away the abuse, properly mourn all the spilt blood. But until all this is over, don't talk to me of love. Till the pale light of early dawn replaces the flashes of dark night. Better, don't say anything to me at all. Just rest. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for reading the Katerina's poem, which Juan de Phipps translated with me. And Katerina lived in Kiev, as you know, and um, is now a refugee. Uh, these are poems she wrote several days ago. Um, and I wanted now to talk a little bit about um, Ellen Stewart and her relationship with well, uh, the Ukrainian community because the La Mama of La Mama, uh, Ellen, started theater on East 9th Street in the very heart of Ukrainian community and because a Ukrainian landlord was willing to rent a basement space to her, an African-American in 1961. She started Cafe La Mama and became the founder of American uh, Experimental Theater. Uh, La Mama's second home was on 2nd Avenue and then Ellen acquired 74 East 4th Street, La Mama's main building, which is now being renovated. And in the early 70s, uh, Ellen put the roof on 66 East 4th Street and turned it into the amazing annex, which is now called the Ellen Stewart Theater. And I came to La Mama in 1982 with Amir Baraka's Money, a jazz opera and worked there with many wonderful directors, George Ferens, Wilford Leach, and Ping Chang. I directed workshops and performances by Native American artists and Polish artists. And one day I met Ellen Stewart in front of St. Mark's Church, and she asked me what I really wanted to do. And to my own surprise, I said, Ukrainian theater, Ukrainian poetry. Finally, she said, uh, and pulled out her little composition notebook we all knew with the La Mama dates in it. And she said, what's the name of your show? And I said, A Light from the East, right off the top of my head. Actually, there was no show. I hadn't thought about it a minute before that. But now we had a date, March 1990, and all my projects started to come together. We made a piece about ourselves and... Um, Lesh Kurbas, a Ukrainian theater director from the 20s. And um, we called it a docu-dream because we made it from history and diaries and poetry um, that Wanda Phipps and I translated from Ukrainian. We became Yara Arts Group. And Yara performed uh, Light from the East at La Mama and we received an invitation to go to bring it to Ukraine. And Ellen urged me to go and I'd never been. And I decided to take a look first. It was December, 1990, very dark times in Soviet Ukraine. I hated it quite frankly. And when I, until I met one of the 
old actors who had worked with Corbus in the 20s. And it was just like a cosmic moment for me. I started seeing around me the dream, their dream of creating a new world and a new stage. And I decided to make In the Light a bilingual uh, project by including young actors. Uh, Ukrainian actors in the project. And we returned in August 91. Ellen Stewart joined us for the opening in Kiev at the National Theater. And that week, right on our opening, the Soviet Union collapsed and Ukraine declared independence. Uh, in 93, Ellen came to open a, a huge international festival in Kharkiv. Um, with us. And in 94, we worked with the Lviv Kurbas Theater and brought them then to La Mama and we did a joint production. And every year after that, we'd create a new show at La Mama and Ellen would always ring her bell and say that La Mama was the home of Ukrainian theater in New York. And now I'd like to introduce you all to somebody very special, Maria Kutnyakova or Maria from Mariupol, as she likes to call herself. And she'll tell you about her city and its theater and cultural life before all this. I am Maria from Mariupol. And I want to tell you about uh, central life in my native city. So uh, the Mariupol drama Cetra the building that was destroyed by Russians. It was like almost 70 years history and a long, long time. It was the only theater in Mariupol. But after the um, war uh, that uh, started eight years ago, when Russia occupied Donetsk and Lugansk, the um, uh, art people in Mariupol, they started to do another citrus, uh, um, independent citrus and amateur citrus. And uh, in uh, last year, we have in Mariupol almost 10 citrus, children's citrus uh, with some uh, kids stories and uh, young people citrus, they doing uh, plays, uh, some art stuff, uh, some performances uh, uh, and uh, cetera for age people. And it was very different content. It was uh, Ukrainian content. Uh, so uh, like uh, performances about Ukrainian history, about Ukrainian literature and, and others. And also it was like content uh, by foreign um, authors and, and others. So the Mariupol cultural life was very different but very beautiful. So like every week you could choose uh, where you can go. You can watch one play, another play, you can go for the performances. Uh, I was, my hobby was actress in Cetra, Cetra Mania, and we're doing a very different uh, um, projects, uh, also projects with foreign uh, directors, actors. Uh, we have a project with uh, Dortmund Theatre, uh, the theatre called Kulturbrigaden, uh, and we're doing in uh, pandemia when was COVID, we're doing an uh, online performance. Uh, the Dortmund children was in Dortmund and uh, Ukrainian children in Mariupol was in Mariupol, and we're doing uh, Romeo and Juliet play and we call it it's like uh, uh, like online game about Romeo and Juliet also we have uh, in Mariupol very big uh, theater and art uh, um, festivals Google Fest, IT stage and another it was very big it was like a, a week uh, with like a few uh, Citrus from the all Ukraine, from the Lviv, Kharkiv, Kiev, Dnieper, and another, they came to the Mariupol and show us their uh, projects. And Mariupol actors go to the another uh, cities and show our stories. So um, 
you know, if you like Citra, if you like some art, if you want to see some uh, new art in Marupol, you could choose in where you could go. It's very um, beautiful stories. Also, we have a few very interesting um, components, you know, the building of Marupol Drama Citra was built 70 years ago, but on this place before was the church that communist uh, was, uh, they destroyed the church and on this place they built in the theater. Uh, so it's very special place for our city, you understand? So it's been like really a, like theater church now in Marupol and now it's also destroyed like the same people. So Russian destroyed church and years ago they destroyed uh, Cetra. Um, and also I want to tell you that uh, have a lot of cultural organizations like uh, Palace of Culture, like Philharmony and um, after the was it uh, started eight years ago our cultural life was very you know like really life really and we have a new cultural organization not only the citra we have like uh, 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 contemporary art centers for the painters uh, for the musicians not only actors directors so we have like a new art life in Marupol uh, last few years. So it was like, you know, like, um, I don't know, we have like our cu cultural life in Marupol was like heart, like was <laughs> And I hope that uh, after the war, we could rebuild it. Um, Mariupol is in Eastern Ukraine. It is a port on the Azov Sea. It has an ancient settlement from the Bronze Age, a fascinating history and a diverse population that included a large Greek community. It had a theater in the 19th century where Russian and Ukrainian troops performed. About uh, history of our theater. So in Mariupol, like 100 years ago was very unique uh, situation. We have, uh, Greek theater. In Mariupol uh, lives a lot of uh, Greeks and they have the native language, native culture, and uh, um, they want to uh, build their own theater. Uh, this theater work in a few years, but then uh, communism, um, USSR, totalitarianism destroyed, all people was uh, uh, going to jail or kill it by uh, communist people and this theater was uh, destroyed but uh, it's unique situation uh, in ukraine greek theater they do like greek performances on greek language so it's very i think interesting um, fact about Mariupol. also uh, theater history started in Mariupol like uh, almost uh, uh, 150 years ago in uh, when Mariupol was in Russian Empire. We have uh, Cetra and uh, it was uh, Russian Cetra as because uh, you know in Russian Empire you couldn't do like Ukraine and Cetra or, uh, Cetra or some, something else. So it was Russia Cetra um, and so um, our like drama theater in Mariupol, uh, always uh, telling people that we have like 150 history because it was like the one way of theater life in Mariupol. Also, I want to tell you a story that we have very big factory, metallurgical factory, Azovstal, and people who work on this factory, they also doing a theater. So they uh, like, one day uh, they doing some metal uh, metallurgy stuff in, on the factory but another day they go into the uh, independent amateur theater and uh, uh, playing like actors directors uh, and another and this uh, theater call it uh, narodny teater zavoda azovstal 
like theatre of uh, factory Azovstal. And you know, now the Azovstal is the center of uh, Ukrainian army, still in uh, Mariupol, they fighting with Russia army. And I think it's very interesting that the people who working on the factory, they also want to do some art stuff, you know, and also Valdemar Klusko has designed Yara shows since 2011 and worked on several performance and art projects in Mariupol. In In 2019 we opera ballet. I was working on Фізично <смеш> вирішував всі питання, і ми створили балет. Балет був спортових кранів. Я керував якраз рухом цих кранів. У нас був ще музичний супровід цього якби, перформансу. Цей перформанс є записаний. Він існує на на інтернет порталі Open Theater. This ballet of cranes was part of Gogol's Fest large opera project on the dry dock in the port. Valdemar describes how the dock is lowered, the ship comes in, and then the dock is lifted above the water, and how these movements were used in the opera Nero. І на заводі ми робили ще оперу. В опері опера відбувалася в сухому доці. Це місце, де ремонтують кораблі. Ну тобто, це док, який спускається в воду, за в його в нього за, 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 запливає корабель, потім він спливає і проводить ремонтні роботи. Під час якраз цієї опери на ремонті стояв, стояло судно морське і. Відбувалася опера, у нас було актори місцеві, у нас були актори з Києва, у нас були технічні навантажувачі, які танцювали з ритмом, я ними якраз теж керував. І в кінці весь цей док разом з глядачами затоплювався і в нього заходила вода. Це був надзвичайний, надзвичайна подія не тільки для Маріуполя, я думаю, що взагалі для українського театру і перформансу, і фестивалю, як такого, це най такий най найпотужніший проєкт, який ми могли зробити. І з того, що я останні новини чув, мені директор заводу прислав повідомлення з, з відео, на якому видно, що на заводі є вогонь. Там якби дим іде, щось горить, і док, в якому якраз відбувалася ця опера, він затоплений. Тобто він зараз на дні лежить Азовського моря. The opera in the dock was the first for Mariupol, and certainly a wonderful show. But recently the director of the dock sent um, Valdemar a video from Mariupol showing the dock on fire and saying that the dock itself is on the bottom of the sea. Uh, the other project that uh, Valdemar did was uh, uh, included pinhole photography in Mariupol. One of the projects, they used a trolley as a camera. The people had to stay stand still for 34 minutes as they took a picture of the main square in front of the theater. And this is the famous theater that was bombed. Про те, щоб тролейбус фотоапарат ми робили в 2018 mm -hmm. році, так в нас він стояв якраз на театральній площі, якраз біля театру, і весь, весь все місто його бачило, дуже багато було відвідувачів цієї локації. І ми на день, міжнародний день пінхол фотографії, який відмічають по всьому світу, ми якраз зробили зйомку. І 
в нас є фотографія, зроблена реально тролейбусом, негатив і позитив, і витримка цієї, цього знімку була 34 хвилини, тобто люди стояли, не рухались 34 хвилини, і видно трошки театр на цій, на цій фотографії. Okay. Um, so we will hear about Maria's war experiences in the Yara segment, which comes next right now. Um, and uh, I, uh, we have a ritual that starts each, each of our shows always. We always say welcome to La a Yara arts group dedicated to the theater and all the poetry, music, and images that inspire it. And today, Yara is not at La Mama, but in virtual space. So, Vitaemo, Ms. Ukraina, you. And Yara has worked with um, Ukrainian poets uh, since its founding in 1990 at La Mama. And we have worked with Siddhi Jadan since 2005 on a show about winter rituals and the protests of Maidan. In 2013, we worked with him in Donetsk on a piece of history about the history of the city, which the following spring became um, about the war in Donetsk and in Ukraine. And now this war has intensified and Mariupol is the center of the struggle today. We continue now with Maria from Mariupol, who spoke with us earlier and um, in the Lamama section about the cultural life of Mariupol. And now uh, we'll hear about the war, how it came to Mariupol and what she saw and personally experienced. So I was um, 22 days in Mariupol after the war started. I didn't want to go away from my native city. I believe in the Ukrainian army. I couldn't imagine that Russians are so crazy. They bombed us from the airplanes and artillery. They destroyed every building. The bomb came to my house, my apartment. I didn't get how I still alive because my neighbors, they died. And to me, my mom and my sister and my cat, uh, we are now okay in physical way. And uh, they destroyed Russians, all the co communication in Mariupol. They destroyed lighting, like water, gas. Uh, uh, we have no mobile connection. And, you know, it's very cold uh, weather in March in Mariupol. So we, we, were, we was in cold. They bombed us every hour, like tuff, 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 tuff. You couldn't go away on the street. You sitting on the shelter or like me, we sitting on the corridor. We didn't see what what's happening in our city. We understand that everything is destroyed. We saw dead bodies on the street and uh, we didn't understand because we have no information how we could save. And um, we know that in Sietre is uh, uh, like uh, center versions of refugee center refugee center, center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we know that in the drama center in the building is a refuge center for people who didn't have house after the bomb came to their houses and we decided that we should go to the Cetra because we have no food, no water. And uh, on our street, it's like uh, street fighting. Uh, so we saw the tanks, we saw the snipers, and we understand that uh, we should go away from our house. And when we get on the street, we saw that house uh, near us uh, on fire. And I didn't recognize my native city because everything was destroyed. Like on my street, every house was all 
on fire or uh, bombed uh, and uh, some parts was uh, destroyed. And uh, we ran in, we saw Russian tanks uh, with Z and we was very afraid about our life. And we ran into the theater and we hope that now we, we are in safe place. But on that day, a few hours later, Russians destroyed it by bombs from the plane. And I didn't know how and the second time my family is like okay after that because we have like second bomb on our you know roof and we run into the philharmonic we have an item philharmonic and the russian trying to destroy it philharmonic by the artillery but the building is still standing and we understand that Russians, they didn't fight with uh, Ukrainian army. They want to kill every citizen, every Ukrainian in the city. So they bombed like kindergartens, hospitals, uh, like theaters, everything. Like, you know, my uh, my uh, apartment, we didn't uh, have like any arm, army people near us they just destroyed I, I really don't understand why they do this want to help us but everything that they've done they want to kill us i really don't understand and uh, in march 17 we decided to go away from Marupol by walk and we go to the little um, village near the Marupol, uh, Milekina. It's on the uh, Azov Sea. And uh, we go fr from the fields, you know, and we saw Russian soldiers and they said like, Ukrainians bombed Marupol. And we said, and we was like, what? Like, you're craziness, and we go to the Malekina, and Malekina was also occupied by Russians. There are no food, no uh, communications, no um, like gas for the cars. So we live in Malekina for days. Then we go to the another village Yalta, and after Yalta we go to the Berdansk. This is also occupied by Russians. This is the city near the Marupol but it wasn't destroyed so much like Mariupol. We live in the sports center in Berdansk for four days. We also ha ha hasn't food. Uh, we was very hungry and we was very, you know, not good uh, health. And then we have evacuation buses from the Ukrainian government, uh, buses to the Zaporizhia. Zaporizhia, this is Ukrainian territory. And uh, from Berdyansk to Zaporizhia, uh, road is 100 kilometers, but Russians, they want uh, to stop buses like every few kilometers. And the, our road from Berdyansk to Zaporizhia was 18 hours, 100 kilometers. Eight hours. We slept in the buses. Uh, um, uh, we not only my family was evacuated. It was three thousand people in fifty-six buses. But Russians stopped every buses. They um, watch our um, some clothes. Uh, they talking with us and we have very long way to Zaporizhia. So um, when I go away from Marupol, uh, I need nine days to get to Ukrainian territory. Uh, so it was very long um, way. And I was very disappointed about everything what Russian do. And I, I was like, understand that I'm very lucky because I can get away from the Marupol, but I have relatives in, still in Marupol. We have no connection. I didn't understand their life or not. I, I watch news from the Marupol like every hour and I understand that they still bombed Marupol. There's still no food in Mariupol. Uh, the 75% per 
territory of Mariupol occupied, but 25% territory of Mariupol is still Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainian army is still in Mariupol, they're fighting with Russians, and this 25% of territory still bombed. People who live on this uh, territory, they died or they live in the shelters and they still haven't food, haven't water, having some medical help. So like now in Mariupol, more than 100,000 people still in Mariupol. And you understand, you all watch, uh, you all see the photos from the Bucha, from the Erpin, Gastomil, that uh, territories that Russians occupied, they started to do very crazy things. They started to kill people, to um, raped women and children. And I understand that every citizen in Mariupol in danger, because, uh, you know, Russian soldiers could, could kill you. Russian artillery could kill you. Uh, Russians planes and uh, another staff could kill you. So I really hope that Ukrainian army could save Mariupol and all the Russians go away from my city, my country, to the Russia Federation and do it what they want in Russia Federation, not in Ukraine. Ukraine is an independent country and, uh, you know, Russia started the war and we didn't do anything bad. So Putin is a new Hitler and all the world could help us. Um, as I mentioned, Yara worked with Sidhi Jadan, the major poet in Ukraine, and we worked with him in 1913 in Donetsk on a piece about the history of the city. In the following spring, um, the city was invaded by Russians and our piece hitting bedrock transformed into a show about the Russian war on Ukraine. The war in Donetsk was brutal. There are 2 million refugees from this area in other parts of Ukraine in just a very short time. And Wanda Phipps and I uh, translated Zidane's poetry, including this one, with uh, this poem, which will be read by Marina Salander, who appeared in the piece at La Mama. Thank you so much, Rolana. And uh, it was, uh, um, it was translated by Rolana and Wanda uh, beautifully. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm still reeling from um, hearing about uh, Maria's um, experiences. And so I'm just gonna breathe for a moment. Take only what is most important. Take the letters. Take only what you can carry. Take the icon and the embroidery. Take the silver. Take the wooden crucifix and the golden replicas. Take some bread, the vegetables from the garden, then leave. We will never return again. We will never see our city again. Take the letters, all of them. Every last piece of bad news. We will never see our corner store again. We will never drink from that dry well again. We will never see familiar faces again. We are refugees. We'll run all night. We will run past fields of sunflowers. We will run from dogs, rest with cows. We'll scoop up water with our bare hands, sit waiting in camps, annoying the dragons of war. You will not return and friends will never come back. There will be no smoky kitchens. No usual job. There will be no dreamy life in sleepy towns. 
No green valleys, no suburban wasteland. The sun will be a smudge on the window of a cheap train rushing past color pits covered with lime. There will be blood on women's heels, tired guards on borderlands covered with snow, a postman with empty bags shut down, a priest with a hapless smile hung by his ribs. A quiet of a cemetery. The noise of a command post. An unedited list of the dead. So long that there won't be enough time to check them for your own name. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Um, Wanda and I just heard uh, the news from Kharkiv today where Jadon is living, um, that it's under heavy, heavy bombardment. And now we're gonna ask Wanda Phipps who translates with me uh, to read several more poems by Siddhisha Don. Thank you, Verlana. Um, first, I'd like to read Headphones. And this was published in the New York Times last year. Headphones. Sasha a quiet drunk, an esoteric, a poet, spent the entire summer in the city. When the shooting began, he was surprised, started watching the news, then stopped. He walks around the city with headsets on, listening to golden oldies as he stumbles into burnt out cars, blown up bodies, what will survive from the history of the world in which we lived will be the words and music of a few geniuses who desperately tried to warn us, tried to explain, but failed to explain anything or save anyone. These geniuses lie in cemeteries and out of their rib cages grow flowers and grass, nothing else will remain. Only their music and songs, a voice that forces you to love. You can choose to never turn off this music, listen to the cosmos, shut your eyes, think about whales in the ocean at night, hear nothing else see nothing else, feel nothing else, except, of course, for the smell, the smell of corpses. And this next poem is called, It's All Up to Us. And Sari Jadon is also known for his love poems. And this is one of them. It's all up to us. It's all up to us. You touch the atmosphere and disturb the equilibrium. Everything we've lost, everything we found, all the air that passed through our windpipes. What sense does it all make without our pain and disappointments? What value does it have without our joy? After all, it's all about your fingers. You touch her clothes and you know nothing can be taken back. A name spoken once changes the voice, coils around the roots of words. So you struggle from now on with dead languages as you attempt to use them to communicate with the living. You touch her things and understand behind each word, behind each deed stands the impossibility of return. Courage and sorrow push us forward. Love 
is re irreversible and we can't decipher most dark prophecies and visions. What happens to us is only what we wanted or only what we feared. The question is, what will win, desire or fear? The night will ring with music in the web of our fingers. The room will fill with light from the dictionaries we've brought. After all, everything depends on our ability to speak the dead language of tenderness. Light is shaped by darkness and it's all up to us. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you for all the work and for this amazing reading. Thank you. We, Wanda and I are now working with Sidhi on a new show, a jazz musical opera about Kharkiv. In Kharkiv, we started last November. We had a workshop and we created the first two acts and uh, we were supposed to do act three in March, uh, but then the war came to Kharkiv and we hope to open the show at La Mama in February in 2023. And that said he will be with us at opening night at La Mama. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Siegel Center. Wow. <clears throat> Listen, what an, uh, what an impressive, impressive and strong program. We still have a couple um, of minutes um, uh, left. One can feel the, the heartache, you know, and uh, especially of you and of course of everybody. Um, and I think the testimony, uh, you know, it was just heartbreaking to listen to, right? The young uh, actress, uh, and what, what she shared, and it makes it really, I think, so very, very, um, very real. Uh, it will be hard for Mariupol to come back, right? As a city, it looks like this is a, a true devastation. It will have to be a new city built by the people who want to return to it. So basically everybody, except for the 25%, she talked about people have left. Uh, there's nobody there. Uh, well, things are burning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there's still many people who need to be evacuated, you know, uh, but there was a small part that was still being controlled. Because we recorded the, some of this yesterday because she couldn't, this is when we could do it with her. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of just uh, connections where she was, she was in between places, so. Yeah, incredible, what a, what a, what a moment in time. Also you, you captured there, you know, and, um, and there's an eyewitness um, report. Um, and the poet is Sadan. He he uh, is now in a city that is bombarded too. You said he said today it's really been. This is what we heard today from Ukraine because we spoke with Voldemort just about ten minutes before we went on. Uh, and that was the artist who was showing us his projects in, in Mariupol, mm -hmm. and he said that he just heard that they were bombing Kharkiv. And every morning, you know, whenever Zidane posts, he likes to write on Facebook because he's been really sort of trying to gather the spirits of Kharkiv and to keep the musicians and artists together and working to sort of preserve the city there because it's a very special city for, for Ukraine uh, of musicians and artists and, and people who are committed to this. And uh, he posts a lot every day. And every time I see a post in the morning, I feel so much better because yeah. it's just another day. Yeah, yeah, you you yeah. worry you worry about him. This is uh, this is clear, and um, um, one can only imagine really um, how this time um, has been for you and will be um, um, for you. We spoke today with the Magi Theater that said, you know, we understood from our community, and they spoke about about violence against the Asian um, American community. They said, no, right now it's really time for us to take care of our community. Maybe we have to do less theater, or theater is not what people need most. What what do you think? What do what do the theater artists need? The ones you know in Mariupol, how could they be helped? What would be, what is helpful? Well, I think, first of all, they all want to talk about what's going on, I think you know, mm -hmm. and get that news out. 
And I think it's important to include other people in, in the projects of talking about all this. So it's not just all of us talking to all of us mm -hmm. necessarily. Uh, so we're sort of almost feeling the other way, you know, kind of we want to reach out to the world to talk about all of this. And uh, in terms of my, one of our first pieces, Ralph Pena was in it, uh, and it was a piece oh, yeah. about Chernobyl. <laughs> and I think that is kind of always been what I felt very strongly that it's important to, to open our community to the world because our community has been so closed, you know? And to really, I so appreciate how much Wanda's put into all the translation efforts to sort of really, for us to be able to talk to the rest of the world. And through the voices of people like Marina and Sophia and Adam and everyone uh, here today, but also our very diverse company of actors because I think it's very important for diverse voices to voice these ideas and because they become then international, they speak to the world then, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, Sophia, also really thank you um, um, for being there. Do you feel that your stay at La Mama is kind of overshadowed by that or do you think it's a challenge or it's there's something that one just have to deal with or do you feel this is taking away something? Um, I think as an artist, we exist to show what's going on in the world. And it's really hard to like when people ask me or ask artists in general, is our art political? I don't think art exists without the world around it and what's going on. Like you can't like whatever you make, whether that's film, dance, visual performance, art, whatever it is, theater it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists because of what's going on in the world, whether you're even aware of it or not. So, um, you know, the world is going to happen no matter what's going on in any individual artist's life. And um, as the current, one of the current resident artists, um, I can't control what's going on in the world. I can only control what I'm doing with it and like the activism and the art I'm creating. And um I, of course, like many of us want world peace and I'm choosing to be a part of what's going on to help others, especially like, you know, it's an honor that we are here safe in the United States right now and that we're not dealing with a war on our own front and yeah. that the theater artists there are dealing with devastation and their whole life has changed. You know, we're pretty removed from it and it's, it's hard to even imagine what, what they're going through but it's important to give them voices and talk to them and, and, you know, let them know how we can help them as fellow artists. Like this is what's going on in your life. Okay. Tell me, what can I do to be of service for you to get your story out there? Cause journalism, you know, we don't know what's actually being reported. We can only speak to the people who are there and the power that we even have this connection through the theaters being connected is, is amazing that we can bring their voices. Cause you know, they're not worried about putting on a play right now. They're worried about surviving and not being hit by a bomb. And we have the privilege to be able to give them the voice through ourselves as a vessel. So, um, you know, whatever's going on in the world is going to happen. And I'm honored to be here and just, you know, make my art no matter what it's going to be to help everybody in the process. So, well, yeah, thank you so, so much. This was a great contribution. Uh, thank you, Velana, for, for putting this together. I can only imagine how much time and work went into that wonder for translating. We are already uh, segueing into our next session. I see that some of the North Theater uh, collaborators are there. So join us, come in and uh, say hello to the YAR Arts Group. But I think it was a very powerful, I think, a testimony and especially to hear, you know, from basically what happened yesterday or the day before uh, on the ground from someone who was in the Mariupol theater is just, uh, it's heartbreaking, I have to say. And this a young, young voice, this young face, this young woman, you know, what she had to go through and we don't know what she will have to go through. So it is a, it is a shocking and it's really a crime against humanity and uh, not just against a, a, a nation and whoever would commit such a crime, whoever bombs a theater, where people are seeking refuge to this is a, this is a criminal act and uh, has and should be prosecuted. So thank you, 
um, ERR arts groups. Thank you, Lamama, and it's wonderful to hear you know how deeply Ukrainian culture actually has been connected also to Lamama. That the first space rented was by a Ukrainian landlord that that uh, Ellen you know gave voice to a Ukrainian. Uh, a theater in the New York City. And so this is a, a long-standing tradition and we're learning actually so, so much about, uh, about that. So thank you all and welcome now uh, the, the Noor Theater and I see Kate and Bazid, if I say that, um, uh, say that right. And, um, and let's go on to our uh, next uh, session and see what uh, the North Theater, what's on their mind. Uh, often, you know, the catastrophe is often they are the ones who are on the center of it or a bit more uh, than normal. And now things are kind of shifting, but they are there, they are standing up also. And we love to, to hear from them. So Kay, tell us a little bit about you and also about your theater. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Kate. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, calling in um, from Lenape land here on Manhattan. Um, and I'm the artistic producer of Noor Theater. Um, we are a theater that supports, develops, and produce the work by uh, the work of artists of Middle Eastern and North African descent, um, also known as Southwest Asian and, and North African descent. Um, and um, we're here because we we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine, um, we uh, with those impacted and displaced by conflict, war, and occupation uh, throughout the world. Um, and we're really grateful to join um, our our colleagues here today. Um, and uh, today we're we're going to share a couple offerings um, from from some artists. Um, first, uh, we'll be sharing uh, um, some poetry and a video offering from uh, one of our artists, Noel Gosseni. And following that, um, Bazid, who's here with me on the screen, um, will be will be sharing some poems um, by Palestinian poets as well as some of their own work. Um, Bazid, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm I'm happy to be here with um, all of you. Um, and I um, I don't know what to say by way of introduction. I'm a um, I'm a poet and a prose writer and a playwright. Um, I'm an Egyptian uh, immigrant slash settler to Turtle Island, um, and um, wish the occasion were different. But happy to be in this room with you all. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, so I will. I'd like to start by sharing. Um, Noel has um, has shared a few um, words about her piece that she'd like me to to share uh, before uh, before we watch that. So I'll I'll go ahead and read those, um, and then and then we'll jump mm -hmm. into her piece. Um, so Noel says, "How do we cope in moments of atrocity, from Ukraine to Palestine and beyond?" How do we stand together as humans, as resilient, vulnerable, and magical spirits amidst unimag unimaginable violence? Violence that sends waves of trauma into the depths of our bones and across time and space, with repercussions for generations to come. I do not have answers. Yet the wisdom of my heart tells me that our creative voices can help heal wounds, help us reimagine new worlds, beautiful possibilities, and reconnect us with our heart and our humanity amidst so much unimaginable loss and pain. And so the video I'm sharing tonight turns to the creative voice, a reimagining of the words of the renowned Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish through the lens of my father and I as Lebanese people deeply invested in Palestinian liberation. We created this during the separation we encountered during the peak of COVID while my father was in treatment for throat cancer while I was dealing with a severe injury that led me to temporarily losing my ability to walk. And during the height of the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement in New York City and across the world. The process of creating this video helped us to embody the wisdom, vision, and courage of Darwish as we probe and imagine what liberation looks like. Darwish is a poet whose vision and words are spiritually transcendent, rooting us in the material world while expanding us into the mystical. I often turn to Darwish as a beacon of light, as a spiritual warrior, and as a poet of liberation, particularly when I encounter moments of darkness. 
And in watching this video tonight, Darwish's poem, In Jerusalem, becomes yet again devastatingly relevant amidst the violent attack of Israeli police raiding the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound yesterday as Palestinian worshippers gathered for morning prayer during the holy month of Ramadan. May Darwish's words and poetry serve grieving, resistance, healing, and openings connecting the struggles for freedom and dignity for the peoples of Palestine and Ukraine, and ultimately for the freedom and dignity of all beings everywhere. Um, again, those words are from mm -hmm. Noel Gosseini, um, the, the, the writer um, and, and artist whose video uh, I will play now. All right, so just one moment as I share my screen. أعني داخل السور القديم أسير من زمن إلى زمن بلا ذكرى تصوبني In Jerusalem, and I mean within the ancient walls, I walk from one epoch to another without a memory to guide me. The prophets over there are sharing the history of the holy, ascending to heaven and returning less discouraged and melancholy because love and peace are holy and are coming to town. Hi, Dad. Good morning, Noel. How's it going? Very good, very good. My voice is bad, but otherwise I'm good. Okay, good. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about, you know, how during quarantine, you and I have been um, sharing Darwish poetry. And when you recorded back to me in Arabic, after I sent you that poem in English, I was so moved by that. Um, and I guess I wanted to know a little bit more about uh, Darwish and what he means to you. You know, I was, I started to read Darwish in the mid, late 60s of a crop of Palestinian literary men, he stood out truly as the poet of the Palestinian resistance. I was walking down a slope and I was thinking to myself, how do the narrators disagree over what light said about a stone? Is it from a dimly lit stone that wars flare up? I walk in my sleep, I stare in my sleep, I see no one behind me, I see no one ahead of me. All of this light is for me. I walk, I become lighter, I fly, I become another, transfigured. Words sprout like grass from Isaiah's messenger mouth, if you don't believe, you won't be safe. And his poetry uh, was adopted by the armed resistance movement, especially by the um, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which had his uh, poems on their posters. As a person that witnessed what was being done to the Palestinians uh, in the Holy Land, and uh, even in the camps, in the Lebanese camps in Beirut, three, four miles from where I grew up, it was like uh, a, a knife in my heart. And I picked it up as a cause and it stayed with me. I walk as if I were another. And my wound, a white biblical rose, and my hands, two doves on the cross, hovering and carrying the earth. I don't walk, I fly. I become another, transfigured. No place and no time. So who am I? I am no I in Ascension's presence. But I think to myself, alone, the Prophet Muhammad spoke classical Arabic. And then what? Then what? 
a woman soldier shouted. Is that you again? Didn't I kill you? I said you killed me. But I forgot. Like you. To die. قلت قتلتني ونسيت مثلك أن أموت. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kate. And now I'll turn it over to Fazid. Um, thank you, Kate and Noelle in, in absentia. I'm glad we had this piece. Um, I um, I'm going to read a few poems today. Um, I think as um, a member of the Arab community, <laughs> um, one of the things that's been particularly difficult about this past period is both watching the disaster of the Russian invasion of Ukraine unfolding, and then on top of that, having to have this additional awareness of the um, language of white supremacy that has dominated the news waves, um, as we all um, sort of hear it discussed. Um, I'm sure some of us have seen some of this coverage um, CBS, for example, says, this isn't a place with all due respect, like Iraq or Afghanistan, that has seen conflict raging for decades. You know, this is a relatively civilized, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, city, where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen. So I wonder if that's with someone being very careful about the words that they're using, um, what they would have said if they weren't being very careful. Um, and I've just been thinking a lot about Du Bois talking about the double consciousness of um, the Black person in America um, and sort of seeing um, how the majority um, assigns value or doesn't assign value. Um, to one's life. So in solidarity with Ukraine, um, I am going to be reading some poems from Palestine um, and also just want to bring into the room that um, Al-Aqsa Mosque is under attack. This is now an annual event that happens every Ramadan. Um, I am going to start with reading um, Lina Khalaf Tufehaz. Um, poem running orders. Um, so this is, uh, it, the poem starts with an interview um, and then the poem will start. So I'm reading from the interview first. What happens before the Israeli military bombs your house? For many Gaza Strip residents, it's a phone call. Sausan Kawera, a resident of Khen Yunis, said she was in the house Tuesday when the phone rang. She answered and on the other side was David, who claimed he was with the Israeli military. He asked for me by name. He said, you have women and children in the house, get out. You have five minutes before the rockets come, Kawera said in an interview. Lina Khalaf Tufeha writes this poem in response, um, entitled Running Orders. They call us now, before they drop the bombs. The phone rings and someone who knows my first name calls and says in perfect Arabic, this is David. And in my stupor of sonic booms and glass shattering symphonies still smashing around in my head, I think, do I know any Davids in Gaza? They call us now to say you have 58 seconds from the end of this message. Your house is next. They think of it as some kind of wartime courtesy. It doesn't matter that there is nowhere to run to. 
It means nothing that the borders are closed and your papers are worthless and mark you only for a life sentence in this prison by the sea and the alleyways are narrow and there are more human lives packed one against the other more than any other place on earth, just run. We aren't trying to kill you. It doesn't matter that you can't call us back to tell us the people we claim to want aren't in your house, that there's no one here except you and your children who are cheering for Argentina, sharing the last loaf of bread for this week, counting candles left in case the power goes out. It doesn't matter that you have children. You live in the wrong place. And now is your chance to run to nowhere. It doesn't matter that 58 seconds isn't long enough to find your wedding album or your son's favorite blanket or your daughter's almost completed college application or your shoes or to gather everyone in the house. It doesn't matter what you had planned. It doesn't matter who you are. Prove you're human. Prove you stand on two legs. Run. So that was Running Orders by Lina Khalaf Tufeha. Um, and now I'm going to read um, a couple of poems by Asma Azaiza. This one is called Things Sleeping. It is translated by Maryam Hijjewi. Look at me, mother. I'm back with more meat and bones and wisdom. These days I can think of death, can sleep without being lulled. My milk teeth now grind my losses. I come back to find tongues of lullabies severed, children bellowing in every corner and the muezzin's call stifled by a strange hand. Return is a movie screen and I lo no longer recognize the lead. Though she's only come in once, she's tampered with the script a thousand times. Return is a cat who ate its young. Return is my braid which I cut off and fed to time. The once green garden is now a woman afraid of old age. The well, a bed in a hospital, and cats are the souls of women who cried on my arm. And I am now your mother. I shield your body with my own from the bullet that your 70 years will suddenly release. The accent I once rode now rests beneath the earth. What happened to the shifting qaf and the kef that barely came out? Where is the sling and the bird? Where is the neighbor's boy? What was his name? And what was mine? If I'd only had a single name, I wouldn't have forgotten it. It would have struck me right on the head like a sniper's bullet. Where are the skins I cured with life salt? Where are the supplies for the war that never came? They were devoured by waiting and might. Where is that northern gate that opens out onto happiness? Where is my uncle Mahmoud, who used to eat grass and ask God to forgive humanity's sins? My old father, who became my son, is dead. But where is the young man who was once my father? Where is that body I used to climb from whose forehead I picked the sour fruits of time? Tell him that all the teachings of politics have rotted in my head and that I've replaced them with poems I do not understand. I wanted to repair the verses, but ruined them instead. My mother put a finger to her mouth, sig signaled me to keep quiet. She pointed at the piles of things sleeping. Um, and now the last thing I'll read is, um, is a poem of mine. Um, I wrote it in response to a video that I saw in October 
2021 um, that was documenting Israeli soldiers savaging a Palestinian mother who was trying to pretend, protect her son's grave site um, that was being demolished to make way for a children's theme park. So this is from October 2021. like Khumus. First, <clears throat> they send in the girl soldiers. They look better. No, no, not the soldiers themselves, I mean, no, no, the optics. Then sending even a tiny battalion of boy soldiers to peel the old woman off her son's grave. Ruth E. Glash, writing for the Washington Post, has an article on the rise in the Israeli army of voluntary Orthodox girl recruits. If you hover over her name, Ruth E. Glash, a helpful little box comes up. It tells you Ruth is a reporter covering <coughs> for Israel and the Palestinian territories. In other words, colonialism's her beat. Because that's part of how you steal a country, don't you know? Right from under its indigenous inhabitants' feet. Proper nouns turned adjective. Israel as Israel is a nation state. Palestine as territories, pile of black caviar on a plate, ready for eating. Have you ever been to territories in the summer? I hear it's lovely that time of year. Keep up with that kind of thing and you'd very likely stand to win the very hummus out of the bowl with its traditional blue and white flower motif. But anyway, this isn't a poem about hummus. It's a poem about the old woman that took an army of them to peel off her son's headstone. The better to make way for a Flintstones ride in the theme park planned in its place, whose building plans she alone, surrounded by bulldozers and guns, was delaying manifest on the holy, holy land of proper noun nation state. Another article kind of about the same thing shows a photo courtesy of the Israeli defense, 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 defense forces as proper now nation state doth consistently methinks protest too much. Shows a girl crowned in orange sparks haloing her face, a girl from a mixed gender combat unit using machinery to reach missing people under the rubble. Dina Kraft with a K correspondent on Twitter at Dina Kraft coming at you all the way from load and proper now nation state begins her reportage this way. Rain is pouring down and the soldiers in helmets and neon orange rescue vests are covered in mud. But the search for the missing under the massive piles of rubble continues for the, for the third straight sleepless day. It takes Dina Kraft with a K till about the third paragraph for her to craft this sentence. The missing people the soldiers are trying to rescue are plastic dolls. And the scenario of proper noun nation state being under nationwide missile attack, only a drill. Now, if you already know anything about the elid, elid this to load as hummus is to hummus. You'll know it was taken not just with the miracle of words sublimated into colonial strategy, but a proper noun massacre, miracle mission possible accomplished in a mosque. But this isn't a poem about hummus or plastic dolls or mass mosque massacres or people shot dead in their hundreds praying an entire village in insert territory name. It's a poem about the old woman that took an army of them to peel off her son's gravestone to raise the way for God's chosen proper noun children to play. It's a well-known fact about people from territories that the mothers, having too many of them like sows, just don't care about their kids. According to what the settler townies from Crown Heights, Brooklyn, have to tell you, a common rhetoric among proper noun subjects of proper noun nation state. Why else do they send them off to Hamas then? Why? Why else valorize their lifting stone against tank, baby faces eye level with the tread? 
Why do so many ululate like it's a wedding when their daughters and sons return to them as stillness, as future soil for olive harvest, as future soil for trees, trees so ancient and deeply rooted, they transmogrify loose earth into ground. There's a book everybody read that I never did all about trees how they speak a secret language, how scale to the eye of God, they are as interconnected as mycelium. Another article I half read one time said that if you approach a plant with even just the intention of cutting, it releases a stress hormone detectable in the lungs of its leaves. The thing about life is it gives you about a million metaphors, feast on a platter big as the world. It's cheating, really. A poet barely even has to look. Because now I could say this poem is about how the olive trees in Palestine have been communing with one another in the language of centuries. That they are older than the Washington Post that they know and remember the name of the soil that fixes them, remembrances nitrogen and phosphate nourishment through the earth. Or I could say that this poem is about witness, that bark and branches bristle with eyes from the river to the sea. Or I could say this poem is about a people, is about a people so unbelievably lost and lonely in the desert, they'll spend three days unearthing humanoid plastic, all of it without sleep. But this isn't a poem about humanoid plastic. Um, I'm actually going to have to stop there because I ran out of time. Um, thank you all very much. Well, listen, thank you. Uh, thank you both, um, Kate and uh, Bazid. And I think there's a very, very important point uh, Bazid uh, also brought up, you know, the ranking, you know, of, of human lives. You know, when Syria got attacked, you know, for example, I think America took in 3,000 people. I think Germany, others, a million. But Ukraine is 100,000. They're like good refugees and bad refugees. Hungary that, you know, was fighting uh, dogs and else against anyone who came, you know, from the Arab world, all of a sudden said, no, Ukrainians can come, you know, or Poland, the same, a million people enter. So what is that? Isn't a refugee, a refugee isn't injustice, injustice isn't violence, violence against anyone. And what we heard through the day from the African-American community said, we know what's happening there. We know the violence. We know the taking away of a home and what it means to have no home, to be displaced, to be taken away from your country. Uh, the uh, Asian American community who also said, you know, we know violence we're actually experiencing right now. It went up 300% in the Trump time because they were pointed out as supposedly the carrier of COVID. You know, and then from the Palestinian experience, you know, of violence and uh, uh, displacement and uh, and tanks and, uh, and all of it. So it's really, really clear that what happened, especially in this theater, where 300 people died seeking refuge? Many children, we just heard today from one of the actresses who happened to be in there after her home was bombed. You know, it wasn't safe in there. She had to flee again. Um, it is uh, shocking what is happening. And I think uh, there should be a planetary reaction as the, you know, racism is a planetary problem. Uh, the environment, the uh, uh, climate change, homophobia, and also, you know, injustices like these and more. And I hope uh, we will see a better future. And art has to be on the side of life. Art is on this right side of justice. And I really want to thank you, Kate and Bazid, for, for sharing. And um, of course, also from Noel, uh, that, that strong contribution um, of speaking to her elder of the, of the community. We have to go uh, right away to our next uh, segment. Maybe stay a second and say hello to a new group that formed the Ukrainian Actors of New York. Um, who are with us. Um, no, it's the Mabu Minds. I'm sorry. It's the Mabu Minds and Performance Space who are with us. And um, we're going to have, if it all worked out, Carl Hancock's work with us and Maud Mitchell and, um, 
and uh, and uh, so uh, I hope uh, we we got that right. So uh, thank you all for your contribution, and um, and we move on. And I see Sharon here from the Marble Minds uh, with us. Um, so um, let's uh, move on and to our next uh, segment. And um, goodbye, Kate. Thank you for preparing this, Bazid, for talking to us and for preparing um, that beautiful, that beautiful reading. Thank you. So here we go, Sharon. Hi, I am. Uh, I am here as yes. a substitute for Carl Hancock Rocks. He good. Fortunately, had something come up and wasn't able to join us today. So our apologies. Maud Mitchell, it was in the waiting room. I presume she'll be here she momentarily. Be. Yes, absolutely, I am sure. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so should we wait for her? Should we? No, uh, so tell us a little bit, you know, not everybody knows about the Mabu Minds. We also have many international listeners. Maybe tell us a little bit uh, about uh, the Mabu Minds and perhaps also PS122 now known as performance space where you are and what do you do? Yes, so Mabu Minds is a 50-year-old uh, collective uh, experimental theater company whose founders were uh, Joanna Kalaitis, Lee Brewer, Philip Glass, Ruth Malachek, and David Warlow. So the company is just celebrating our 50th anniversary and we're a collective of theater artists making experimental work. Um, and we're located in the East Village at the 122 building, which is where PS122 was for many, many years. Now it's called Performance, Na Performance Space New York. Uh, we underwent a massive renovation a few years ago. So we're back in the building. We're and <laughs> pandemic uh, kind of paused things for a while too. So we're back and um, beginning to perform again uh, just in next month, actually. We're doing a piece called Vicks, The Vicksburg Project based on women's lives in Vicksburg, Mississippi over five different, um, four different periods, 50 year increments. Um, so that's premiering next month. Yeah, so thank you so much. And for all of our listeners to know PS or PS122 was also a place for New York artists. It had a very strong local roots um, in the community, many, many artists came out there, often performance artists, solo performers, and it has a, a, a great history, but then also developed as a, as, a, as a place, as a host for international and global work. So um, Maud and uh, Julia, welcome both. Maybe you, you, you also talk and say who you are. Maybe we start with uh, Maud. Hi, I had a little trouble getting in through the, the internet. Uh, I've been working with Mabu for 20 years, uh, um, primarily with my uh, beloved late uh, Lee Brewer. And, um, but as we were talking about this event today, we have um, two uh, brief offerings. And then we really would like to augment the voices of Ukraine and in particular, we have invited uh, uh, Yulia, who's a representative of an organization that some of you may be familiar with, uh, Razum, uh, that not only is doing um, incredible relief work, but also interesting street theater that I, I think will be of interest to hear about. Fantastic, and, yes. And Sh Sharon's going to read first. And then I have a song to offer. Not that I'm right. singing. And then Yulia. Okay. So Sharon, tell us, what, what are you going to read? Well, uh, when we were talking about, you know, the, this desperate situation, uh, a piece that Mabu Mines did in the 80s called Dead End Kids, a, his, a story of nuclear power. And it was let's call it agitprop, but I mean, it was an amazing piece. And I'm gonna read a small section that was written by Paracelsus, who was an alchemist in the medieval times. And essentially the, the point of the show, I believe, and I spoke with Joanna Colitis about this, who is the director and the conceiver of the piece, um, that it's really about the danger of 
an investigation that could lead to something that unexpected and lead us somewhere quite unexpected. So I'll just read it. <laughs> and this is the offering for in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. I am the poison dripping dragon who is everywhere, that upon which I rest, and that which rests upon me will be found in me by those who pursue their investigations in accordance with the rules of the art. My water and fire destroy and put together. From my body, you may extract the green lion and the red. But if you do not have exact knowledge of me, you will destroy your five senses with my fire. From my snout, there comes a spreading poison that has brought death to many. I bestow on you the powers of the male and the female, and those of heaven and earth. The mysteries of my art must be handled with courage and greatness of mind. If you would conquer me by the power of fire, for already very many have come to grief. I am the egg of nature, known only to the wise, who in piety and modesty bring from the microcosm, which was prepared for mankind by almighty God, but given only to the few, while the many long for it in vain. I am the old dragon found everywhere on the globe of the earth, father and mother, young and old, very strong and very weak, death and resurrection, visible and invisible, hard and soft. I descend into the earth and ascend to the heavens. I am the highest and the lowest, the lightest and the heaviest. I contain the light of nature. I am dark and light. I come forth from heaven and earth. By virtue of the sun's rays, all the colors shine in me and all the metals. I am the carbuncle of the sun, the most noble, purified earth through which you may change copper, iron, tin, and lead into gold. Again, that's from uh, Dead End Kids. Uh, written in, uh, created in the 1980s and toured throughout um, the United States. At the time we were dealing with, you know, <laughs> um, nuclear plants that were yeah. exploding, but also it was looking at Los Alamos and Nagasaki and, you know, all the devastation that, that nuclear power wrought throughout the world. So. Um, yeah, and, and we know that Russian troops were actually utterly were shooting at the, at the, the plants, uh, nuclear plants, you know, in the Ukraine. <clears throat> Russian troops actually went through Chernobyl um, without any special protection and disregard for their own lives in a way. And um, whoever would have thought that, uh, uh, that uh, a Soviet or a Russian army you know, would shoot at a nuclear uh, reactor. It's uh, it's shocking, and uh, and I guess this piece proved to be timeless. Yes. Well, who you know, we didn't expect to have to bring it out again, but yeah. we may need to. So I'll hand it off to Maud now, who has yeah. another, you know, well, artistic piece. Oh, yes. and I, I was looking for something to share that was both. Um, uh, a salute to, a testament to the spirit of endurance and perseverance, but also a bulwark against despair, which I think many of us have been feeling. And this is a song from uh, the piece, uh, The Warrior Ant, that was a great extravaganza, a cross-cultural collaboration. Um, written and directed by Lee, and the music is composed by Bob Telson, and you'll, you'll hear Sam Butler singing. And there was a 16 foot tall ant in it. And then... Ratchet, take it away.
Thank you, Ratchet. Thank you. Just thank like you. To, thank. <laughs> like to hand it off to you, yeah. Yeah, but it's also that moment, it's, it's, it's a great idea, a warrior and, you know, it's kind of small, tiny, but it can be very big and you have to be a warrior, but you have to be persistent and preside and in kind of organize as a, as a community. So, um, tell us a bit, why did you want to bring Julia on? Because I felt as though it's really, we're here in solidarity, but we want, we want to augment the voices of Ukrainians and um, as she can speak most directly to what and the issue is at hand. And, and the work that this organization is doing is quite incredible. So please, let's hear from Julia. Julia. Okay, um, hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting. Uh, I am do represent the uh, Razam for Ukraine. It's actually an organization that's also located in the East Village, um, right next to Veselka. 
That's where we started in 2014. That's where originally we were a response to the, um, the beginning of the war, which nobody like realizes the war did not start today. It did start in 2014. Um, and the revolution of dignity that started, uh, that happened. But the organization was for some times after this was more of a peace, like not peace time, but more um, ceasefire, more quiet time. We had, um, like uh, we did a lot of uh, cultural educational project. Um, there was a book club where people were gathering reading books and one of the Ukrainian actually, uh, our Ukrainian um, author was nominated for Nobel Prize uh, this year. So, all of that was halted and put on a, on pause when on uh, February 24th, the full invasion happened and we mobilized. I, I can share like at some point our website, we mobilized to do an emergency response right now. And the emergency response besides uh, the sending the um, first aid, uh, sending hospitals, uh, helping refugees in Ukraine moving. We have this um, taken onto the streets. So shown like, shown basically, basically um, we're, we're doing that not just, it's not demonstrations per se, it's we're doing a lot of flash mobs to draw a lot of attention to the cause, to draw it a lot of attention. For example, if you, if I, if you'd let me share, I can mm -hmm. share a screen right now. So I'll be more, um, mm, one second. Oh. I know you've done events at Grand Central and in Washington Square Park recently. Uh, yes, oh, yeah. give me a second. I'm trying to, mm -hmm. to, to share it because, oh, I am, just uh yeah we did uh events that uh so do so do i i do this uh-huh i should be able to no Oops. and razon means yes. together right together to that's together, together. To... correct thank you now we can share um so this is the i i so let's see if i can get that's one of the example it was i i can go and probably share more pictures from the event that was actually done because um as bucha as you know the bucha uh, was freed and uh, a lot of cases when the women were raped uh came out and um that was one of those um moments when uh you know uh, people came together and um i'm trying to see how i can share um more pictures uh because that's mm -hmm. so then uh they came to share that they basically are silent they were silent by Russian soldiers and they were silent by uh, at the time that they, they happened to uh, on the occupation happened and it came out and they did like this flash one of these flash mobs uh, came out of this um, need this to in Washington Square Park right about a week ago that, Washington that's Park. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, that was, um, let me just, because so I also, I think, or, oh, no, I don't know. What it's like. uh, in Washington, D.C., um, I believe this is, was one of the also, that was New York when we did the, for the kids uh, who were bombed in Mariupol Theater, that was one of the flash mobs that was done in um to get attention that 1300 uh, kids were um in this mariupol theater that was bombed and they basically were buried alive at this point uh, 130 people came out so we have this flash mob of to save mariupol which would draw a lot of attention but because the, the siege and um the people probably not probably uh, but we had to draw attention to that 
cause. It's Grand Central Station, right? Where, That's where? Grand Central Station. Yeah, this is a Grand Grand Central Station. There, where, um, and this is. Oh, now I can actually. Now I see how I can share. Uh, do uh, okay. Uh, let me see. Um, share screen. There's. I will. Yeah, I can share more of this. Uh, of these pictures because I just uh, realized. It's, yeah. So that was for the cause of uh, when the when the all atrocities that were done by Russians came out um, in Bucha. That was. Um, Done. That's that's still New York, right? Mm -hmm. That was still done at um, Washington Square Park. Washington Square Park. Thank you. Um, so again, the person who uh, is actually the, 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 the our team who is doing uh, who is creating this a lot of flash mobs, they created one today, and they are at the one of the event. Um, Today is spreading the information, so unfortunately they could not. Uh, Inna, who is uh, leading, and, and that uh, she could not be here with us today. She shared with me all these pictures. Um, I'm happy to share with everybody, but I'm. I also can uh, basically um, tell you how all these uh, projects that we used to have on our, like you can tell it's on our website, it's resinforukraine.org. It's actually where you can donate uh, right there. You can tell, like you can donate, you can participate. There's a way of uh, donating your time, but we all have all these different projects, which is with, with the children, with the veterans. Uh, we had the Razum culture, this all right now stopped. Like all we did to toy drive, it's all right now stopped for one and the only uh, project emergency response, which is where we, you can tell it, we are basically all our efforts are right now on getting what is needed to the ground. And, um, and one of the most, like very, very important parts of our activity, it's, it's uh, doing these flash mobs and doing the, um, you know, going on the streets, taking to the streets and taking it to the streets in a way that we can draw as much attention as, as possible to the, everything that's happening. So that's... Um, yeah. Sorry, this is Sharon. Um, you were saying that there are different units who are who are handling various parts of the emergency response. You know, working with uh, moving people and uh, sending various essentials that are needed, or helping lo relocate people. Can you talk yeah. about the different units you have? Yes, we have actually absolutely. We have the. This is one of, uh, just a second. So we have uh, 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 you, that one unit that uh, used to be working with uh, just uh, uh, with kids in needs in Ukraine. Uh, they were helping basically uh, um, kids with um, SM atrophy, muscle atrophy. So we were the, the actually, it started with a uh, one child with, uh, who needed help to get this one shot that was, cost uh, close to $2 million with their muscle atrophy. And the son, there was a kid who was uh, a son of the one of the soldiers who came back, who was a veteran. And um, one of our, our volunteer started this program and she absolutely amazingly was able to uh, fundraise $2 million, close to $2 million for this shot. So she, at this, when the war started, she took on that. She is a doctor and she took on that part of the project that she, they are moving people from um, Bakhmut, which is uh, right on the line um, 
on the front line, basically, kids on the front line. They are putting them on our buses, moving them closer to the more safe places. And that's uh, one of the our emergency response. And I, uh, I'm looking right now to see if they, they do have, um, that's hospital team. So that, that's that the people who are help right there. That's, that's in basic an update from this specifically. Uh, that was done, published April 9th. So we are, you know, we're trying to update this. This is what people who were gotten on the bus and were moved uh, by one of our part of our volunteer teams. Uh, so that's that, that where we are. Oh, you're at yeah, slim. Amazing. We, I think we have two minutes left. So this is certainly a, um, a project. Everybody who wants to get involved or donate is something to consider. It's an important work. And it's also interesting that uh, you go and use what we would say is three theater performance techniques um, to get the word out. And as we are experiencing that theaters who now go and do voluntary work, aid work, they help communities as the Mayi theater said today, we work now with our communities and we do less theater. So it's complete time of change, which we are experiencing. The world is upside down, and but it's also something um, is happening and things are, are moving. We said it earlier that uh, Tony Kushner, who was with us once said that New York is a melting pot that never really melted, but perhaps with the time of COVID, with this thing like this war happening, um, there is something that uh, perhaps will bring um, and people together and rethink the fundamental values of our life to the freedoms we enjoy and artistic expression, uh, how important it is, how great today we had 24 theater companies Everybody could say whatever they want that nobody wanted to see up front, something that's really um, an act of artistic freedom, of engagement for what's right. And, um, and we really would like to thank the Mabu Minds uh, uh, that they also show that they care and that the Ukraine um, is, um, is on their mind. And, uh, and I hope uh, uh, Mont and uh, Sharon and Carl and Mallory and everybody, you know, that you will be back in the theater, that you can perform and do what you love to do most and where you're very effective, but that these stories come out and how great is to see, to see this picture, you know, of a powerful uh, a moment of a woman uh, taking a stand uh, for what she believes in and what is the true, the message and theater is important because we search for the truth. I think we are at our uh, nine o'clock um, uh, a moment and we're gonna move over to the next group, a new group that formed and maybe you all stay for a tiny moment on so you meet them. This is the Ukrainian Actors of New York. Um, it's a, a group forming right now of uh, uh, Tiasa is kind of uh, joining us and Tony and Alex, but Sasha Gordon or Sasha Odessa, she will change her name to her hometown um, are with us and they're gonna uh, read um, to us. So tell us a little bit um, what you will be doing and we would like to say thank you. Say hello to your colleagues uh, from, from the Mabu Mines and, um, yeah. and maybe uh, uh, Sasha, tell us a little bit what we're gonna hear from you. So today we're going to be reading from the Paris Review, the beautiful article that Ilya Kaminsky wrote, which is a compilation of stories of Odessa poets and writers. And we're going to give the voice to them by reading them and honoring them. And I would just like to add by saying that, as you know, our fellow brothers and sisters are dying right now in the arms of pure evil. And our brave armed forces of Ukraine are defending the freedom and democracy of Ukraine, as well as the whole world. So when we watch this, right, we cannot help but ask, what can one person do? And we say that a person can do something, we can use our voices and we can use whatever it is that we're good at to bring change, to put the spotlight on what's happening. And really as a group, we have strength because our strength is in numbers. So don't forget that we're all bringing the victory closer together. And like this event, there are dancers, there are singers, there are theater performances, do that. Tell our story and keep going. Don't be silent and stand with us spread the word it's really important for everyone to come out and do whatever it is that they can do everything counts everything that lets them know that we're fighting for them just as they're fighting for us so we're going to start off as 
of one story, the first story I'm going to read, I'm going to read part of it in Ukrainian, and then I'm going to read the whole thing in English. And then my colleagues here from our group, Ukrainian actors of New York, are going to continue. So I'm going to start with the first story. Good? Yeah, and it is, again, as you said, from the Paris Review, Conversations to the Tune of Air Raid, Sirens, and Ilya Kaminsky introduced it and put it together. Thank you. And thank you so much, Frank, for putting it together. This event is really wonderful. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. This is from Anna Mihalevska. Коти кричать вночі, намагаючись перекричати сигнали повітряної тривоги. Я знахожу красу в дивних речах, графіті на облупаних стінах, розкопані для ремонту вулиці. Я жадібно оглядаю все. Не знаю, чи побачу колись ту чи іншу вулицю. Я бачу фотографії Харкова у руїнах, фотографії розбомбованого Києва. Нато швидко все змінюється. Якщо ви хочете щось зробити, ви повинні зробити це прямо зараз. Анна Михайлівська. The cats are screaming in the night, trying to outscream the air raid sirens. I find beauty in strange things. Graffiti on peeling walls, a street dug up for repairs. I look about greedily. I don't know if I will ever see this or that street ever again. I see photos of Kharkiv in ruins, photos of a bombed out Kiev. Everything is changing too fast. If you want to do something, you need to do it right now. Doing something, anything, is medicine at the moment. When I manage to help someone, I can forget about the war. I think many people have discovered this. Pre-war life already seems unreal and far away. There's so much in it. I didn't appreciate it. Always rushing, searching for new projects. Not enough time for basic talk. Now there's so much talk, but it is tense. Cruelly, this situation brings us back to each other. Thank you. Vladislava Ilinskaya. After a week spent in a stupor, I walked out into Odessa streets to see anti-tank fortifications, barricades made of sandbags blocking the avenues, boutiques and restaurants boarded up, people with guns on the street. I'm writing this in a taxi. We were just stopped at a checkpoint. We were searched. It's frightening how quickly I've gotten used to this life. The most terrifying thing is the silence. When you know that the whole country is boiling in a bloody broth. Our people are amazing. Never before have I seen such solidarity and care among neighbors. A strange feeling. As if I haven't lived before this moment. As if some kind of shell has burst, a carapace that prevented me from breathing in deeply. I don't know what I did before the war. I've never been so aware of being needed, of being involved in reality. Hi. This is a poetic reflection from Eugene Demenock. I have been dividing my time between Prague and Odessa for many years. But when this war started, my family was on a trip to New York. For a few days before our flight to Prague, we did not venture out of our hotel room other than to, to attend protests. We spent our entire time scrolling through the news and calling our friends and family. Back in Prague, we found we could be of more use. The Czech Republic has already received more than 200,000 Ukrainian refugees. 
I spend my days between the refugee integration center, the train station, and a community residence for 72 people that my friends are building at their own expense. I cannot write anything. I don't have the stamina, desire, or time for it now. For many days, I have been grinding my way through a piece of the correspondence between Henry Miller and David Berlick. I would love to publish a few letters from Miller in Ukrainian translation for the first time. And yet my mornings start with calls and letters asking for help. My days are spent in volunteer work. And by the time I am free, it is already late into the night. Elena Andrejcikova. And you? Every morning starts with this question. I'm asked and I ask. Family asks, friends ask, colleagues, acquaintances, my lines of defense. I still can't understand how it can be. War in Ukraine? Attacked by Russia? They're bombing our cities? Just days before the war began, I finished my latest novel. The protagonist dreams about war. Dreams impacted by stories of her grandmother, who was a prisoner in the Salaspils camp. I haven't found the strength to reread the novel yet. I still feel disgusted. One day I will find the courage to rewrite it. I will speak as a witness to how scary it is when air raid sirens wail in the early morning on an ordinary Thursday. How I kept smiling while packing frantically, trying to signal to my son that I was not worried. How a warehouse exploded and burned before our eyes, less than 200 feet away. How we spent a night surrounded by jam jars in a root cellar in Odessa. How my three-year-old nephew, who had just arrived from Kharkiv, shuddered, stuttered, and cried. How unwilling I was to decide whether I should stay with my husband or drive the kids away from all of this. How we left Odessa at night. Eight cars, women and children, cats and dogs. Some of us were driving for the first time ever. We were stopped at the checkpoint. No cars were allowed to pass through the night. One woman suddenly exclaimed, I know the password. My husband wrote it down for me before he went to war. We fight our own information war. We wake up every morning and hope that it's all over, that we can live, plan, write novels again. But for now, I just message everyone. And you, how are you? Hearing an answer is the only thing that matters. Vidya Brevis. War entered my life in Lviv. I was there on vacation. An urge to go home. I got on a train back. I'm still not quite sure why I went toward Odessa, where most people were leaving our city for. Lviv were to go farther west abroad to safety. I struggled to get through the crowd at the station in Lviv. People were waiting for trains to western border and trains were five hours, seven hours late. Some folks were sleeping on their suitcases and kids were crying just like they do in movies about war. Today is March 18th, 11th, the 16th day. The war of bullets and bombs has not started full swing in Odessa yet, but you're going to read this later, so you'll know more than I do. I envy you. In the beginning, I taped my windows crisscross so that even if something exploded nearby, the blast wave wouldn't leave my entire apartment covered in shards of glass. I moved a, a large dresser in front of the window for better protection. As days went by, I got used to being afraid. So I moved the dresser back to the wall and peeled the tape off. Our cities get bombed. 
missiles explode and Russian soldiers walk down the streets and sometimes shoot the locals for entertainment. Those who are leaving Odessa now see the other side of war, crying children, 30 hours of waiting at the Moldovan border, not knowing where to live, where to shower or when to return home. I live on the 21st floor. There's no one left around here. Of eight apartments, only one still has inhabitants. My dog, my cat, and me. When I hear the sirens wailing, I walk out on the balcony to see if missiles are coming. So, um, yeah, Sasha, do you have a second, one more story oh, for us? Yeah, so let's do, we'll do another round. So we have yep. a second set of stories. So Cynthia can start and then we'll do um, another round and then we will have time to talk. Yep. Go ahead, Cynthia. Vladislav Kitik. A seagull all fluffed up sits at the edge of the pier, chest against the wind. A sharp explosion over the bay interrupts its contemplation of the gray water and it spreads its wings. Seagulls don't know what war is, but after 16 days, the gulls have managed to overcome their confusion and learn not to fly too far when the sky shakes with landmine explosions or cannon fire not to hide when they hear the howl of sirens. The seagulls fly over Odessa streets, which are usually crowded and noisy. A rare pedestrian leaves footprints on the untouched snow. In silence, the famous Potemkin stairs climb the slope, buried in bags filled with sand. They hide the monument to the city's founder, Odessa's bronze soul, from the malice of artillery. But the seagulls love the sand. The street bristles with anti-tank devices. Will they be able to protect us against modern missiles? Of course not. But there is something hoodlumish, cocky in these six-pointed crosses known as hedgehogs. Such hedgehogs stood here in 1941 and now time has jumped off the footboard of the past. The gull circles over the houses and flies once again to the sea. Taya Medienko, on the first day of the war, People in Kharkiv, Kiev, and Lviv, first among them Russian-speaking and bilingual people, started speaking Ukrainian in mass. Some have already managed to surrender and transition back to their customary Russian. At first with a disclaimer, in order to be understood by all Russian enemies, and then silently, without rationalization. When, hurriedly, between air raids, you try to articulate your thoughts and feelings, you involuntarily switch back to the language you've been accustomed to thinking in since childhood. Others keep their oath, not one more word in Russian. And I think they will remain strictly Ukrainian speakers even after the war. The Russian invasion showed what a source of strife regular words can be. Some fear mongers, including those from other countries, accuse me of naivete. After the war, they could ban speaking Russia and Ukraine. But I remind them, saying what you think in Russian language is banned only in Putin's Russia. Ghana Kostenko. 
A few days ago, I decided to listen to Rachmaninoff's second concerto. I wanted to clutch it in my hands like a brand so that I wouldn't slip into the sticky mud of hostility toward everything Russian. Rachmaninoff is innocent. He has nothing to do with Putin's crimes, just as Goethe was innocent of Hitler's madness. Yesterday during an air raid, I hid in the bathroom and I understood with clarity that I don't want to sink into hate. I have made a choice for myself and I'm trying to stick to it. Hate is the language of my enemies. It is their source of strength. How else to explain the bombardments of kindergartens, maternity wards, hospitals? I come back to Heine, who said that every new epoch needs a new kind of a reader, needs new sets of eyes. Nail Muratov. Has Odessa changed in these first few days of war? Yes. No. There are lines of people at the gas station so long that they're blocking traffic on the streets. Lines in stores of people sweeping everything from the shelves, cereals, sugar, salt, matches. This blizzard of movement pulling the city from its usual calm, this human and hill. Checkpoints have sprung up, but cars still weave through the streets, fewer now. Passerby go about their business, supermarkets, and some small stalls and kiosks are open. On Monday, classes are starting in schools and universities, but no one knows what will happen next. In times of war, writing goes badly. What can you do? Your mind refuses to make sense of what's happening. Some people have left and those who remain have banded together. My 92 year old mother returned a couple of days ago from the store and in her bag were several cans of preserves given to her by women she didn't know. A city that is preparing its defense does not make the best impression. You can't simply pass through the streets of the city center. Everywhere there are tank traps, sandbags, wire gauze. Several times a day, there are air raid alarms and some neighborhoods have no bomb shelters. I bring my 85 year old mom to the bathroom, the only place in her home where it's possible to find some kind of shelter. Through all this, Odessaites are not losing their sense of humor. Across the city walls, there are giant banners advising Russian soldiers to do as Ukrainians on nearby Snake Island had famously suggested a Russian warship should. In wartime, profanity is forgivable. It relieves stress. People are volunteering everywhere, assembling sandbags on the seashore. You're in Odessa, the song goes. And that means that neither grief nor misfortune is scary for you. I've written several poems about the war. A poet should be a vibrating string that responds to everything happening around us. I am following what my poet friends are writing and the level of their poetry has risen. The language has become very precise and strong. There are no words nor justifications for what the Russian army is doing in Ukraine, in Kharkiv, in Kiev, in Mariupol, in other cities. Still, the task of poetry is to find words, even when they're not. And that was from Anna Struminska. Thank you all. Thank you all so, so very much. And, um, Sasha, you are Ukrainian, um, um, working here in New York as an actor. Um, how does it all feel to you, what's happening in your country? It doesn't feel like it's real. I still hope to wake up from this horrible nightmare that my country is in. It, it, yeah, it doesn't feel like 
it's too real and unreal at the same time. It's just, it breaks my heart. It's the only thing that I'm thinking about every day. And it's really difficult to think about anything else. That's why I've been focusing everything on helping in any way I can, on fundraising, on spreading the word, on really doing anything I can to help. And um, yeah, my soul, my I am here physically, but my heart is there and my soul is there. So I just hope it ends soon. So people are not suffering anymore and dying. Sure, this is... Uh... So it's a hard time and we can hear, we can really hear and feel, you know, what you, what you, what, what's going through your mind. And so thank you for sharing. Thank you for putting this reading together. Maybe all the participants, Yasa, Alex, since they are, Tony, tell us a little bit about who you are and how. Tiasa. Sure. Hi, I'm Tiasa. I'm an actor, playwright, and um, I'm a founder of a theater company, Transforma Theater, that's dedicated to creating interactive theatrical experiences, the convergence of science, consciousness, and ritual. And I'm originally Slovenian, but just so happy to be um, invited to participate with this amazing group of people and to give a spotlight on these um, gorgeous and uh, traumatic and traumatized voices from Ukraine. I think that what really struck me, uh, also Frank, thank you so much for organizing this. Um, sure. Bombing a theater is such a huge gesture. Once you start bombing theater, you're bombing culture, you're trying to get the word out. So one of the maybe most um, hard hitting pieces from tonight for me was um, Alex actually read it by Taya about how people first vigorously started talking Ukrainian, not giving up their word. And then slowly the Russians started creeping back in for utility and who knows where this is going, but I feel like our role here and our job is to sort of like promote Ukrainian culture and um, keep the Ukrainian word going and by doing this, letting them know that we're with them, um, doing what we can in their own capacities, but yeah. definitely supporting and co-suffering. Thank you. But also being super lucky that we're here, that we're yeah. not there. That's yeah. true. And by chance, you know, it could be any one of us could have been born there by just by, by chance. Alex. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Alex Sazerov Meyer. I'm a Canadian Russian. I came to Canada when I was 13 years old. I'm an actor. And uh, uh, my family is still in Ukraine. I lived both in Ukraine and Russia. So I'm in kind of an interesting conundrum here where like I have a Russian passport. My grandmother lives in Russia. You know, uh, my, my family is in Ukraine. My dad, my stepsisters, my grandfather, everyone's there. So this kind of divide, you know, um, is I'm torn between that, between like I've used to visit both countries. Like I used to speak Russian. I went to a Russian school, you know, and um, uh, and it's just so difficult to see all of this. Just like, it just absolutely breaks my heart. You know, like I came here at 13 years old, but like, just to imagine that I, I used to live there and my family's there is, is devastating. Uh, the other day I got a call from my, my aunt, from my dad. And uh, we talked about various things about the war and everything, but she, she you know, she, and this is a perspective that I've never heard of before. And I didn't know this might've been an issue here in America and Canada that like she, she's in, um, she's in Turkey and she was saying, Alex, you know, are you, uh, you know, you're born in, you're born in Ukraine, right? You're not, you're not Russian. I'm like, no, actually I, I was born in Ukraine, but I have a Russian passport. My mom wanted me to have a Russian passport. And she said, Alex, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone you're Russian. Don't speak Russian. Don't do. And I'm like, Ileana, what do you mean? What are you talking about? This is, I've never heard such a thing. I didn't witness mm. this discrimination. You know, like this isn't the Russian people don't, don't want this. They don't want this war. This is the government. This is the, the Russian military, you know? And um, she, this, this kind of fear that the Russian people are having to sort of speak their own language, I think is very devastating. And I just want people to remember and remind them that, that this is Putin's war. This is whatever Mag Magdalene maniacs, person in power, you know, and the, whatever is happening on the war side, the military, that's the destruction, you know, like the Russian people are suffering. Also, there's a many consequences and like there have many Russian friends yeah. who are in Ukraine. So just as a reminder, that's yeah. some, something like a message I wanted to 
sort of yeah, say to, and, and uh, over 10,000, some say 20,000 Russian soldiers um, um, died. Cynthia. Who didn't know, yeah, who didn't know. Who did what not they're even going. know where they were going. They thought they went into some kind of a maneuver exercise. Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi, I'm Cynthia. And uh, I'm an actress, a writer, and a satirist. My heart is so with Ukraine. Reading these stories and listening to these stories, my heart breaks. I mean, just breaks. One of the reasons that I'm so close to Sasha and close and understanding what is happening in this crazy, senseless, insane war where innocent people, innocent people, babies, pregnant women are dying. There is no reason for this at all. And um, I feel really honored to take part in this tonight. And uh, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing this whole day because this needs to go out there and everyone in America has to understand what is happening there. Everyone has to give their hearts for that. Really. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you for doing that. Thank this. you. T Tony. Tony Nomovsky. I am Macedonian, New York based actor. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's really difficult to say anything, to be honest. Uh, this was really difficult to read these words, even even though we are actors and that's what we do, um, to give any sense of truth or life to what was written by these brave people. It's really incredible. And uh, I always remember this. I'm going to paraphrase probably. You're going to correct me what Brecht used to say, that in the future, they will not say the times were dark, but they will ask why were the poets silent? So we're not silent. This is a way of finding a voice and making whatever difference we can make, even not being uh, maybe physically present uh, there with the people who are suffering. Yeah, yeah, that's true. One of the poets from the New Yorkian poets Kafi said, it's resistance in a distance. It was part of her, her spoken word uh, rough riff, and I think there's something, something to it. So really, uh, I think this is also um, what you did uh, tonight. So really, thank you all for, um, for joining, taking the time, staying up so late. I know it's a holiday weekend, and, uh, and uh, Chiesa, Alex, Cynthia, Tony, and of course, Sasha, um, you know, we heard from you and um, how close this is um, um, to your heart. And I think the entire day, um, I can't believe we are coming to our last segment, really does show that there is a support for the arts um, for um, the atrocities and this kind of criminal acts that have been um, committed, war crimes against international conventions, against war conventions, against Geneva conventions. And we all um, hope that these dark days will be over uh, soon. And, uh, but if we don't speak out, nobody will. So it is important, and I think it's a very, very strong voice that we, we show today. Um, we're going to go now uh, to, to our next uh, segment that we have with us, an organization. It's called Theaters, Theater Without Borders, um, like there is uh, Doctors Without Borders, perhaps a little bit more famous uh, uh, sister or brother organization. You can still stay and say hello. And Theater Without Borders for decades also has engaged in regions of conflict, brought people together, um, created uh, safe havens uh, for, for theater people. And um, so we started with PEN, PEN America, the writers organization, and we're now going to go um, to a theater um, without borders, I hope they are with us, and um, I'm going to ask uh, them to to join us um, if they are here. If not, maybe we take we um, stay a little bit uh, longer um, um, with this uh, conversation. I don't see them yet entering. I'm sure they are still preparing. Um, uh, they are also they're showing a video. Okay, I just hear they are here. So. Um, they're on video, so uh, we are going to move over um, to this session. So thank you all uh, for joining, taking your time, and um, they think this was an important uh, statement. And uh, also to Ilya Kaminsky, thank you. He wrote us and said it's okay to use the material. Uh, congratulations also on the Paris Review to put, him put these beautiful essays um, together in such a short time. Thank you all, and we move over now to Theatre Without Borders. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and everyone behind the scenes who made today possible. Um, we are honored to be with you at the end of this day. I'm Lisa Schlesinger, playwright, librettist, theater activist, and a core member of Theater Without Borders. And I'd like to introduce Leal Schocker, uh, my collaborator. Leal has appeared as a soloist, performer, composer around Europe, the Middle East, North and South America, and Asia, with collaborations and commissions from West Eastern Divan Orchestra, Avignon Lucerne Festivals, and the New World Symphony, among others. Um, Leal works regularly with Zukak Theater in Beirut, Lebanon, her, her home. And she's a winner of the Silk Road Seeds inaugural 2020 award. Leal's most recent composition is In the Presence of Absence, a staged performance for string ensemble with archi arch archival recordings from piano recitals by Edward Said. We are here on behalf of Theater Without Borders, a global all volunteer grassroots virtual community that shares information and builds connections between individuals and institutions in international theater and performance exchange. It was co-founded by Roberta Levito, Katrine Fiu, Eric N, and Deborah Brevoort. Theater Without Borders has recently partnered with the Department of Theater Arts at the University of Iowa, where the archives will now be held in the university's special collections library. On behalf of the Theater Without Borders Collective, we stand in solidarity and offer our unconditional support to Ukraine and Ukrainian people. Tonight, we will present some musical ex excerpts from Ruinous Gods, Sweets for Sleeping Children, an opera in progress. Ruinous Gods is an operatic dreamscape, a resignation syndrome, a rare trauma response to the state of living in the limbo of displacement. Resignation syndrome, originally diagnosed in Sweden, is now recognized globally. It affects children who are displaced by war and global conflict, and who in most cases are denied asylum. Because children literally embody the future, what does this mean for the future? Ruinous Gods draws on myths and fairy tales to tell the story of an 11 year old girl who was forced to flee her home. As she travels the distorted map of displacement and the liminal realm of not home, she meets other young people who have fled war and climate disaster, who have survived harrowing escapes and are yet full of courage and hope. The first piece we will play from this work in progress is at the very beginning of the opera. It's an invocation to the story goddesses to wake up the story and the characters to welcome the audience for safe passage. It is sung in Assyrian. Yeah. 
In, this, in the second excerpt from Suite 3, we meet the character of Crow in the camps. I'll read a bit of Crow's text. Please take us from this hell, I heard the boy say, out amid a field of soggy tents. I stole his grandmother's, grandfather's knife from under the pillow. We are in migration, the egrets, pigeons, wandering tattlers and me, gathered under the hibiscus tree, bathing in dirt, rinsing in a bowl of water, someone left on the stoop. Sometimes mortals tangle with gods. We're bored in hell, so we steal and sing. Heaven is the first bird song at dawn. Can you hear it under all those engines? special air force operations flying over 135 countries. How could you possibly hear us? Look up, this is what they make in America, just war. And what will I do with your grandfather's knife? Sometimes mortals tangle with gods, look up. This extract is um, scored for soprano, dulcimer, bassoon and string quintet, compromised of viola, violin, cello, bass, two violins. Please take us from the Of soggy tents, I stole my grandfather's knife from under his pillow. final excerpt we'll play this evening, we'll just call the rabbit. And um, 
I'll read a bit of the text. It never stops snowing where I live. I found her in the snow, snow white rabbit in the snow. We are leaving soon. I have a white rabbit tucked under my arm. Don't tell no one. I found her in the snow, snow white rabbit in the snow. In sleep, things get mixed up, but only because they're more true. Sleep is death's brother, don't you know? So things are going to get real. I just wanted to say that it's scored for soprano voice, a piano prepared with dulcimer hammer, two cellos and flutes.
Please take us from the hell, from the hell I heard him say. Out amid a field of soggy tents, I stole my grandfather's knife. From under his pillow. Wow, the how how beautiful is that, and um, what a great ethereal ending. And um, I was thinking, all those displaced children um, in uh, in the Ukraine. One of them for sure had a white rabbit, you know, that lost or had to take with him or her and um and we all imagine what that means to a child and what it stands for and uh, what beautiful mu music uh, uh layale and uh, lisa you know what a beautiful project you worked on and created it is a, a, a stunning um w when will it all come together has it already been presented or please <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, please. Um, so it is right now, um, um, it's going to be actually produced um, into 2024. So we are right now in discussion with a producer. And right now we are um, discussing the first phase of development, which will happen uh, at the beginning of 2023. Yeah, in, in, incredible a story. There's a very famous children's book in Germany when Hitler stole my pink rabbit. I don't know if you're aware of it. Um, and um, it tells the story um, um, of that. And, um, and it's very, I think if I remember, it ends, you know, you will never, never get it back. Mm -hmm. And you will also never get rid of that idea of that person, you know, who took it away. It will get paler, but it'll be even a bit more ghostly. But this is such a beautiful work. And I think it's also such a great moment to end um, these uh, 12 hours, um, that music that we will take with us in the space you created that is uh, full of poetry, but also sadness, but also hope and enlightening enlightenment, I think. So um, thank you um, all um, for doing what is... Uh, a very short question, perhaps, um, for uh, Lisa. Um, what is what, what is Theatre Without Border doing at the moment uh, for, uh, regarding Ukraine or in general? Um, we're gathering our people all over the world, and um, Kat Fiyu is out, and so is Jessica Litvak and Roberta Levito, all working on making connections and since the very beginning, in fact, perhaps that may be why they're not here this evening. Yeah, yeah. no, there really is. A, it's really amazing. It's a great organization. It's something to, to join, to support, also for new generations to come in and take it on, like Doctors Without Borders. This theater Without Borders had made a real difference in people's lives and brought it together. I can't believe we are at the end um, of, of our session. And it's so wonderful that we have uh, both of you with us here. We had 12 hours. We had 24 New York theaters and companies with readings and conversations. Abrams Art Center, BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music, CUNY Stages, Here Art Center, HowlRound Commons, La Mama, Mabu Mines, the Mayi Theater Company, New York and Poets Cafe, Pan America, PS21, St. Anne's Warehouse, Park Avenue Armory, the National Black Theater, North Theater, the Play Company, the Public Theater, the Shed, Torn Page, Theater Without Borders, Alimite Company, Ukrainian Actors of New York, Yara Arts Group, the Watermill Center, and Robert Wilson. And what were this? It was a stunning uh, array that I think represented the complexities. Um, of the world, um, where nothing is black and white, uh, which is so hard to understand. And we just grabbed just a tiny piece of it. And we, I feel even so we listen now for 12 hours, we scratch the surface of what is this really means uh, for the people who there, people who lost loved ones, people who died, what it means for the world. And in a year, five or 10 years from now, uh, we will know much, much better what it really was all about. But it feels like a, a change in the world uh, as if tectonic plates 
are moving and uh, in front of our eyes and this all after corona and we often do wonder do they even wear masks these russian soldiers you know do they do they keep their social distance when they shoot the ukrainians you know i mean it's just incredible to think we all know that their uh, vaccination is not working so well and how many of them also you know will will be uh, victims you know of a of a failed uh, a policy it was a stunning a stunning display of artists engaging i think uh, with the world with the real uh, producing uh, imaginary work uh, imagination real work symbolic work and um, I think it's uh, something we can all be proud of that the New York theater community came together and that organizations like Penn and uh, Theater Without Borders um, came in to show solidarity. And we hope that for some people in Ukraine who were able to hear that it was transmitted there, um, that it is also meaningful. It was a big, big event for our little center to pull off. And I really would like to thank our people who helped us, actually our team in India, in Bombay, who stayed with us all night. It's seven o'clock in the morning. It is the three people who, who made this happen. Um, Hal Round um, gave us the key to the house. And uh, Aditya Rabad, Rachid, Kitan, and the wonderful Tanvi Shor were with us all these 12 hours made happen made it look all uh, uh, easy. And I know um, it's, it's always uh, uh, easy when things go right and we take it uh, for granted, but uh, it was flawless. It's a stunning uh, with all these people uh, coming in and out almost. I don't know how many we had. I think close to 100 artists uh, were involved. It is um, an incredible um, thing that it happened. And we can only hope that also for you, the listeners, uh, it was as meaningful as it was for us, the organizers. We put a lot of care and work into it. On the other hand, it was done very fast within two weeks. Um, but it is uh, stunning uh, what we put together and what a New York theater community can do when they put their forces, energy, and uh, imagination together. And it's a really a wonderful that we had you at the end. I think these sounds the violins and the songs and the voices will stay uh, with us. And I think it set the right tone and uh, it provided me for the moment, at least with a safe space, also listening to it where um, I felt at home. And this is home is what people said to do is what was taken away. And this is the worst thing um, you can do. So thank you all um, for, um, <clears throat> for, for joining us. Um, who was uh, also on our side is the paper planes agency. They tweeted uh, full hours for 12 hours from India. Also, they created our digital um, identity and on a very short notice. And, um, and we really are thankful. It's a, a almost unethical to ask someone to come on in such a short time and make all that happen. But they did. And again, Tanvi uh, Shah, thank you for uh, making this happen for the connection. I think it was a very a successful one. And, uh, and we hope it um, uh, uh, contributed uh, to, to have a little bit less suffering in the world, but also to show that we care, that this is important to us, that our heart reaches out and that we are outraged of all of it, but especially those people who died in the theater, a safe space, a sacred space to us, including children. And as someone said today, it was written on the building very big. There are children in this building and it was one single strike, 300 people died. And I think it was good that we had the ending of this also dedicated um, to the children and for all the children in the world who suffer in such ways. So thank you all. I'm going to now uh, click my bread leaf button. Everybody for listening. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we know how much uh, is out there and how tired we all are through the time of Corona be to be on Zoom. So ever listen to us. Thank you. We need great art. We also need great audiences. And what writers say, also, we need people to listen to. And after all, it's for an audience. That's how it is created. It's not just for the artists. And this is what missed. So it was missed so terribly in the time of Corona and audience. So this was the most important part is that people were on the other side listening. So thank you all again. And um, thanks for HowlRound, BJ and uh, Thea for hosting us again. And um, uh, to all our listeners, um, stay safe, wear a mask. It's not over yet. Numbers are up again. And let's all hope that such horrible things will not happen on our country here 
and uh, but uh, we all have to work on democracy that's always to come and to make sure that democratic forces prevail thank you so much and uh, and uh, bye bye